Good morning and welcome to the fifth and last day of the Ars Electronica Festival. You might have probably noticed that in the last years the topic of artificial intelligence has played a rather important role in many of the Ars Electronica's programs. And today is dedicated to many different themes evolving around the topic of artificial intelligence and music. When I think about AI and music, I immediately start dreaming about the vast spaces of St. Florian Monastery, the lush gardens and baroque marble halls that hosted the musicians and artists last year during our festival. Today we are in Kepler's Gardens in Linz, where our expert discuss a very important topic, artificial stupidity. The panel will focus on the limitations and, un and uncertainties artists face when developing their works with tools related to AI. What are the challenges for collaborations at the intersections of artificial intelligence and the arts? Such and many more questions will be addressed by our fantastic panelists, Ali Nikrang, Ars Electronica's expert on AI and music, Moises Horta Valenzuela, Artemi Maria Giotti, Alex Braga, and the admirable moderator, Rania Kim. Dear Rania, the stage is yours. Good morning, everyone, and welcome Einen to schönen guten Morgen und herzlich willkommen beim Panel Artificial Stupidity. Wir sind hier zusammengekommen, Künstler und Wissenschaftler, um uh, über den Einsatz von AI, künstlicher Intelligenz zu sprechen. Wir haben hier interdisziplinäre Künstler hier uh, zu Besuch und ich bin sehr gespannt uh, auf uh, die beiden wo uns die Künstler über ihre Methoden, ihre Praktiken sprechen werden. Wir wollen hier nicht so sehr definieren, was Artificial Intelligence eigentlich ist, sondern wir wollen äh, die Einzelheiten eher kennenlernen, äh, die verschiedenen Methoden und die unterschiedlichen Perspektiven. Ich darf die Teilnehmer vorstellen. Artemi Maria Giotti. Moises Horta Valenzuela und Alex Braga. So if you can each just briefly introduce yourselves, your specific practice, and how you use AI. Um, yes, yeah, so good morning from me. Um, I am a composer and artistic researcher currently based in Graz, Austria. And my interest in AI revolves around uh, mainly the shortcomings, the limitations of AI. So I'm really interested in exploring the limits of machine learning algorithms. Um, I, I'm also interested in how AI can expand or can help me change my artistic practice. So I'm not so much interested in using AI to uh, produce material, to generate material autonomously, but I'm thinking about what does it mean to compose in the era of AI? What does it mean to compose for AI? So my practice really revolves around um, music pieces, compositions for musicians playing acoustic instruments and AI, uh, interactive computer music systems that can listen to the musicians and respond in a musically meaningful way. What that means, what is a musically meaningful response, of course, depends on its specific piece. So what I'm doing in my practice is instead of composing a fixed sequence of sounds that is left then to the performer to realize, I'm composing interactions between an intelligent machine and a musician. So I am composing the dynamics of the interaction, the behaviors that drive the AI, but not necessarily the sound result per se. So this also means that each performance can be completely different than another performance. And what interests me in that as a composer is that it completely changes my, my role in this process, my task. What is the role of the composer in this process if not to write a fixed piece? So 
my role sort of shifts from composing sequences of sounds to composing behaviors and interactions. Ali? Good morning. My name is Ali Nikrang. I am a key researcher at uh, Arts Electronica Future Lab. Uh, my research topic is creative intelligence. It is about um, AI and creativity and how we can use AI for creative applications. Um, it is also important how we can enhance and personalize and lead the results through collaboration and interaction with human users. And I have my background in both in computer science and in uh, composition, in music. I studied uh, composition and um, also pi piano playing at uh, University Mozarteum in Salzburg, and I also studied computer science at this university here, Johannes Kepler University. And um, we are currently uh, developing an AI-based um, AI composition system called um, Ricerca, which is trained with 25,000 pieces of music. And we also use the system for different and several applications and uh, events during the festival this year. Um, the focus is actually in our research, not only the, the technology, but also we are interested in the impacts um, of the technology for artists and for, for the society. Thank you. Moises. Hi, everybody. So my name is Moises. I'm a Tijuana, uh, not based artist. I'm currently based in Berlin, but uh, I'm a sound artist, self-taught uh, technologist. And my approach to artificial intelligence is to explore uh, unrepresented forms in the research, especially, especially talking about uh, neural network sound synthesis. So my work really revolves on the atomic level of sound and uh, having AI autonomous systems and non-autonomous systems to enhance and create new musical forms. So for example, I come from, uh, from the borderland of Tijuana, which is a very interesting place because you have two different epistemologies in tension, like the Western epistemology and then let's say, Latin American epistemology of thinking. So within AI research uh, and my own research into these practices, I see that there is very lack of representation of other cultures which are non-Western. Uh, so it tends to be um, something that I try to change in my practice and to kind of change this narrative within artificial intelligence. So I see artificial intelligence as a tool mostly that can augment our own practices and can, uh, let's say, create new imaginary. So not not as a way to um, replace a human, but more to augment the creativity of uh, artists. So yeah, that's mostly what I'm working on. Thank you. Alex? And I completely agree with his uh, point of view. I'm Alex Braga. Hi, um, I'm an artist, uh, and um, I just released a record with K7 that it's called Split Machine, that it's made through uh, my artificial intelligence that is called Amint, which is an artificial intelligence that it's uh, uh, basically works in real time to augment the powers uh, of an artist and uh, that's what I that's what I do I play augmented music and uh, I'm not really interested in artificial intelligence I'm interested in the human being and the artist so the only thing that interests me is in this thing is the way that uh, artificial intelligence can enhance and augment the capabilities and the possibilities of uh, mankind and artists. In this case, we started uh, also a uh, teaching uh, artificial intelligence in the classical conservatories in, in Italy. We started in Santa Cecilia, which is one of the uh, most ancient uh, classical institutions uh, in, uh, in Europe. And we started doing so, meaning we put artificial intelligence at stake with uh, cellos, uh, lyrical singing, classical piano, and all the other instruments, because it is an instrument to uh, help people mastering a new kind of uh, uh, way of composing and playing music. Very cool. Thank you. Um, what really fascinates me about all of you here is you have such very specific ways of using AI into your practice. And through my own experimentation and research, I found really interesting and unpredictable and unexpected ways of how 
these experimentations have changed my perspective of what AI actually is. And currently we still have a lot of fear around AI because of the narratives of media and how it's pushed forward to people. So um, I'm really curious to know through your experiments, what has been the most interesting discovery through your practice? And can you share a few words of how that's impacted your work? Pardon me, would you like to first? Yeah. Um, so I think I, one of the most interesting experiments I've done with AI is an ongoing experiment. Um, it's the piece that we will hear in the concert later. Um, the piece is called Bias. And it's a comment on the unattainability of uh, objectivity, both in human aesthetic preferences and in AI, in machine learning algorithms. So what I did for this piece is I recorded um, a lot of um, improvised material with the help of the clarinetist, and then I um, just split this recording into shorter fragments, and I rated these fragments on a scale from one to five based on which I liked best. So really I tried to um, give my own aesthetic preferences to the neural network as a reference for it to learn to predict my preferences. So the idea here is that um, learning from all this material, the neural network then will hear a new sound and be able to tell how much I like it, so how much um, it corresponds to my aesthetic preferences. Um, however, of course, what happens when you work with machine learning is that the algorithm will also make some arbitrary assumptions about the data, and that's called AI bias. That's why the piece is called bias. So the neural network, to some extent, um, captures some of my aesthetic preferences, some of my own aesthetic bias, and to some extent it creates its own bias. So that was really a very um, interesting process for me because what came out from this process was not really um, sort of a simulation of, of my preferences, but so a hybrid, a new form of agency, a hybrid human-machine agency. So the algorithm so, sort of um, became its own thing. And um, in this piece, because of that, I, it really helped me um, expand my practice and understand what I'm doing uh, better and also really redefine what I'm doing. Um, so for this particular piece, I did something that I never do. So the electronics in this piece, the sounds that the computer plays in this piece, are not composed by me. So none of the sound material comes from me, but the computer collects material in its interactions with the musician. So every time the piece is being performed or rehearsed, the computer um, sort of expands its vocabulary, and it adds new sounds to its vocabulary based on its preferences. So it will just collect sounds that it likes. So for me, this was really um, a completely different way to compose music. Um, so I didn't really even provide the sounds for it. So everything started from uh, an AI, everything st started from exploring this concept of AI bias, and it gave me the opportunity to do something that I could not have done otherwise, and that's where I see the potential in AI, that it enables new approaches, new artistic practices that would not be possible without these tools. That's really cool, and I really enjoyed what you said um, earlier about showing the limitations of this technology, which is also another aspect of what's happened in the media with the hype around AI that focuses heavily on the possibilities, but I really feel the importance of us here as artists is to really use this technology and show what are the limitations and how do we work within them. And Ali, you also have many examples here at the festival, and I also saw you perform live. Can you explain a little bit more about how you specifically use your AI and how it's augmented or changed to how you work? Um, sure. Um, so what's, what's, uh, what is fascinating for me is uh, how simple actually these models um, are working. Because um, what we have is uh, the AI system, they are able to, you know, to to, uh, to learn or be trained with 
very, very large amount of data. In my case, um, we had um, 25,000 pieces of music. And it is very interesting to see that they develop their own perspective on music and how, because they have to, to learn how to compose music. And this is also very fascinating. All what they have to learn is actually to predict or to generate the next note, given all the previous notes in the piece of music. So it sounds very inintuitive to human musicians, but we all know that these models are very successful because it's the same idea that we also have in natural language processing. You know, we, we all know GPT-2, GPT-3, the, the, uh, these models are very, very um, powerful, and this is the same idea. And um, it is also, I mean, the, the idea, the assumption behind using AI to, um, to compose is actually um, that if you have a model that is able or capable of generating music, um, that sounds natural, human, and um, emotional, like the music in the training set. So the, the model must have learned something about music, because otherwise it wouldn't be possible. So some essential um, understanding of music must, uh, be, must be in the, in the model. And actually, this is a new perspective on music. So this is, uh, I agree with, uh, with you also, because it's, if we investigate the model, so we can actually learn something about music, because it's the, you know, it's the, uh, the bridge between music and technology. So we, we investigate a, uh, an AI model, but we learn something how, why, why music works and how music works, because uh, AI systems, they just learn the statistical patterns of the data. But sometimes if you, or very often actually, when um, when you are composing with them, so they are fascinating results. And so you ask yourself, how is it possible? Because, I mean, this is a machine. It has no, no understanding, no imagination of, of our emotions, of our worlds. And how is it possible that something um, and, um, is generated that is so emotional and is able to trigger emotional responses in us. And it is something that fascinates me. And even if I have been working with these models since years, it is still a strange feeling if I, you know, if I listen to an um, AI composition and um, I feel you know, the emotions in it because I exactly know that the model is actually very simple. It just learned to predict the next note. And nonetheless, it, it works. So this is what, for me uh, personally, is very fascinating. Very cool. Thank you. That was a really easy to digest way to understand how you do such um, complex, well, what seems very complex, but it's very nice to actually mm -hmm. hear it in a way that's very understandable. Um, and Moises, I've seen you do yeah. AI-generated DJ sets, to You created a very unique performance here, specifically for ours. Can you share some of your specific ways of using AI? Yeah, of course. So for the past uh, couple of years, I've been working with a very specific uh, kind of uh, neural network algorithm, which is a generative adversarial network, which is um, quite problematic if you think about it. Uh, architecture in the sense, because basically you have two AIs competing for each other. One of them is looking at the real data and the other one is generating data from scratch. So they're kind of fooling each other. So it might work, I'd like to unpack these very essential concepts in the research that are basically based on adversary uh, instead of cooperative uh, ways of thinking, right? So this in itself is something that I wanted to unpack. So for my performance here in Ars Electronica, I basically work mostly with GANs and also with GPT-2. Um, it's called Nel Nelkotoni in Quiquetl, which means uh, amulets in poetry in Nahuatl language. So basically this performance is based on three uh, generative AI systems. Narrow AI, let's uh, actually talk about specifics, um, not art artificial general intel intelligence, which is a completely different thing. So you have the visual aspect, uh, which is doing, um, it's again trained on pre-Hispanic artifacts. Uh, and then you have a Melgan, which is doing sound synthesis at the raw waveform level. So the idea is that the transduction of these visual GANs, which are doing these interpolations between these uh, imagined or hallucinated uh, pre-Hispanic artifacts, are actually driving the sound. So I 
uh, built a system where I transformed the pixels into into synthesis data, so raw synthesis data, which is just basically noise. And then I have another algorithm, a neural network, which converts this random noise and tries to convert it into a, a corpus of music, which is uh, taken from pre-Hispanic um, sound uh, forms, to not say music, it's mostly ritualistic uh, percussive music. So I'm quite interested in these kind of imagined futures, right? Because when we imagine, uh, talk about AI, this imagined future usually is very uh, Western and uh, there's very lack of representation, right? So my idea is not to uh, perpetuate ancient epistemologies, but actually to bring them into the future and to have like a more diverse future that uh, is not based on one specific way of thinking about AI or this drive of AI being um, something that is gonna overhold humanity, you know? So this kind of plays into the talk that we're having right now about unpacking this, these ideas. So just to um, sum it up, uh, this, uh, this research work comes from um, Last year I released an album called Transfiguración, which means transfiguration. It's using this uh, same algorithm, Melgan VC, uh, to transfigure um, an album from a Mexican uh, artist called Antonio Cepeda, which is like a all acoustic pre-Hispanic percussion album, and to transfigure it into my own body of music. So basically it's this idea of creating a fictional link or a kind of like a futuristic kind of continuum between ancient epistemologies and high-tech modern computing. So this is what it's, I feel is quite interesting for me in AI, to create different narratives uh, rather than create AI as a being in itself, right? So it's more about which uh, narratives get represented within this, because AI is a tool. Uh, basically, and with tools to create art, you create certain stories. So which stories are being told is kind of what is interesting for me. Very cool. And it seems every time you do it, you discover something very interestingly different to what you did before it. Cool. And Alex, you have a very different way of using your AI, yep. um, quite different to the rest of us here. Um, I saw your performance last night using your real-time AI generative system. Can you tell us a little bit about your process and uh, what's yeah. your most interesting <laughs> discovery? Uh, yes. I. I I think we've, uh, well, th my starting point was uh, uh, not AI, but was uh, the idea of creation and of composing. And, and so uh, uh, that's why I figured after working so many years with AI that AI cannot and should not compose or generate art because no matter how performing an algorithm is, an algorithm will never be able to understand why that specific interval of notes is meaningful to life, to the universe, and to a human being. So what we can create with artificial intelligence is just super very performing craftsmanship, which is a pale imitation of art. But artificial intelligence is never going to be able to put meaning behind notes. And meaning behind notes is the sacred principle of creation and of music and art. So the way I created a mint is uh, a way that was uh, uh, um, the, the, the principle was to enable an artist to explore in real time the endless possibilities that you don't have in real life in a studio or on a stage. So Amint, it's, it, it doesn't have any data set. It's not prefed with nothing, knows nothing about music, knows nothing about harmony, knows nothing about anything. It's just a super powerful, low-level neural network that enables you in that specific moment to beat time, <laughs> the linearity of time, meaning that every time you press uh, uh, and you play uh, uh, something, 
it delivers that something augmented to plus infinity, depending on how many machines you can put in series and how many hands do you have on stage. That for me is uh, an approach that enables the artist uh, to deliver the emotion which the artist knows the meaning through uh, uh, a lenses that augments to plus infinity the emotion, that kind of meaning. But the machine itself does, doesn't do anything. You, know, you saw the performance, if I don't play, the, the AI is completely silent because it, it, sh it, and that is the way it should be, because it should not be playing, because otherwise it would not be creating anything meaningful to me, to the audience, and to the universe and the world because a computer is a computer. So uh, a computer knows nothing about uh, love, uh, fear, joy, death, loss, sex, nothing. It has, it has never been left by a girlfriend or a boyfriend. It has never been weeping a, a night because something is going wrong in his life. It has never been depressed. So uh, uh, the whole thing about art is giving a uh, significant to this kind of emotions, which is a, a meaning. The, the, the big risk with AI is that we give out only a significant with no meaning behind. And if we do that, we are fucked, because there's nothing behind that. We're, you know, it's just a, a show off of capabilities of what a computer can do. We all know a computer is powerful, we all know a computer can do a lot of computational things, but these are computational things. I mean, I'm, I've never been, I never cried seeing a computer doing calculations. And I, I, I've, I'm, you know, I never got uh, sexed up seeing a computer doing uh, processing or rendering a file. I mean, it's just process. It, it's, it's a very aseptic thing. So. The way I think this is just AI is a very powerful tool, but it has to be used in a very specific way. Otherwise, we run the big risk of losing the role of artists and art in the universe. And if we lose that, uh, we are doomed. <laughs> Thank you. And um, I think this is what brings so much value of us as artists to play with these tools, right? And to share the, what we discover with these experiments. Um, and I think that technology and the narrative of AI and media has kind of lost that, that kind of like depth of really looking underneath and, and revealing what these experiments actually show us about what it means to be human and our interaction with these technologies. Um, and I think the, with like sci-fi and TV shows and movies and like the cultural kind of narrative of like these um, big imagined futures of doom um, has really played a big role on our perception of AI. And we are here to not so much combat it, but to show a little bit more rich examples and to bring new narratives. Um, the other aspects of, of AI, which I find really fascinating, is um, how it's created this really big focus on the kind of like automation aspect of it. And I often get asked, isn't creating with AI a lazy way of creating? <laughs> And somehow we've lost on this narrative of like all the energy, the research that goes into building these systems and then that process of building and then it, having the human involvement in it. And um, as far as I know from all the conversations I've had with other fellow creatives is that everyone tends to be more of a control freak and true freedom is having more contr uh, creative control. Um, so, furthering this discussion of um, kind of demystifying this hype, um, I'd love to hear each of you express a few words of how do you see the role of human and creativity with AI and, and within the limitations of where we are now and um, where do you see it going next? 
Um, yeah, that's a very good question. Of course, it's very hard to know. We can only guess at this point, but um, I think that what's the most interesting thing about AI and which has a lot of potential, at least in my view, is um, using AI in a more human in the loop approach. So um, I think that the potential of AI lies in human computer co-creativity rather than autonomously creative systems. So for me, it's when the human and the machine come together that really interesting things happen. Because just letting the machine create something on its own is it's just an imitation, as Alex said. I mean, the machine is just going to produce uh, probably worse versions of human-written music, but it's never going to innovate. It's never going to do um, anything that will change the course of music history. So you know, innovation requires general intelligence and general intelligence that is embedded in a social reality. So creativity is not just about creating random variations of um, previously written music or deviating from previously written uh, music. Uh, it's it's a, a practice that, it, that is embedded in everyday life, in all aspects of life. So innovation is driven by uh, changes in society, technology, economy, whatever that might be. So I think Georgina Bourne wrote in an article a few years ago, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, but she wrote that every musical work exists in continuation of uh, a musical past and anticipation of a musical future. And I think it's this anticipation that machines cannot do so far and won't be able to do for a long time probably. So for me, what is interesting and where I see the future in this field is in this um, symbiosis between human and machine where um, the human has the um, creative uh, vision and the machine contributes through its own very specific, very narrow, yet interesting type of intelligence. Thank you. I agree. I think AI's uh, created a new path for us to get even more specific, actually, with how we decide to use it, because it's the possibilities are so wide and infinite. Um, Ali, would love um, to hear. I also that. see the future of AI-based music composition in collaboration with humans, because uh, in my opinion, also there is no art without human um, involvement. And the problem for me personally is the intention, because there is no creation without intention. Even if you, uh, if, even if you look at the very first cave paintings in human history, we can't find the intention to, to draw something and to, you know, to share, share the meaning of these uh, haunting scenes with, with the society at that time. And uh, for art, it's much more important. So I think um, it is my personal um, opinion about this, but I think uh, AI systems, uh, they have their own perspective on musical data because they learn to, to compose music and they are good at it and hopefully very good at it in some years. But it is actually something that we can use uh, as human artists and as um, I mean professionals and amateurs to use this technology to, you know, to, to collaborate with this technology and to, to, to make something new. And I'm sure that artists uh, will, will use this technology in the next years for, for completely new projects. It wouldn't be the first time in, in music history that technology you know, helped helps us to, to extend our possibilities. Even the piano, as, it's what in, in, as it, uh, it was invented in um, 18th century, was, a, was, a, was an invention. Or even the first flute 40,000 years ago. It was also a part of humanity, because at that time, um, the only way of making music was singing. And with the flutes, it was so a part of humanity was gone, because they could use an instrument to, to make music, you know, something that, that is dead. But I think the, uh, the point is that only in collaboration it will be possible to make art with, with machines. So it is from a um, technological point of view, of course, it's very interesting if you have a machine and you can just press off the button and um, a masterpiece <laughs> is generated. But if it's, it, it, um, it's not possible now, but if, um, when it um, became a reality, but it's just a technolo technological point of view. So from artistic point of view, I think it's 
really necessary that humans are involved. And I think um, for now they are used as tools, but actually the goal should be that um, they are used as counterparts, because if they have their own perspective on, on the data, so it would be good to, you know, to, to, have, to share this perspective and to, to, um, to, to work with them and not that they work for us. So I think it would extend our creativity, because AI systems, they see music in another way than, than us, because they, once an AI system is trained, so that the result is actually a frozen space of weights. And it's a, it's a space we can see as, uh, we can, um, see as, uh, as a vector space. And composition is nothing else than navigating in this space. And I think it would be very interesting for composers to, you know, to navigate in this space and to express, to explain, um, or to um, express themselves in, um, in, uh, in different paths and in, uh, you know, discover their the musical universe using the systems. Very cool, thank you very much. <laughs> Moises? Can you just repeat the question really quickly? Yeah, so I'd love <laughs> to um, hear your thoughts on where you see the role of the human with creativity and collaboration with AI. Yeah, so the human is never gonna go away in, in this narrative of artificial intelligence, in my opinion, right? So actually, artificial intelligence, like you're saying, I don't believe sub, such a, let's say, productive approach, it's a very problematic word, but let's say I don't believe like artificial intelligence as another being in itself. I see it as a tool that, as you were saying, is more like something that can augment our limita uh, limitations of time. For example, we can see patterns because that's only what it does, right? It's a cor correlationist uh, approach to knowledge. It's not really based on intelligence. If we look at the history of AI, it's people basically making the first uh, the perceptron algorithm, which all of the current neural networks are based on, are basically a couple of scientists poking at a frog and seeing how it reacts. This has nothing to do with intelligence. So we have to kind of uh, understand that. So it's like we have a correlation and approach, correlationist approach to, to these systems. But it's, it's, it's really great because now we can have like a, a wider understanding of a bigger corpus of human uh, artistic creation, right? And your own artistic creation. And I think this is very valuable because then you can have like insights that these systems provide that otherwise you probably would not be able to see. Uh, but I'm also quite skeptical because I, I always think um, the AI itself is not going to produce anything interesting unless the human says, okay, this is what I want, this is interesting to me, this is playing into the history of uh, music or art in general, and this is what I decide to put out. Not just like an autonomous system where it's just like 24 seven making some kind of art or music. This uh, has the danger of becoming like music, becoming muzak. So becoming just something that is completely boring, you know? So I think this is, this is uh, the problematic, but also the benefit of AI, that it can help us look at patterns or aesthetics. Like I believe in the, in the glitch aesthetics of AI and the disruptions of AI as the interesting thing of artificial intelligence, like any other technology, right? So like the failings of this, and it's also a very political view in my opinion, that the most interesting, interesting part is when AI fails, because then this is when the system is actually becoming interesting and producing something unexpected. Because if we're just expecting it to produce music in the sense that we think music is in itself, then we are just caught in this historical loop, right? So we're just trying to perpetuate the past. No, so this is kind of like where I stand in, in, in this. And like this is my approximation towards including um, indigenous uh, epistemologies into this because then you can bring about like a symbiosis of different uh, perspectives. So like indigenous perspectives and modern capitalist perspectives which are we are all living in. So this is where I stand. So, and I think this has to do a lot with my own context of being in a, growing up in a border city where you're like faced with these two epistemologies in tension. And so you always have to navigate, like basically um, this philosopher calls it border thinking, where you have to adapt to different ways of seeing of the world in order to survive. So this is kind of like my approach to this. 
Very cool. Yeah, I, um, I feel like even an easier way to explain like this method of using AI, feeding it data and then having it create new data is like kind of similar to sampling music, you know, like you listen to a whole bunch of music and then you chop up all this audio and then you create something with it. But, or like an arpeggiator or um, some kind of sequencer, rarely would an artist just allow this thing to create and then whatever comes out, you put it out as like, this is the final product. There's a lot of curation that goes in, a lot of production, piecing things together. Um, so I find that really, really interesting. And Alex, um, yes. curious <laughs> to know, I mean, you've already had uh, shared your very strong opinions about the importance of the role of the human. Yes, but, uh, but, but I have a very uh, strong uh, feeling that we need to bring the debate in the future to different uh, borders and frontiers because uh, the, the, the don't believe the hype scheme, I think it applies really well to artificial intelligence for us uh, as artists, meaning that <clears throat> we sh if you ask me where artificial intelligence is going to go and where it's going to bring uh, uh, art and music, uh, and I'm I can answer, I don't know, but I could answer better, I don't care. Because uh, it, it would be like uh, in the 50s, talking to Leo Fender, which had invented a super amazing guitar, and telling him, where is the music going to go? Where is the guitar going to go? And he would have answered, I don't know. The guitar is, is going nowhere, it, it, it stays there. It depends on who takes the guitar. Yeah, you should talk to Jimi Hendrix, you should talk to Eric Clapton, you should talk to Ingby Malmsteen, all these amazing users of Fender guitars that brought music to uh, different uh, 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 borders and created a, a, a new form, a new language, uh, a, a new universe. If, if you think about Bartolomeo Cristofori, for example, it's a, it's a name that I, I don't know. Does anybody know who, who he is? I know. <laughs> I know. I know you know, but you're the only one in this room that knows who Bartolomeo Cristoforo is. It was the guy that invented the pianoforte. And uh, it, it was, it, and it, it's completely forgotten. It, it just invented a new technology. But if you would have talked to him and said, oh, Bartolomeo, wh where is music going to go? I said, what the fuck do I know? I just, I just invented a, a machine that is playing. Talk to, talk to Bach, because Bach took the invention and made it uh, th what we know. Talk to Mozart, talk to Beethoven, because they were the first masters of pianoforte, and they took music to a complete, they delivered us the universe. They delivered us the world, they delivered us love, they delivered us everything we know about our emotional fields. But uh, technology is just a technology, and for us, artists, uh, I think we should uh, quit focusing on the technology and start focusing on what we do with that technology, because not everything that comes out uh, of an AI performance is something remarkable. Not everything ca coming out of, of an AI experimentation is something that has to be called art. Something is just experimentation, something is just uh, uh, data research, which is good, which is fine, but has nothing to do with art. So we should start switching. Now uh, uh, AI is a given uh, instrument now, and we should start focusing on that and uh, shifting the debate on the, the artists. So you are not worth because you use AI. Your art is meaningful because what you do with AI is remarkable and comes out uh, something that will stand out and will last in the years. So going back to your, uh, um, to your answer, where is AI taking uh, the world? Where is AI taking music and art? No, where is man taking, where is mankind taking art through the use of the AI? And that is an answer that nobody has because nobody knows what I'm gonna do tomorrow, what Ali is going to do tomorrow, what Moses is going to do tomorrow, what Artemi or you are going to do tomorrow with AI. It's just, it's just like questioning yourself, 
what is your next song with the piano? I don't know, it depends on who I meet today on the train, who do I fall in love with, why do I suffer today for some loss or some joy that I experience, and that translates into the universe that we as human create through the use of a piano, through the use of a guitar, through the use of our voice, or the AI. But that's just, as I was saying in the very beginning, that's just a super fast way of exploring all the endless possibilities that you have. But then you, as an artist, have to choose the right one. Otherwise, it's just a, a, a useless bunch of data that does not mean anything to anybody and will not last. I think it's great how you highlight that perspective of kind of um, putting less pressure also of um, being an artist working with AI because there's so much judgment that's happening. But the reality is that if you're putting any kind of art out into the world, you're going to be judged for your work regardless. Um, and I do think that there is this is where the humanity with AI comes, where we get to, through our practice and through sharing all the very unique and specific ways that we're using it, um, being able to give people tangible experiences. Because I think for a lot of people, for most, it's still very abstract. And things start to make sense, and we start to create meanings with all of these intangible things once we have experiences of seeing an example or hearing example and feeling. And that's where the human, uh, our role is with all of this technology. There are tools, we use them, we help um, translate our emotions, the current state, the current limitations, and um, we push these limitations to new heights by understanding what the limitations are in the first place, right? Um, so, this was uh, very revealing, and it, it's become very obvious that we all share this um, the same need to highlight how AI has proved to be simply tools to help us create, inspire us, and um, there are unlimited possibilities, same as if you want to make music. Um, there are just endless ways of creating. There's not just one way. Um, so thank you very much for sharing your thoughts so far. Um, we have just a few minutes left. So what would be your closing thoughts to the next musician who's interested in AI but is caught up in this fear? Or I think there's also um, the entry point to get into um, AI and music creation is still quite a stiff entry point for most people. Um, how, what, what kind of advice would you give to the next musician interested in working in this space? Um, yeah, that's a very difficult question. Um, I guess from my own experience, um, I think it's really important to uh, try to understand how these tools work and try to understand that as as well as you can. So um, if you can code these things your, yourself, if you can program your own neural networks, then this is really a very good way of understanding the limitations, the problems, the mechanics, what these algorithms do, what they don't do. Um, I, th I think it's really important to to get a very good understanding of the tools rather than to just use them very superficially to do a very specific task. And I think understanding these problems, these limitations, and the inner workings of the algorithms can also help you create better art. So this is not just about um, learning how to program. It's, it's just about learning how they work so that um, you can use that in your art and not just yeah, avoid this kind of superficial use of um, AI as uh, a very, uh, well, tool now is, is a hard word in this context because we already said that AI is a tool, but yeah, I think it's really important to understand how it works to avoid using it in, in ways that don't bring your music forward, really. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Sure. 
Ali, do you want to go? Yeah, very, very quickly. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, to share your opinion, and uh, I think it's very important to know that AI is a big chance for all artists, because it's, it wouldn't be the first time in the, human, in the uh, art history that technology you know, can uh, extend our possibilities, but it is also important to, to be aware of limitations and to, to know exactly what it can give us and what it uh, can't. I mean, I would just recommend that anybody who is interested in going to machine learning or AI is start with like some very specific open source tools such as like the Wakinator by Dr. Rebecca Fiebrink, which actually doesn't require any programming. And there's like a free course online on that. So I'm all about democratizing these technologies, making them really accessible, what they actually are doing and how you can incorporate into your artistic practice, uh, not as something that is going to make you hype or something like that, no? Like, uh, just because you're using AI, it's actually something that you can use for your own artistic ideas that should not be defined in terms of AI, right? Like, you already have your artistic uh, vision, and this is just like a new tool that you can incorporate. It's just like a new uh, palette, no? Like a new color that you can incorporate, like, that has uh, the possibility of having aesthetics that are very uh, unique on its own, like neural aesthetics, some people are talking about. Um, but yeah, I think it's like going into the deep research, into the boring kind of like, like you say, Artemi, like coding your own neural network. I think this is a really good approach. And um, yeah, just like, I think there's like quite a bunch of uh, communities online around like AI art. And I think this is a, a good approximation towards this, like uh, get in touch with people who are working with this and have these insights within this, because then this democratizing is gonna help us like move forward. And then we're gonna be able to have like more interesting discussions, not like uh, this tired discussion about like uh, the mechanical Turk basically, right? Like, uh, you know, it's not, it's not about this. It's uh, not about fooling ourselves that AI is another entity in itself. It's about using it in a concrete way and what are we saying with this tool? Uh, so that's my perspective on that. I think we, uh, we kicked off a, a really exciting revolution in music and art. And uh, for the first time in many, 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 many years, there is something really new that we can walk into, which is a, a new way to produce art and music. Given this, that is a fact, my advice to any artist approaching this kind of uh, uh, new school is just master your technology first and then take away the hype, get on stage and ask yourself, am I doing something remarkable? Am I doing something that makes the difference? If the answer is yes, go on. Otherwise, step off the stage and do something else because there's no need for more data and more things to be put in a casual, uh, in, in a chaotic way in the world. Because as I was saying before, that is not art. So th it's very simple and it's very black or white. Thank you very much. Um, I also think I would like to add, I feel like AI has this interesting ability to give us a much more intimate experience with our creations. And um, if we use it in such a way of uh, feeding our own data of music that we've created and listening to how machines learn it, that alone has a very uh, interesting, like it serves as an interesting reflective tool. And I don't know um, if you feel the same way. I've had a few conversations where we share similar insights. And um, I think this is the really important importance of artists playing with this technology and showcasing it so that we give new narratives and a much wider perspective of all of this. And so that the hype doesn't just get kind of monopolized by one specific role in media. So I appreciate everyone's thoughts here and sharing your experiences. I hope that it's helped demystify some of this hype in a way. I know it's still, still very, um, it might be abstract still. Um, but please check out everyone's work online. And also, we have three performances right after this, back to back. Artemi, Ali, and Moises are performing just outside on stage. Alex performed last night. And I believe everything should be online um, after for everyone to see. So 
thank you very much for helping uh, make the invisible visible and the intangible tangible. Please give the panelists a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name's Matthew Gardner. I'm an artist and researcher at the Ars Electronica Future Lab, but I'm coming to you now from my studio in Geelong, where I've been working on a new project called Oribo Kit. Oribo Kit comes from several things, but mostly from my 16 years of robotic origami practice and research. Oribo kit in particular came from the fact that I was working on these blossom designs uh, for a project for a museum and suddenly coronavirus hit and the whole project went on hold but the, the design for this blossom was finished. So I'd spent a lot of time refining this mechanism, making it so that it was one, was easy to produce so I could make a lot of them and two, so it is recycl as recyclable as possible. So it, where possible, I've used recyclable materials. So from the PLA plastic, which is biodegradable, to mostly it's about the paper mechanism. So I've used a machine grade washi for, that's the white paper, and the craft paper, is the, the, which is the brown paper, is also very, very, very recyclable. It's quite a raw paper which with very long fibres and it's quite good for paper recycling in general to use that. Um, the next place came from is the fact that following coronavirus uh, impact, I had time to learn how to do some PCB design. So I took my existing knowledge of electronics, I worked with my brother who's somewhat uh, of a budding expert in the field and He's been taught by my father, who's a total definite expert in the field, and basically took these years of experience and wrapped them up into the first experiment, which was this board, uh, the Oribo Kit version one. And I did it with the idea that I could use it for my practice, but then after realizing how freeing and how open the possibilities for low volume, high quality circuit boards is, I realized there was quite some room for good design, uh, good concepts and good, good products. And I realized that this was a way to engage an audience which is otherwise currently inaccessible. So who can go to museums, who can go to physical workshops can now participate in quite a cutting edge piece of research, artistic research. They can make an artistic work for themselves and at the same time develop some skills in folding robotic origami, assembling robotic origami and then possibly leading into doing some programming of their own. So the board is set up so that you can, it has an STM32 controller, it has a light dependent resistor on here, it has a few buttons that allow you to set the, the levels on the light dependent resistor, but it's also got a lot of independent IO pins. So if you wanted to, you can get another type of sensor from another le electronic supplier. We've got some ideas for some sensors that we'll add on, but at the moment, you could basically use it like an Arduino, except what it's got built in is three mounting points for three small servos. And it's got drivers, it's they're pop properly, uh, got nice big capacitors there. So, you know, you can expect good, uh, high quality and reliable servo responses from those. Um, it's also got USB-C, which allows you to have a high amount of current. At the moment, it's, it's fused at 1.5 amps, but that's plenty for three small servos. So the overall idea is to bring, the overall idea for Oribo Kit is to allow you to integrate and start to understand how origami, 
nature and technology begin to integrate. One of the nice sculptural aspects about this work is this flexible cable, uh, which allows you to wrap and integrate uh, your robotic blossoms and to graft them onto a tree branch of your choice. I think this is a really nice... As soon as I found this possibility, I, I became very satisfied. I found myself... like I'd, I'd reached a kind of zenith for this particular, you know, small blossoms. You know, because there's so much that's beautiful about uh, just any branch on any tree that to kind of complement or to integrate with that branch in, a, in an, an effective way, if the work meets that challenge, then it's already reached some level of uh, transcending from animate, inanimate to animate. And this is an important distinction for a lot of robotics, I think, this kind of blurring between the boundaries of, uh, of nature. So the best way to get take part is to get online to oribokit.com, grab yourself a kit, when the kit arrives, we'll work with you to fit you into the next available workshop. And you can also access all of our online videos and instructions, which take you through the process of building your own Oribo kit. I look forward to seeing you there. For the second time, As Electronica is organizing the AI Music Festival in collaboration with the European Commission as part of the STARTS initiative. This year, the AI Music Festival focuses on a deep insight into the latest research and artistic practice developed in conjunction with artificial intelligence and paying also special attention to its potential to facilitate networked remote collaboration among musicians. In light of this difficult situation presented by coronavirus, digital information and communication tools become crucial solutions for artists to interact and perform at all. However, it is also clear that artificial intelligence harbors even greater possibilities for a network approach to mu music, which is why As Electronica wants to contribute to the steady research and development in the field by actively encouraging interdisciplinary experiments with this technology. Roberto Viola, Director General of DG Connect from the European Commission, invited experts, both from industry and music, to speak about exactly these advances. Okay, well, I want to welcome you all to our panel on artificial intelligence and music. My name is Matthias Röder. I'm the head of the Karajan Institute in Salzburg and founder of the Karajan Music Tech Conference. It's a real pleasure to be here with uh, three wonderful experts. Um, and I'd like to introduce them shortly before we get started. Um, I'll begin with Elaine Chu. She's a musician, a great pianist, in fact, engineer and uh, music scholar. Um, she is uh, one of the world's experts in computation and cognition of music, has her PhD from MIT, was a professor at uh, University of Southern California, then at Queen Mary University, and is now in Paris at the IRCAM. Welcome, Elaine. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's my pleasure to be here. Um, I want to uh, continue with uh, Patrick van der Smart. Uh, Patrick is a director um, of AI research at Volkswagen Group. Um, he uh, is a professor of machine learning and um, uh, robotics uh, at the TU in Munich, or was that? Um, he headed the assistive uh, robotics and bionics lab, and he is also a, a, a recipient of uh, numerous awards, including the uh, Erwin Schrödinger Award, 
and um, uh, the King Sun Fu Memorial Award. Um, he also got a, a prize at the uh, Webit uh, uh, Foundation for his work in uh, technology and artificial intelligence. I think it relates to startups. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you so very much. Uh, finally, um, we have uh, Roberto Viola, um, who uh, is, um, has a PhD in electronic engineering and a master of business administration. Um, he was, and I found that very interesting, um, working at the European Space Agency uh, before he joined the world of um, uh, telecommunications and regulation uh, in particular. He was Secretary uh, General of the ACCOM and uh, joined the European Commission in 2012. He is the Director General for Communication Networks, Content and Technology um, since 2015. Welcome, Roberto. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you, with, with, with Elaine, with Patrick. Uh, and uh, so why I'm here and uh, what I have to do with the music and what I have to do with AI? This is the question, I mean. Uh, well, I'm here because I'm uh, uh, an horrible pianist, but that's not the reason why I'm here. Uh, the, the other thing I do in life is that uh, as Director General of the GCONET, I have uh, the responsibility of uh, the AI policy inside the European Commission in terms of getting together the programs, uh, taking together a bit the future and uh, trying with my colleagues uh, to advise the European Commission in which direction to go in Europe for uh, the uh, artificial intelligence. We have published uh, a white book about uh, what to do in Europe about artificial intelligence in terms of rules, in terms of investment in research, in terms of uh, uh, seeing the future uh, of our society and our economy. And of course, uh, uh, we uh, are now a little bit uh, hit as everybody else uh, by the uh, Corona crisis. Uh, that means that for instance, this is not a live event and this is not an event where I mean, actually, we interact physically, PT. Uh, so we had to slow down a little bit in terms of public consultation on the white book, but we are determined to go ahead and make artificial intelligence one of the fundamental pillars of the way we live and interact in the future in Europe. Europe has been uh, considered the place where uh, we, we like to have uh, the so-called human-centric AI. And then the first question is what it means, I mean, human-centric AI. Well, for us, human-centric AI means that AI uh, is uh, uh, a gift, a tool that uh, uh, the mankind can use to improve quality of life, to improve uh, 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 medicine, to improve uh, transportation, to have a much safer cars, uh, to have a cleaner environment, and to possibly also, and here we come with, uh, with music, to enhance the possibility for artists, for creators uh, to work and for people to understand art and music. Uh, we can, of course, and we will uh, debate uh, forever whether, I mean, uh, AI is a kind of self thing that would replace uh, any artist on earth. Of course, I can say straight away my opinion, the answer is no. But it's a very, very intriguing thing. And I think we can consider AI a bit of uh, everything. We can consider AI being a, a music instrument, like a piano. So the, the question whether we can do music without the piano or not, the piano replaces uh, uh, an, an artist would be a bit of a silly question. Uh, because electronic music or uh, uh, confusing music with the electronic means is not new. I mean, it's been around for quite a while. So you can consider as a, an answer, as a kind of uh, other tool to, to compose music. And I sometimes say to my friends, if uh, Moza were to be alive, probably would you say, hey, why not? I mean, what is the problem about this? Um, you can consider AI as a very interesting tool to uh, uh, actually teach music uh, and uh, get pupils to understand better, I mean, uh, the fundamental of music, the fundamental of harmony, the fundamental of playing an instrument, uh, guiding, I mean, uh, pupils into a faster learning process. 
Of course, the counter argument would be, I mean, people will never play an instrument anymore because, I mean, AI is so much better can play the piano. Why I should go into this pain of learning or playing the piano? I think, I mean, the answer, we have it as human beings because music is part of our life, enhances our life and all uh, ages. And uh, I think that would be the mistake. And that's the part where policymakers have to be very clear. I mean, uh, teaching music must be, uh, learning music must be a, a fundamental component of our life. Uh, if you can use AI, the better, but it's not a replacement. It would like be, I mean, listening to music is equally to playing music. They are two different things. The other element, of course, of this discussion is the element of creativity, where, of course, the discussion becomes more heated. I mean, uh, so it's uh, AI, I mean, uh, uh, kind of uh, killing uh, uh, the future of artists. Uh, I think we have already examples around. The point of creativity is that uh, uh, music is not totally a kind of a free play. I mean, music has its own rules, music has its own algorithm, uh, since music in terms of uh, rhythms and uh, uh, harmonic progression has been invented. I mean, there are many, many different variations of the theme, but of course, I mean, you have to respect certain fundamentals. And I'm, I'm, I'm impressed, for example, with the work of Elaine, uh, looking at the art bit. Uh, I mean, the, the, we have uh, a kind of, uh, uh, in our DNA, the sense of rhythm. It's part of our life. I mean, the first thing we listen in uh, our life uh, is the art bit of our mother. Uh, and since that moment, I mean, the, the concept of rhythmic uh, 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 progression of things uh, is part of the DNA. That's why people react favorably when they listen to something which is rhythmic. And I'm not uh, trying to steal the job of Len. Uh, I stop here. <laughs> uh, you, you can go ahead. But simply, <laughs> si simply to say that, I mean, uh, if AI helps uh, to construct all this, helps to uh, play in the style of Mozart, play in the style of Beethoven, and even Philin, when, I mean, uh, there are uh, unfinished jobs. Last year in Linz, we played the Bruckner, the 11th Symphony of Bruckner. It was quite a magic moment. I would not be crying to the machines winning over the, 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 the mankind. I would be intrigued and worried. But with the caveat, and then I finish. I think all of this works if, is, as policymakers, we maintain clearly that uh, uh, this AI project as the main kind, the people at the center of this project. There cannot be other consideration. That's why also from the legislative point of view, we want to be clear that we want legislation that protects the human being, uh, the fundamental rights, the right of choice, the right to have a future. Thank you very much for listening. And I'm really uh, happy and uh, absolutely thrilled to participate to the discussion. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Well, I want to um, uh, hand over to Elaine uh, for a few okay. um, maybe uh, uh, remarks and, and your reaction. Um, Roberto sure. uh, mm -hmm. talked about uh, some of your work, so Elaine, mm -hmm. take it away. Okay, uh, so with regard to the heartbeat pieces, uh, thank you for mentioning them. I had a lot of fun making them, but they're not made from normal heartbeats. They're made from abnormal uh, heartbeats, so they're arrhythmia heartbeats. And, um, and the pieces are meant to show how abnormal those heartbeats are. And in fact, when I play them for my daughter, she tells me they're very uncomfortable. She doesn't like them <laughs> because it makes her feel very dissatisfied. It doesn't fulfill the kinds of things that music are supposed to do. And, and I guess that's, that sort of brings in the idea that um, in, in creativity, uh, when we make uh, new pieces of music, we make new art, we break new ground, um, we, we are not trying to follow in, in the path of what has come before. We're trying to discover new things. And, um, and, and I think one of the challenges probably of uh, AI creativity is to discover how to find ways 
to break the rules. And even famous composers, uh, Mozart, Beethoven, they were known in their time because they broke the rules. And if we try to look even going further back to Palestrina, uh, when he wrote all the rules for how to compose harmony, rhythm, um, and he broke the rules himself. Uh, so this is, this is, um, I guess we, we try very hard to emulate these composers. We try to find the patterns in what they're doing. We try to find what are the patterns in what humans are doing in the different tasks that we do from day to day. Uh, but really, perhaps um, creativity is discovering uh, new paths, uh, discovering new ways um, to solve the age-old problems. Uh, and in some ways, creativity has to do with um, and it has to do with trying to solve uh, problems given many constraints. Uh, and as humans, we live in a world with many constraints. We have constraints such as uh, COVID restrictions right now. And we try to, um, uh, we try to overcome these kinds of constraints. Um, and um, in, in music, it's, it's, about, it's about finding paths through, through the many different constraints. You mentioned the rules, uh, the discipline that comes with practicing music, that comes with uh, adhering to some tradition and trying to create uh, music within that tradition. And uh, composers such as Stravinsky have said that it's because of the constraints that uh, that is why he is creative. The constraints forces him to become creative. And we as humans, we live in a world full of constraints and we have to find ways to survive. We have to find ways to be creative. We have to find ways to find joy in uh, the things around us. Uh, maybe things might be difficult, but to, to find ways to um, to, to still, despite it all, um, uh, make a rich and fulfilling life. Uh, and perhaps that is what creativity is. It's, it's not, uh, it's not um, finding um, the patterns of how people have solved these problems in the past, but to find if there are new ways to do it. Uh, so that's, that's one thought. Um, uh, and the, the other thing is uh, to, that I, I like what you say about AI being a tool. It's a new tool. Uh, like we had, we've had tools in the past. We have had calculators. We no longer need to be able to multiply large numbers in our heads. We can now punch it into a calculator. Um, we now have digital photography. We can have beautiful pictures at incredibly high resolution. We don't need to be able to paint portraits to minute detail. But that hasn't um, gotten rid of the, um, uh, the work of artists. Uh, artists have simply now found other ways to express art, uh, to, to create paintings or create uh, visual art. And, and so I, I think that AI will force us, uh, perhaps AI itself is a constraint. We learn how to work with it and we <laughs> learn how to use it to make new things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Uh, you talk about uh, constraints being very important um, for creativity. Um, Patrick, uh, are constraints also important uh, when you train an artificial neural network? What, what is the role of constraints in the world of machine learning? It's, it's exactly the same thing and, and I'm a bit afraid that this is going to be a very boring discussion because we all <laughs> agree, <laughs> but, it's, uh, but it's, mm. it's, it's all the same thing, right? Because uh, I, so the human-centric thing that Roberto started with is, is of course, uh, naturally, it's, it's a tool, right? All of these machine mm. learning methodologies are tools with which we try to more efficiently, more quickly, more whatever, um, uh, integrate uh, and interact with machines, with, with computers or, or with, with uh, machines, with motors, what have you. Um, and AI or machine learning does exactly that to, to help us do that better, to, to create a, an interface which is more comfortable for, for mm -hmm. humans or for, for uh, the planet and the real physical world around us. And, and that's, that's what we're doing. And that's what, what we are now getting much better at than, than before. And, and that exactly plays into this whole framework of uh, if we want to, to uh, combine the, the arts with 
this technology, then this is now exactly the right right time to do that. And and I like what you said uh, that that it's. Uh, it's uh, AI uh, is a, is a new new tool and a new constraint for which we need to <laughs> need to work. I think that's a very very correct way of of seeing that and of doing that. Mm -hmm. So, um, Matthias, as you said, those constraints in working with uh, with neural networks are, of course, a big problem uh, or a big challenge or or uh, a big thing. Um, as an example, GDPR, I, I know many people who curse and or many researchers or, or people using these methods who curse on GDPR. I see it quite differently. I see it as a as a wonderful constraint, which allows us to develop new methodologies that look into the, the use of information and data at a different way so that you still can do what you want to do as a researcher or as a developer, um, but within the regulations that, that make sense and that uh, help us gain more trust in the methodologies and uh, gain more dependence on these methodologies without uh, selling our, our soul to the devil, in quotes. Mm -hmm. um, so and and of course there are compute constraints right there they're very severe computers in for these these methodologies have become so much faster than than uh, than 10 or 20 years ago uh, because of parallel computing uh, but uh, at the other hand of course once these pieces exist then you start to fill them with your methodologies and again you have lost because you say well this algorithm will probably work with the next uh, generation of computers that will emerge in the next uh, 10 years or so and that's why quantum computing is now so extremely hyped as a possible promise there um, uh, but, but at the same time I, I think it was the first neural network conference I was at in 1990 or 91 uh, and there uh, a very famous researcher back then Tuvo Kohonen in, in Finland uh, he demonstrated uh, his mm -hmm. his neural network back then which composed music in the style of Bach and and it sounded wonderful for 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 everybody because it was like in the style of Bach and and you can debate about that. But that's thirty years ago, right? Yes. Uh, and those methodologies worked back then uh, at at a different level, at a different dependability, and so on and so forth. But the principles uh, are not all that new. So. Um, uh, I think the human-centric approach is 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 important for any researcher in this field, and f because we are, first of all, humans, and we're first of all people who who live on this planet, and the sustainability of the planet is uh, is number one, right? And and all of these methodologies that uh, that we develop um, are intended to do exactly that to to make sure that that you can can work on the sustainability but at the same time uh serve for for humans and animals and so on mm, patrick you mentioned that um the um the the results uh, from artificial neural networks 30 years ago are not so different from what we have today also, no the results are different the, the methodologies are, are that, similar but that's the what results I, are very different I yes, the, the, mm. the, yes the underlying theory is essentially not I mean, it has evolved, but there was no breakthrough um, on the um, methodological level. Is, is that, that, so that was that was not what caused the caused the renewed interest in in machine learning. Yes, mm. correct. And and do we believe that um, uh, shifting our focus to to sort of the European landscape is there is there something that um, from a Euro European perspective, we can do differently now to to really uh, accelerate this innovation also in the realm of um, artificial neural networks, machine learning, on so, and so on. You mentioned the um, uh, data uh, policies uh, that we have in Europe. Are they an advantage or a disadvantage? What, what is what is your view on this? What what does the European Commission think about this, Robert? Well, if if uh, if, if I, I may may put in a technical uh, point of view, and then um, Roberto afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> the. Um, the, the thing is that uh, machine learning, the way we see it nowadays and the way we see it applied nowadays, and I'm talking about image recognition, I'm talking about uh, uh, text to uh, speech, uh, speech to text uh, and, and voice recognition, all of these things, right, that we use in our daily lives. Um, each, each of those methodologies are based on supervised learning and supervised learning means that those machines learn from data sets which are typically created by humans uh, 
mm-hmm. or by by human driven processes mm-hmm. and and that's that's based on on those those uh, existing methodologies uh, in art uh, which were developed in the 80s and 90s to a, to a large extent mm-hmm. not all of them but to a large extent um, uh, and and that's that's wonderful and that's very powerful but it's also very, very limited because if you look at how, how, how animals learn, how humans learn, there is absolutely no supervised learning taking place there, right? We don't learn from somebody who says at each image uh, a million times, this is a cat and this is a dog and this is yes. a tree and this is a house, right? It, but, it, it works very different. No, it's, it's, it's not, mm-hmm. not as similar as, <laughs> as supervised learning. Um, but it's uh, it's a way of, of que- there is a question answering and there is some some supervision on uh, and, and correction certainly, but that's not the, by giving many many examples of the same thing until you learn it right, uh-huh. and and um, uh, th- that way of learning is a, is a barrier that we are going to be able to break now and mm. and how does that relate to the europe thing well i think there is one big difference between uh for instance china and the us and europe is the kind of applications that we're looking at if you look at the us for instance and you look at the uh, the, the the big five uh, four or five companies like like the like like google and, and facebook and so on and so forth they have a totally different um, uh, data approach uh, because of their end user uh, interfacing they have a totally different uh, need in these methodologies than what you would need in uh, non-it environments which are much stronger in europe in production and so on where you can't use these methodologies where you can't use supervised learning in such a way so strongly Mm-hmm. So uh, and 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 I think I think the uh, the the um, uh, industrial approach, which is stronger in Europe, and especially the SME approach, which is stronger in Europe, is uh, requests a much different uh, understanding of what kind of methodologies we need and uh, we should develop. Mm-hmm. And Europe is doing that. You know, Europe is uh, at least until 2018. Uh, I don't know the 2019 numbers, but leading in the number of publications in this field worldwide. Uh, so, so I don't see uh, something terrible going on in Europe. Uh, and, and I know that uh, the uh, support by the European Commission, European Commission is, a, is one of the key factors that this is possible. And this is, mm-hmm. I think, the perfect handover to you, Roberto. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick, uh, for the pitch for Europe uh, uh, that makes my life simpler. I mean, we published our world white book just two weeks before the pandemic crisis. And uh, there we had the idea uh, of creating two ecosystems, what we call the ecosystem of excellence and the ecosystem of trust. The ecosystem of trust that we just discussed, uh, uh, the ecosystem of excellence you introduced is the idea that, I mean, we would like to network the best of the best of uh, uh, AI experts and give them the best of the best of the tools. Now, and then the crisis arrived. And what has uh, learned to us the crisis? For me, it has really been a bitter lesson uh, because you ask uh, a commercial voice assistant, what is the cure for coronavirus? If you ask, uh, can I buy a pair of shoes? You will get AI immediately crunching the best pair of shoes for you. But the cure of the coronavirus, we are not yet there. So all this mighty uh, kind of hype of the press about uh, the advances of AI, the fact that, I mean, certain companies have uh, the keys of the world, we are not really there. There's a lot of work to do for the benefit of mankind, for the benefit of mankind, like finding a cure to virus, uh, like Corona. We have all our supercomputers, as we speak, now crunching numbers because we have now the model of uh, the virus, and they are matching against all the existing uh, compounds to find answers. Uh, and using, of course, AI algorithms. Uh, just to say that uh, we are at the beginning of a very long, very long journey for the mankind. And mm-hmm. that's exactly what Patrick said. I mean, today, the algorithms are still a bit, I mean, what we used to do. I mean, I, I, I graduated with a, with a thesis on, on speech synthesis, and uh, it mm-hmm. was all about this kind of things. Uh, so what is changing now that we have much faster computer, many more data, but I mean, the problem is uh, that uh, still uh, we have still a long way. Mm-hmm. So 
what we are trying to do is really pump as much as we can resources and ideas into uh, uh, an AI research network that must be as large as possible, and of course, stepping up our computing capacity. So that's why we want to move very quickly in very, very high speed computing designed for AI and then quantum computing. I mean, uh, that's, uh, that's the, the idea of excellence. And the algorithmic uh, area, uh, indeed, I mean, uh, break new grounds. We have a project which is called, uh, it's a quite a big one, uh, it's called the Brain Project, uh, where we are trying to understand better how the brain works uh, for two reasons, uh, to cure illnesses mm -hmm. that today we cannot cure, and also to understand better the cognitive processes of the brain. Uh, so this is really an ongoing journey. I think, frankly, we are at the very beginning of the journey. Uh, and I hope the answer we give uh, uh, in the middle of the journey, the same at the beginning of the journey, the human being has to be at the center of this approach. Mm -hmm. This is a, a great mm -hmm. uh, key for me to ask Elaine to bring in, uh, again, the music perspective into the discussion. We heard mm -hmm. from Patrick that um, there's a big difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. Right. Elaine, I wanted to ask you, how do humans um, uh, acquire musical skills? Um, how do we learn music? And is there something perhaps to be learned from that? The, it is supervised. AI? We learn, for example, a, a young child, when they're encountering a, a, a acquiring language, they listen to what the parents or people around them are speaking, mm -hmm. and through the exposure, they learn the rules of the language. Mm -hmm. And in that way, that in that sense, that is supervised learning. But um, may, may, I, may I interrupt, yes. Elaine? Um, yes, that, that's actually unsupervised learning. No? So uh, okay. that, that, that's uh, what we call yes. unsupervised learning. It's just a terminology. But, but what, what I mean by unsupervised learning is that somebody continuously gives you examples of input and output. Ah, okay. I right? see. All right. So, so, so that's that quite is different. still so, sorry statistical for the... learning. All right. So uh, yes, that was a exactly. confusion. Exactly. Yes. Sorry for that. Okay. Yes. All right. So um, I, I'm saying that, okay, so let's call that statistical learning. So uh, a child learns through exposures to different instances of how to use language and um, and they learn what is right what is wrong but I think to some at some point when they want to express their own thoughts when they want to write their own novel uh, when they're much much more uh, advanced uh, and they wish to become um, uh, someone who can express ideas beyond what they have been uh, what they have heard at that point they're going to have to break away from what they know and 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 I think that AI has not given us solutions for that um, how do we break away from what we know how do we create something that is uh, something new um, and and in our experimentations um, we, we don't develop techniques for AI, but we use them. Uh, and in our experimentation with music to create music in certain styles or to learn from examples of music to create other pieces of music, um, what we found um, is, is that that's only so much you can do with with that statistical learning mm -hmm. uh, and even with like large amounts of data being able to get very um, very good patterns of behaviors mm -hmm. um, extracted from uh, many many large volumes of data uh, I, I am not convinced that we have reached a point where we can abstract from that the kinds of knowledge that that we are able to um, that that can encounter new problems and find solutions to them mm, is L this L a problem with the dimensions of the data that we use for for machine learning i mean if you input only sequences of nodes and rhythms then mm. you're missing you know big structural uh, uh, aspects uh, if you if you mm. restrict yourself on big structural progressions then you don't get the details right is this perhaps the problem we see I, I don't think so. I, I, I think this, this goes, and this is perhaps related to some uh, uh, initiatives like the Brain Project, mm -hmm. right? So if, if we have a beautiful, beautiful piece of music and it plays like it should, and it's even played back with expression like it should, um, 
uh, but when but what what is it that we know that we know that this is this is the right thing to do or what is it that we know when we encounter something that's generated by ai and maybe it's good or not good but but uh, many different examples we are able to choose the one that actually has done something new or done something new in a way that is convincing or that you laugh at Right. Uh, so uh, we, we have um, these machines that generate pieces of music. And this is work with Doreen Harriman's where uh, the Morpheus system generates pieces of music. And uh, sometimes, occasionally, we get an output that we end up laughing about. And, and we laugh about it because it's not what a human might do, but we laugh about it because it touches our humanness. Uh, we appreciate what it's doing, and we choose it as the output we want to use. Uh, and that choice uh, in, in knowing, attaching value to that output. Uh, I, well, first of all, I don't think we know what it is we know to be able to do that. Uh, so we can't yet articulate what it is we know. And therefore, maybe we can't teach to a computer or write a computer program that can abstract what it is that we know. Mm -hmm. um, and the constraint might not be the techniques in AI, the constraint might be us, but uh, AI machines, AI systems are designed by humans. What we want them to do, what we want them to t get out of the system is designed by the person who says, I want a machine that can do this. Mm -hmm. uh, and so perhaps the, the, you know, the AI is a constraint because there are things it can do, there are things it can't do. We have to learn how to work with it. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the human being, there are also things, many things that we don't know yet about what it is that humans can do. And, and the music is an excellent example because it sort of, um, it, it, um, it pulls together so many facilities within the human mind, uh, physical, cognitive, um, many different parts uh, of the brains working together to try to apprehend this this medium uh, and to work with it and to appreciate it and and it also has an impact on us physically as well as emotionally yeah. so on, on many different dimensions it's it's something that is extremely complex and also affects us in very uh, deep ways this is this is a very interesting yeah. point and I want to uh, give it to Patrick um, when when we look at the way that uh, a lot of machine learning um, systems uh, work, they are highly specialized. But Elaine is now saying that in music you have uh, quite a few of these specialized systems working together. Is this perhaps a way forward in the research around artificial intelligence in music? Well, uh, again, unfortunately, I have to agree with Elaine um, because <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and admit to the many things that we are really bad at or that machine learning systems are really bad at. And, and the way if, what you said or the way how I interpreted what you said is one thing that is very hard is long term relationships. So finding mm -hmm. uh, relationships in, in, in processes or data, if you like, um, that are are long term, whatever long term means, that that depends on, uh, on many things, but but that's one of the really large shortcomings of the uh, systems that we're working with these days, is that th that they c are very good in finding short term relationships. If you're looking about about hundreds or maybe thousands of of time steps, whatever that is, that that works nicely. But if you go beyond that, if you uh, if you look in the realm of of weeks or days or whatever, th there is no system that can really cope with that well and and that in uh, a second thing that is even harder is incremental learning and that means that i gather my my experience it's also called long uh, lifelong learning I, I gather my experience and i build up on the on the uh, experience that i have or the 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 relationships that i learned before and I use those those learned models to then create improved models and in, in do better inference in the future. And that's something uh, that that these systems, well, it's a, it's a totally unsolved problem uh, today. Uh, nobody knows really how to deal with that in a, in a, in a good way. And that's exactly mm. what you're referring to, Matthias, I think, uh, when you say, well, how can you, can you 
uh, use small systems to create bigger systems. Well, we can do it by hands by saying, well, I know I need those components, as you mentioned that, and, I, and, and, and we can stitch them together to get a, a working whole. But to have the system figure that out by itself is is really one of the large challenges. And and you can see that in two ways. You can on one hand say, well, uh, I, I, I have my rules. Um, which I want the system to adhere to. And, and if that's in music, that's a very typical example, but it's also, of course, in, in control of machines or, uh, or, or in audio processing or, uh, or, or image processing. I have rules that I want the system to stick to. And how do I combine those rules with a, a, a learn, learning approach? Um, where I somehow embed the rules into my system and then on top of that do learning. All of those, yes, there are, there are many solutions and you find a zillion papers on that, but no, there are no real solutions that really tackle the problem in a, in a sustainable uh, way that we, that we know, okay, this is a solved problem now, we know how to deal with that. So if, if you look at those two, and I think core problems, uh, it's, it's not so much the dimensionality of the data that's an issue, but it's more uh, long-term behavior and long-term relationships in data that, uh, uh, that, that are a problem. If, if you look at, uh, at um, uh, music generated by neural networks, you will never find a piece that is half an hour long. Mm. Right, uh, or uh, at least not an interesting piece. That is happening. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I have very much trust in such a system creating an interesting piece that is thirty seconds long, or maybe one minute. Mm -hmm. um, but anything beyond that, uh, forget it. With our our current state of uh, state of knowledge and technique. Mm -hmm. So you think it has to do with this long term memory? Because I, I'm I'm wondering if it has to do with the representation of the problem. Because um, you, 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 your guess is as good as mine. Though. Yes, it's, I, I, I think you're right. It has to do with the representation of, of, of stuff and of, of those things. Yes. And the human brain project was mentioned before. Um, uh, there, it certainly uh, is, is one of the, the topics. I, I've worked in that project. And I've, uh, one of the topics to look into representation of data in mm -hmm. in artificial systems and basically how does the brain do that and we have absolutely no idea how the brain does that right uh, uh, I, I work with together with many neuroscientists and and the more you uh, you discuss it the more the, the conferences go on the more question marks are are put up because there is more uncertainty about existing um, uh, truths in neuroscience than there are solutions and that in, that increases because if you look at uh, at the models that are around there they uh, and we can replicate them with with artificial neural networks um, they don't hold up and the approach that the brain has with respect to learning and representation of data is so totally different and so much more mm. efficient in in mm -hmm. some ways, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, a neural network is better at, at maybe at, uh, at image recognition, especially at high speeds, mm -hmm. but that's not a survival feature, right? That's not <laughs> the main thing that we need to survive for or to, uh, or to enjoy, mm -hmm. enjoy the arts or whatever. So, so uh, I, I agree with what, what's, what was said before is that, that we are very much at the beginning of the development of these technologies and and we have a, a set of very good tools that we work with and that we that we should deploy as efficiently as possible but we really have only only just started uh, seeing what's possible and, and solving that so when you when you look at at uh, the systems that we have right now Patrick says you know you you get very convincing results with open source software that you know can produce 30 second snippets of music very convincingly in various mm -hmm. styles. Now, I'm, I wanna think a little bit with you about what could be some of the applications that um, uh, would help musicians right now in, in pedagogy, but also in composing. I would assume that these specialized systems could be extremely helpful in the compositional process, could perhaps even trigger you know, inspiration in, in, in the process. Um, what are some of the um, technology 
um, uh, desiderata you guys have when it comes to uh, composing music. Elaine, uh, what, what are your thoughts on this? <laughs> Would you like uh, to have a little plug in in your digital audio workstation? <laughs> uh, that, that, that's my digital audio workstation, yeah, actually, but, analog yeah, audio workstation. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Um, it's a, an interesting field, right? To get inspiration from the machine. Um, is this is this something that you see in your work uh, increasing? I, you know, I, I love the music that that our computer systems uh, 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 generate. I, that's why I play them. I, I, I integrate them into concert programs. Um, I like them because they. They don't sound like any other human composer. Mm -hmm. They sound like themselves. And they break the kinds of rules that no human composer who's been trained to compose would ever do. And I love it. I love it because it's quirky and it's funny. Um, <laughs> so you don't want them to be better. <laughs> I don't want them to be like known composers. Mm -hmm. I want them to do something different. And, um, and, and I, I go back, going back to visual art, uh, I think when, when I used to try to trace things and try to copy it as much as possible, and, and then I'm disappointed because it's not as good as a photograph. It doesn't quite capture the image. And, and my dad will say, well, you know, why, why are you trying to, to do that? You know, you, know you, can, you can do something different. I mean, um, humans are not meant to do uh, to, to well, well, maybe the, the analogy would be, uh, yes, we can get computers to compose in 30 seconds, very much like Bach, mm -hmm. and, and do something really beautiful. Uh, and it will be another Bach-like uh, chorale. Mm -hmm. and, um, but maybe we can use them and play around and in a playful way. Mm -hmm. We can make new things. Uh, we can maybe like Picasso, things that would never be joined together. You, you just pile them together. Mm -hmm. um, we, we can make new art forms. And, and I think it's, it's a great, it's a wonderful new tool. And, and we, we've been talking about composition and I'm going to just break away from composition because mm -hmm. everyone thinks composition is the creative art mm -hmm. or improvisation which is like you know uh, on online real-time composition <laughs> uh, but uh, I think that performance and uh, listening to music is very creative Absolutely. to 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 perform well to come up with a new way of saying the same thing that you know hundreds and thousands of people have said before you and and uh, put it onto archives um, that's extremely difficult uh, and to come up to with a new way to deliver uh, and to produce new insights that's extremely difficult mm -hmm. and very challenging and extremely it's a very creative um, kind of work yeah and, uh, and computers and could help right um, to absolutely. bring that out uh, computers I mean, yes I think about my, mm -hmm. my time when I was in the conservatory and all of us play instruments so we can mm -hmm. all relate you know you have this music in front of you you try to do to do to get it right and then in a the second step you try to make it your own but you have no way of knowing if what you do is exactly like everyone else has done or a little bit different is there some <laughs> originality and i think this is a great way for technology to actually uh, let a student know hey be careful you're doing it like everyone else <laughs> <laughs> That would actually be an easy one. So, but, but <laughs> Matthias, uh, there's yeah. something important, especially for the new generation. There's um, no short path to learning, uh, learning an instrument, uh, learning <laughs> art. Uh, look at music streaming. When I, when I was a kid, uh, I mean, uh, my dream was to buy a record of Onkarayan, actually. It was one of the <laughs> first things I did. One record. One record. Yes. Uh, so, uh, and this, I mean, our span of listening music was uh, 10 records, 20 records, what we would have in the house, a bit the radio. Mm -hmm. Now, whatever piece you imagine, you, you go on streaming and you listen to it. Are we more uh, musically savvy than uh, 30 years ago? Mm -hmm. uh, I, frankly, I don't think so. Uh, so, when you take AI, AI can tell you exactly how music progression is constructed what should come next, 
how a melodic uh, uh, sequence is constructed, uh, but would you become better musically just with this? Mm -hmm. I doubt. Frankly, I doubt. Mm -hmm. So here we have, uh, just to be controversial a little bit, yeah, no, no, we, no, have like it. <laughs> we, we have a risk uh, that uh, there's a kind of uh, shortcut uh, that uh, we are kind of suggesting to people to learning, which actually does not exist and puts in danger, I mean, um, the development of the human brain, frankly, because there are many trash, sorry to say, apps learn the piano, I mean, of course, uh, you learn the piano if you study art and you do many years of artwork. That's you learn the piano. I mean, and there's no shortcut for this, I'm afraid. Uh, so, and if uh, young people believe that they go on a computer, they put three things together, this is music, this is new. And Elena says we should not be against this. On the contrary, welcome this. But also keep firm the idea that kids have to learn kids have to improve because otherwise we risk to have a generation which steps back in terms of the gymnastic of the brain which is necessary i'm fearing the moment which is behind the corner that the new pop star will be an ai this is i think behind the corner frankly i mean uh, because uh, it, it will happen but when it will happen what does it mean it means that uh, there's no future for musicians or it means that uh, there's new kid in the block and we have to integrate it and people still have to be better and learn this is what we must prepare we must prepare a generation that lives with ai but still has very well planted i need to study i need to progress and i need to work hard to get there so do you think then that um, uh, we always have to know the path where we came from in order to then do something new yes and what does that mean in terms of computation patrick is this something that uh, is this the way that also in machine learning and artificial neural networks one learns uh, basically, yes. So, so the typical approaches, and and there I'm not talking about the supervised learning, which uh, which I mentioned before, but um, more li something like like well closer to intelligence. It's not intelligence, but what you typically do is that you uh, learn from from observing uh, what's going on, yeah, and and you use that that learned uh, model of your environment in order to predict what's happening in the future. And if you can predict what's happening in the future, then you can control the future, mm -hmm. right? Because you can play it in your head, mm -hmm. you can play a simulation in your head and you say, well, if I take this and that decision, then this is going to be the outcome. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's uh, that, that's how a large part of, of research is going in this direction where you say, well, on the, first I, I try to learn a representation of my world, whatever that is. That we are now traveling to Stockholm, more precisely to the Royal Institute of Technology, where Professor Bob Sturm will introduce us to the topic of music as an experience in the age of artificial intelligence and computational creativity. The panel that is part of the AI music program features six composers that have used AI music creation, namely Jennifer Walsh, Odette Bental, Robert Rowe, Shelley Knotts, and Artemi Maria Giotti, who also will be performing her work in Linz. Okay, welcome to this panel. My name is Bob Sturm, and I'm an Associate Professor of Computer Science at the Royal Institutes of Technology, KTH, in Stockholm, Sweden. My research addresses applications of artificial intelligence to music, specifically in the music creation process and the variety of ethical considerations that entails. This panel, called Music as Experience in an Age of Artificial Intelligence and Computational Creativity, features five composers who have worked with and used AI in their creative work. The title of this panel alludes to John Dewey's Art as Experience, so I hope the conversation addresses the whole process of music creation, including conception, composition, performance, reception, revision, and so on. I don't want today's discussion to try to, to define artificial music intelligence because it distracts from the very interesting things composers and musicians are doing with AI as one tool of many. 
The five composers on the panel have all used AI in their work. So let's introduce ourselves, starting with Professor Jennifer Walsh. Hi, Bob. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, I can see. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. It's um, really, really nice to get together with a group of like-minded people who are all interested in, in AI and music. Um, I my background is I'm a I'm a composer I'm a performer um, I sort of got into I became interested in machine learning and artificial intelligence sort of in the last I would say maybe um, eight years or so and uh, for me initially when I was interested. Uh, in working with machine learning. Um, this was still at a stage where wave nets didn't exist and everything was about MIDI notation or ABC notation. And because I'm a vocalist that works a great deal with extended techniques and I do a lot of free improvisation, uh, it sort of, things really got interesting for me in the last four years when it became uh, possible to work with raw audio and to do things live. So, uh, I know Bob will, uh, Bob will play a short video now, which is a project that I did. Uh, it was a collaboration with the artist and technologist Memo Acton. Uh, this was a commission from Somerset House Studios in London. And it's a, a project called Ultra Chunk, where for a year I made videos every single day, just shot with my webcam of me improvising with my voice and then memo coded this configuration i think it's about six different neural nets that work in tandem called grandma uh, granular neural nets for music and audio and these work with me live so as i'm performing with my voice live um, these are responding to me so i have this I suppose this, this sort of brings together several different strands of why I'm interested in machine learning in that um, I get to see the inside of it by having to make the corpus myself. Um, and then I also get to feel what it's like to be a human performer performing with an intelligence which is not biologically human and having this sort of space on the in the sort of bringing the uncanny valley to the performance stage and, and and sort of feeling what it feels like to be improvising, to hear something listen to you and then stop listening to you, but, but to have this encounter with this other type of intelligence. And next, we'll continue with an introduction from Professor Robert Rowe. Hi, uh, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, indeed, I was trained as a composer um, and have been working on algorithmic composition for 40 years. First started at the Institute of Technology in Holland, uh, working with Dr. Friedrich Arkenik and Paul Berg, and others uh, moved on from there to IRCOM. Um, where I was able to start working on uh, real-time applications of, uh, of uh, algorithmic composition. Um, went from there to the MIT Media Lab, where I wrote my dissertation on uh, these kinds of systems that can listen to musicians in real time and respond to them based on some of the musical aspects of, uh, of what the musicians are doing. Um, my first book, Interactive Music Systems, was based on that. I was working with Marvin Minsky at the time, uh, certainly in, uh, informed my uh, ideas about artificial intelligence as they relate uh, to these uh, topics. Moved on from there to New York University uh, in the Music Technology Program, where I have been uh, ever since. Wrote a second book, Machine Musicianship, that Bob referred to uh, earlier. Um, <clears throat> perhaps I'll drop in just a bit of audio from an improvisation I did with uh, Steve Coleman and Muhal Richard Abrams uh, at the BAMF Center in 1989. 
At NYU, we have been uh, heavily involved with machine learning and in particular deep learning in the Music and Audio Research Laboratory, um, about $10 million in uh, NSF funding to explore various aspects of that. Uh, recently, particularly with environmental sound, uh, since there's money to there is more music, unfortunately, at least in the U.S. Um, but I think maybe the most important thing, at least what feels most important to me right now, is I've just started teaching a class called uh, Music of the Mind and Artificial Intelligence for undergraduate students, uh, 18 and 19 year olds, to try to get them to understand what AI is, what it can do, uh, and what it can't do. Um, as I say to them, it's going to be one of the defining aspects of their lives, uh, and they need to understand it. Uh, there is so much misunderstanding about what these systems are really capable of that uh, is very dangerous. Um, I don't think the danger comes so much from the fear of superintelligence as it does from people attributing much more intelligence to these things than they actually have. So teaching um, you know, 18 and 19 year olds, not only to use the but what they're doing, um, how to understand them, and then how to train their own models uh, to make them use. And next, we'll have an introduction from Oded Bentol. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm a composer and researcher. I actually am collaborating with Bob, where we actually met back in the 1990s at Stanford at Karma. Uh, I'm using uh, kind of intelligent or demi-intelligent uh, things first, like Robert and uh, Jennifer in kind of live interactive situations where I want the computer to react intelligently musically to the input signal. But since I did, uh, like four or five years, Bob and I have started this project uh, of applying machine learning to uh, a corpus of uh, folk music, originally Irish, and now we uh, gradually am, are expanding. And uh, Bob is going to play a short excerpt from the first piece I wrote using uh, this approach, where material generated by uh, a system trained on Irish folk music uh, is generating things and I work with them and I titled the piece Bastard Tunes uh, in the kind of original way of the meaning bastard that it's kind of the illegitimate offspring of me and an artificial intelligence. And let us move to introduction from Artemy. Um, so good afternoon from me as well. Um, I am a composer and artistic researcher, and my research explores not only compositional applications of AI and machine learning in particular, uh, but also the potential of machine learning to shape musical thinking, to shape compositional thinking. Um, so I'm interested in the relation between computational um, tools and technical possibilities on the one hand and compositional affordances on the other hand. So um, in other words, I'm uh, interested in um, exploring whether and how machine learning and artificial intelligence can lead to the emergence of new artistic concepts and practices. 
In my compositional practice, I focus on the interaction between human musicians and interactive music systems that use machine learning to process and uh, to collect and process information from their environment. I call this type of compositions interactive compositions. Of course, the type of computer music system that is involved in these compositions is not a system that is meant to be used in an uh, improvisational context. So these systems are um, designed for the needs of a specific composition, of a specific compositional idea, which means that their behavior is very idiosyncratic. And this, in combination with the score, um, allows the piece to maintain its identity while at the same time enabling the musician and the interactive music system to make decisions in real time and to determine the course of the performance. So in a way, its instantiation of the work um, is the result of collaborative and collective creativity between human or among human and non-human agents. Um, the piece we um, are going to hear next uh, is such an interactive composition for uh, human and robotic percussionists and it's called uh, Imitation Game. Okay, let us now hear from the final panelist, Shelley Knotts. Hi, uh, I'm Shelley. Um, I am a postdoctoral researcher and I'm currently based at Durham University in the UK. Um, and I'm working on a project there called Mimic or Musically Intelligent Machines Interacting, Interacting Creatively, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, and this project is about um, developing an accessible web-based platform for the creative use of machine learning, machine listening and live coding. Um, and the part of that project that I work on uh, is about machine listening um, with the researcher Nick Collins. That's the the British Nick Collins, not the uh, American one. Um, and as part of that research, we've also uh, conducted a survey on um, sort of trying to gain some uh, perspectives on how much people are actually using music AI software in their work and also the attitudes to AI. So I'm happy to sort of talk about that as we go along. Um, as well as being a researcher or like as part of my research, um, I'm also a musician and uh, improviser. Um, I work primarily in live coding performance um, and also on network music, collaboration and imp improvisation. Um, and sort of to talk a little bit about how I've used AI in my work, um, I think it's not really a term that I tend to associate with my work, um, maybe largely for some of the reasons that Robert talks about, that there's a lot of sort of obfuscation with the term AI, that it doesn't really, really describe what's going on in the background. Um, and I think some people kind of often use it as a way to sort of like hype the work or market the work um, rather than to talk about what they're actually doing. So um, yeah, a lot of the work I'm doing is to do with machine listening and sort of small data sets. Um, and sort of driving creative processes with small amounts of data. Um, I'm sort of driven by sort of the desire to have the computer do things that I don't expect and sort of have some agency and to intervene in creative and collaborative processes. Um, and in general, as a performer, I don't really want to be in fully co in control of the systems that I'm performing with. Um, so I want there to be some um, sort of sense of collaboration in the same way that you would have when you're performing with jazz musicians or um, other types of human musicians is what I'm trying to recreate with um, those performance systems. 
Um, and I'm also doing work that's often sort of quite implicitly or sometimes explicitly critical of sort of how we're interacting and working with algorithmic systems. Um, so one piece I did was a work for telematic female, a telematic female laptop orchestra, um, which was an algorithmic mixer, which was sort of like trying to question the ideas of like making an algorithm manage um, a collaboration and sort of the, all the ideas around hierarchy and equality and um, sort of bringing a programmer into a creative process that that might bring up. Um, and another work that I've done recently that I think we'll maybe hear a clip of is Algorithmic Girl, um, which is uh, a piece that's sort of explicitly driven by um, punk music. Um, so this was sort of be, supposed to be a little bit of a poke at the fact that a lot of um, sort of big data machine learning um, algorithms are driven by tonal music made by white men um, and also to do with thinking about appropriation in the context of AI. Um, so I sort of tried to do that by referencing the sound world and ideals of uh, Riot Girl, which is a feminist punk mu music um, and their sort of ideas around sort of seizing the means of production um, and critiquing established male dominated systems. Okay, so thank you very much for those introductions. Uh, they were on point, on time, very relevant. Some things that I've noticed uh, among all of your comments and some of the readings I've done is the use of AI to create worlds and uh, explore artistic concepts that were, were not thought about. I would like uh, for you each to reflect on your use of AI in your work and where you see it adding and where you see it detracting. And if I might be so cheeky as to uh, specify an order in which you could respond, perhaps starting with Professor Walsh on that question. I, I, I think a lot of composers view um, AI, it's almost like an extension of Cage's engagement with the I Ching. It, it's a way to add random elements or to sort of jog people out of a rut, you know, or to sort of, to sort of, uh, you know, provide solutions compositionally that maybe, um, you know, don't seem intuitive. And when I use the word intuitive, that already opens up a massive uh, can of problematic worms in that, um, you know, of all like composers are trained, you know, early training for composers is really, really focused on a very specific way of writing harmony of of writing counterpoint and things like that. And so I think composers love that chance of being jolted out of that, uh, out of that feeling, um, whether or not they're writing tonal music that's fully notated or they're or they're, you know, working in a maybe a sort of controlled improvisatory space or something like that. So for me, that was very much my interest was a possibility to engage with something that I couldn't quite predict. Um, I was also interested in it, you know, in terms of it being a different type of intelligence in that I've worked, there's been loads of, of free improv players I've played with who said, okay, we're going to put this system and you can interact with it. And, um, and I've had fun doing that. But, you know, I, I think in terms of, you know, interacting with a machine learning system, I think almost like it's, it's like interacting with a dog 
or interacting with the bacteria. It's I sort of see it from this sort of Donna Haraway cyborg manifesto perspective, where it's this opportunity to to see how something thinks, like a different type of intelligence. And we don't expect dogs to think like us. And if you read people like Jakob von Oechsel, and he talks about the idea of the umwelt that an organism lives in, he's saying like a tick, you know, a tick when it's on the end of a leaf. Uh, debating whether it's going to drop onto an animal or not. It's it's sort of inputs are very different to ours. Its notion of its environment and where it sits is very different to ours. So that's what was interesting to me, th this sort of encounter with something else. And of course, I see the limits within those systems very quickly. And I see my own terrible limits and my own, you know, bad habits and ruts and things like that. And, it, and it's an opportunity to jolt them out. So that's sort of one thing I'm interested in. But the other thing I'm also extremely interested in is that, and, and I'm very interested, uh, Robert, to, to, I would love to see the syllabus for your class because um, I, I'm a professor at a Hochschule, at a conservatoire. So I, I'm professor of experimental performance at the University for Music and the Performing Arts in Stuttgart in Germany. And the students that I teach there could be opera, opera students, puppetry students, composition students. And I also teach students from the art school and from the design academy. So I have to teach this huge range of students and I never know exactly who's going to wind up in the classroom. And I've been, and I've been trying to think of ways um, and implementing ways to teach them about machine learning and to teach them about AI. And one of the things I keep saying to them is you need to look at the nuts and bolts of how these things are made. Um, um, because if you don't understand how a corpus is put together, uh, then, you know, as Shelley said, you, you end up with these corpus, we inherit these corpus, corpuses, corpi that already exist, um, uh, that are loaded down with biases and, and all sorts of problematic thinking. And um, so, you know, I think Trevor Paglin's work on ImageNet is really fascinating because it, it shows us how, how flawed that corpus is. So, um, that's what I'm also interested in is is if you look at the nuts and bolts of how it's put together instantly you start thinking about the archive and you start thinking about the canon which means it's possible to maybe decolonize the archive and the canons through the work that you're doing with AI so you can sort of do a lot more it's 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 it sort of reaches out into the world and it's something that's much much bigger than the networks themselves to encompass you know everything from from race and gender to, to class and history Professor Rowe, would you like to uh, continue? Sure. <clears throat> um, yeah, I would echo much of what uh, Jennifer said, and I'd be happy to send you my, uh, my syllabus. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, I would say that the, the real attraction and the thing that has kept me working on these things for 40 years now is the, uh, the possibility to think um, uh, a kind of meta design of meta systems. So thinking about systems that will create music rather than writing individual pieces, writing systems that are capable of, of producing a class of work um, and what's involved with uh, with that kind of compositional thought and what it makes possible in uh, in working with other musicians so that they become confronted then with these systems and you know w what kind of sense do they make of them uh, what kind of uh, music comes out of them that uh, that i may not have foreseen certainly they have not foreseen um, all of that uh, i think is the, still the real uh, magic of it um, and the, the drawbacks, I would say, I would characterize them more as the, uh, the challenges. Uh, I think that AI is at a huge uh, crossroads right now uh, because AI has come to be more or less synonymous with machine learning that, that has its fantastic possibilities, um, but also uh, its real limitations. And I think that music um, both spotlights those limitations and offers us a way to uh, to explore them and perhaps move beyond them. I think that music may be one of the most important research areas for um, for AI right now, because the things that machine learning does not do well is it doesn't deal with hierarchy very well, it doesn't deal with change over time very well, and both of those things are exactly what we need uh, to model music. Um, in terms of the, the frightening aspects of it, I mean, the main example I use is uh, Loomis versus Wisconsin, a U.S. Supreme Court decision that came down several years ago in which uh, there was a case where um, a man was convicted of, uh, of theft. 
Uh, prosecutor asked for a five-year sentence. Uh, judge pulls out his phone, looks out and, you know, picks up an app, plugs in the guy's uh, gender, his age, um, his uh, criminal history, says, no, the app says 10, you get 10. Um, who, you know, he has no idea how the thing works, what it was trained on. It was probably trained on all the mistakes we've made in the past. Uh, this went up all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, not a problem. He doesn't have to know. He doesn't need to know what it was trained on. Um, his app says 10 years, it's 10 years. Uh, and that that is uh, just extremely, I mean, it, it could be, could have been random numbers uh, for all we know, probably practically was random numbers. Um, and we have the opportunity I mean, the other problem is very small data sets. Um, if you're trying to recreate, uh, you know, the, the Beatles, there's 255 songs. It's not enough uh, to be useful for the way these things work. How can we develop uh, human in the loop, uh, all these kinds of techniques that will allow us to steer these things uh, uh, over time? How do we incorporate domain knowledge? There's all these things that are directly applicable to music, and we can explore them in a way that won't result in a car driving into a wall uh, or people getting shot. Um, so uh, I think that the drawbacks are the way AI is being approached socially, but I think that we're in a unique position to try to uh, make some progress. Thank you for that and highlighting the, the fact that music provides a very good playground for exploring many of these technologies. We'll return to the question of uh, who is allowed to explore applying AI to music in terms of engineers being not educated in music later. But continuing the conversation of what adds and detracts to your own artistic work with AI, let's continue with Oded Bentall. So I'll uh, echo Jennifer and Robert in that. It's a, for me, it's a way of engaging with an other. It's something external. I would refine that in kind of two ways. One is unlike Cage and the I Ching, the other we engage with does have kind of musical traces. It's not just an arbitrary uh, set of constraints. Uh, there are kind of what's being thrown back at me has some re resemblance or has some traces of human music activity. Uh, so it's a kind of uh, a musical uh, endeavor. The other thing that I found that is that it enables me to work a little bit like painters in the sense that uh, if I compose music in a normal way, it's all uh, down to imagination. But unlike a painter who can put some paint on a canvas and kind of walk back and look at what, and kind of come back and do kind of an interactive loop of evaluating, seeing what's there and changing. Uh, this happens in electronic music if you're doing uh, generating sound electronically, or when I'm kind of working with a machine learning system and kind and uh, looking at outputs generated by the system and then evaluating, say, no, this is worthless, or I can't do anything with it. Let's try tweak parameters uh, and and do more. So, so that's the part where I think is kind of changes the creative process for me, which is kind of useful to do as a composer. And that also relates to the kind of drawback or cause that it's, it's just more time consuming. Uh, getting to understand uh, uh, this machine learning, what it's not so much understanding how it does, which is really tricky, but understanding what it can do for me, uh, uh, involves uh, a, a long generation process of perhaps hundreds of instances of short, you know, few bars of music we, uh, I'm working with Bob and we're doing with um, uh, symbolic music rather than audio. Uh, but still kind of hundreds of times going over this iterative loop and 95 or 99 out of those 100 are, are not much or, or useless, between useless and curiosities, but then there are some nuggets there that are kind of ways of, of moving forward and then transforming them into music that I'm happy with is another step in the process. So it is a, a, a bit of a longer than just putting a pen to paper or uh, going into Super Collider and developing something which I already am familiar with. So this kind of unfamiliarity is costly in a sense. 
Thank you very much. Let's continue uh, hearing from Artemy. Um, yeah, so what um, I, I find I'm uh, becoming really interested in is not necessarily the capabilities of machine learning algorithms, but their specificities and also their limitations. So um, right now I'm writing a piece um, that is a comment on AI bias to some extent. Um, I am training neural networks to predict my own aesthetic preferences. Um, I have collected some um, recordings of uh, improvisations with the clarinetist because it's a piece for bass clarinet and electronics. And then I have just segmented these audio recordings and um, evaluated them based on my own subjective preferences on a Likert type scale. And then what I'm doing is I'm just using this material um, as training data for um, the neural network. Um, the idea is that the neural network uh, will um, evaluate the musician's input in real time during the performance and will respond to sounds it likes, but will remain silent or propose different sound material when it is not so interested in the musician's input. Um, another interesting aspect of this piece is that uh, the interactive music system has no sound material to begin with. So the idea is that the interactive music system will collect sound material during its interactions with different musicians. So there are two uh, um, aspects that are really important to me in this piece. Um, the first is that in this piece it's impossible to say where human agency ends and machine agency begins. So uh, the decisions that the interactive music system will make during the performance cannot be traced back to the data that I provided entirely because in a way my own bias, my uh, own subjectivity is filtered through AI bias and that's what I find ve uh, very interesting that uh, in the end what emerges through this process is a hybrid human and um, agency. And the other thing that this piece explores is uh, the locus of authorship. So where does my authorship lie in this? My authorship just lies in um, the data that I provided really because I did not even provide sound material for the neural network. So just by providing these examples, I am developing an interactive music system that can um, first make aesthetically driven decisions, evaluate its interaction with the musician and uh, aesthetically, and secondly, just um, collect sound material and build the piece starting from there, starting from just the, the neural network. Okay, interesting. Shelley, would you like to continue? Sorry, I'm not dealing very well with unmuting myself. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, there were so many interesting perspectives there. It's hard to add to that, but I suppose maybe I'm just going to um, echo some of the things that have already been said that what I'm interested in with AI is kind of um, systems that as an improviser will push me in new directions, stuff that I might necess not necessarily have thought of um, when I go into an improvisation that might push me somewhere new into new territory um, and also providing um, forms of feedback. Um, so I have one piece which is maybe a little similar to what Artemy just described um, where it's like uh, trained on like a corpus of my own improvisations um, and when I'm performing it's basically trying to tell me how similar or different my performance is to stuff that I've done before, um, which isn't really AI as such, but it's sort of a sort of feedback system. So uh, maybe if I find that I'm sort of repeating myself, I'm pushed into sort of a zone of thinking where I'm like, well, I need to do something new. Um, so that's kind of an interesting piece for me to perform with with an improviser. Um, and uh, yeah, and I guess also, um, I guess I'm interested in sort of abstracting aspects of um, collaborating with other improvisers into the computer system. So I'm um, thinking about collaborative improvisation and how I might want that to happen in uh, collaborating with an algorithmic system that I'm programming myself. Um, and in terms of detracting, um, I guess I'm kind of struggling a little bit with this. Um, I guess some sort of things I can see is like, uh, it's quite, 
it could be possible to sort of program um, sort of repetition or sort of creative ruts into your system. Um, I'm also, I guess, interested in sort of black box or interested in avoiding black boxes. So I'm a live coding performer and like um, part of <laughs> that style of performance is about revealing your code and through that revealing your process and being extremely transparent about what's going on in your computer. And as soon as you get into working with um, big machine learning models and black boxes, you're like obfuscating so much about the process. Um, and you're sort of throwing away as a live coder that transparency. Um, so that's something that I suppose I'm sort of conscious of like trying to avoid. Um, and I think some other people talked like really nicely about um, machine learning and dealing with hierarchy and sort of um, social approaches to AI. So I don't want to repeat what's been said, but I th also think that's interesting things to talk about. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to open it up to a more open format here and touch upon some of the um, ideas that you have offered. Um, one is this idea of black boxes. I like this, this uh, the fact that you can train an AI on data. Uh, you don't really know what it's learned to do, but you can see some outputs. You can interpret that output. And engineers like to see you know, their algorithms getting the right answer, and the right answer is defined as whatever's in the training data. But when it comes to artistic practice, Oftentimes, it's hard to define what the right answer is. And even, even more paradoxically, the failure of an algorithm could be of benefit too, creatively. Right? So could, uh, is anyone uh, willing to respond to this idea of failure of models providing creative opportunities or examples in their own work of such, uh, such occurrences? Oh, yes, Jennifer. I suppose one of the things that I'm interested in is how a lot of a lot of sort of off the shelf AI music generating apps and software are really full of failure and full of problems. And so certainly with some of the musicians that I work with, we sort of it, to us, it's like finding outsider art in a record bin, you know, at a at a thrift store. Is, is the, is is when you are able to let it fail in that way, you can sort of show the audience that it's failing already, and you can show the audience like the 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 limits of the software. So, um, I the the la like one of the last proper shows I played before lockdown you, you know before everything ha everything shut down was in Boston and I was working with Wobbly this uh, San Francisco based musician who's really um, very concerned with machine listening and and MC Schmidt a musician from Matmos and so we weren't doing a show that was an AI themed show and we weren't doing it to an audience of you know technologists we were just doing it to a regular tech uh, regular audience but we were playing around with all these terrible apps like I shouldn't say terrible apps in case I'm insulting the people who made them but we were playing with these apps that were like right using machine learning to write uh, pop songs in real time and we were able to see what pop songs they were using as the sort of the seed and then I was improvising trying to sing the original pop song but making it fit into the AI version and so those sort of those sort of failure moments uh, and what normal musicians would say this app doesn't work so well because I can hear shadows of the original you, you know in this new version and so therefore it doesn't get me a brand new piece of music um, in the improv world um, they're just seen as like fun toys to play with to, to mess around with the limits of, of what these things are capable of so from that perspective it's extremely rich and I'm more interested in the failures than the than the successes if it, if it sounds just like top 40 it's not fun anymore uh, because then you can't then you can't play with it and point out to the audience what's weird about it. Would anyone else like to respond? I can uh, I, I can add some. I mean, so again, going back to the project I did with Bob of the folk R and N, which trained on Irish tunes, and I was particularly interested in the non-Irish sounding. Uh, things that the system could produce. 
uh, because the kind of most of the what of, most of what comes out of the system is pretty generic and nondescript. Uh, and and kind of self-identical in a sense. Kind of you, you've got things that are unmemorable and, and sound everything like itself. Uh, they are occasionally, as our the album that we released uh, showed, are kind of good tunes that people can good Irish tunes that fit within uh, session music and can be fit into uh, an album of session music. But for me, the most interesting things were things that kind of really deviated uh, from the tradition just enough. Uh, that it wasn't uh, completely arbitrary or, or, or completely random, but had some traces of the original training data, but was sufficiently free of it uh, that I could play around with it a lot. And uh, the other example is this piece I just finished recently, which uh, relied, I tried to put my hand, I tried to see what can the Magenta tools that were released can do uh, it's a kind of different system that operates a bit differently than uh, folk RNN. And And uh, one of the things I discovered that um, they have two options. They, have a, they can generate melody or drums. And I think I was kind of mixing those two. So I was kind of taking a melody and asking Magenta to treat it as a drum or and a reverse. And so kind of things that were kind of not planned or not designed into the system produced for me the kind of most interesting uh, or, or kind of most thing with the most creative potential. Some of them are totally uninteresting in, in and of themselves probably, but for me had a kind of creative potential uh, because they're kind of unintended consequences of trying to subvert the system in a sense. Uh, yeah, I would, uh, I would echo uh, some of what has already been said. Um, personally, I've been, since the opportunities for interaction are somewhat limited these days, I've been uh, using some of these tools on, uh, on recorded um, signals. So one of them is uh, the system called uh, CREP that was developed here. It's a very good uh, pitch tracker. Um, but musically, some of the most interesting things that it produces are when it's very low confidence. So you can be getting the pitches, for, for example, I've been using it on a recording of uh, the Debussy Syrinx. Um, and at the phrase boundaries, where actually there's nothing being played, it does these fantastic things where it's just trying to figure out what the pitch could possibly be. Uh, which for me is interesting because it's a way of introducing segmentation, trying to find a hierarchy in the structure of this uh, this music. But just from a pitch standpoint, it's it's fan the, the mistakes are the most uh, are the most fabulous things uh, about it. Um, but in general, I've, I've been thinking a lot about the problem of, you know, we all as composers, and it's a general, you know, the sort of process of, of, of people working this way is that you tend to sit and wrestle with material um, until you get something that you think is, uh, is compelling. Um, and it's impossible for us to make a, a corpus of 50,000 examples uh, that are, that's going to train a meaningful machine the way that these things work now. Um, but there are... Um, you know, you know, using interpretability, uh, incorporating domain knowledge, but what I'm re really interested in is these uh, human-in-the-loop computing, where you train it on a relatively small data set, but then the model tells you, it shows you which examples it's most confused about. Um, and then you only have to identify those one or two, retrain, and then it shows you again something at the boundary. So even as individuals, we can get somewhere with these models without having to you know, contemplate the horror of uh, generating 50,000 examples, we can work in an afternoon and get something uh, advanced to the place uh, that it might be able to do something useful. So being able to leverage the mistakes as a way to make it more possible for individuals to work with these systems is uh, something I find very interesting. Uh, uh, Artemi and Shelley, you both wear two hats in terms of being a composer and being an engineer in developing uh, these uh, machine learning systems. How is it reconciling, is it easiest to, to work with those two hats or have you worked with machine learning engineers in creating some of the technology that you've applied to your music? Um, I can go first. Okay. So I'm actually not an engineer. I am a classically trained composer, um, but I am programming and training my own neural networks. So I'm programming everything from scratch. And the reason for that is that 
I really don't like black boxes. I want to be able to understand how the algorithms work. I want to be able to understand how changing um, a single parameter can affect what the algorithm learns. Um, so that was the reason I, I started programming um, uh, the neural networks myself. But unfortunately, I have not been able to collaborate with engineers yet. Um, I think this is um, terribly needed right now, actually. I feel that uh, engineers' interests and artists' researchers sometimes can be um, really far away. Um, and I think that the field would definitely benefit from more collaboration between artists and um, developers. Um, yeah, I guess I would also just add to that that I'm also not really technically an engineer. I mean, I'm a trained musician who has done a lot of programming, um, but I don't really have any computer science background at all. Um, and yeah, I also like don't tend to work with engineers as such. And I, I don't know whether it's just some like stubbornness on my part that if I'm building a system, I want to be able to build it myself and know how it works and um, be sort of involved in the entire process from sort of uh, having the idea to how it plays out in performance. Um, I suppose that's also like a little bit like the live coder in me. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I just, um, I guess I see the whole, um, the whole chain as like part of the creative process. Um, and so sort of giving that away to someone else and saying, okay, you program this part of it seems like um, it doesn't quite work for how I work personally. Okay, great perspectives. I would like to move to a, a, another topic, and that's the danger of involving AI in your work. We see a lot of media attention being devoted to uh, you know, the forthcoming superpowers of AI in a surveillance state. Uh, Robert mentioned the use of AI in sentencing uh, people, predicting recidivism uh, in crime, predicting crime, and so on. And in my own work, I wrestle with the development of AI. When I develop these technologies and I research them for music, am I somehow contributing to the surveillance state of testing these algorithms uh, in such case, even though music, working in the domain of music is not going to kill somebody like an autonomous vehicle, there are still ethical issues involved in that. We see a lot of machine learning papers devoted to trying to reproduce Bach harmonizations, uh, but also reproduce the Beatles. And of course, one composer is dead there and uh, others are living. The ethics of reproducing living artists and their voices carry some uh, weight for me. Could some of you reflect on these ethical issues of involving AI in music? Shelley. I'm happy to reflect on that. Um, yeah, I suppose I sort of like have a lot of um, sort of worries about uh, big data machine learning and uh, sort of not, I think we've already talked a little bit about that, about like not necessarily creating your own data sets and the amount of bias that's building into systems. Um, and also, I guess, you know, uh, the Google Magenta data, uh, algorithms have already been mentioned. And I suppose that's one example where you're talking about a huge tech corporation who's like appropriating giant amounts of data because they're probably like the only organization who has the time and resources to appropriate that amount of data. Um, and then that's being baked into a lot of AI, um, AI creative music systems. Um, and yeah, I guess we have to ask like what it is that we're baking in there. And I think there's like a lot of examples from other um, other fields where there's sort of been some problematics with that. So I think there was a recent story about uh, 
um, image data set, which had like huge, <laughs> huge and problematic amounts of racism built into the da data set because um, the labeling included like really offensive terminology. Um, and yeah, not having sort of a check on that and not knowing like uh, where the data has come from and whether the people have consented to that, I think is just like hugely problematic. Um, yeah, I also read uh, of another um, example recently where some researchers wanted to make a machine learning algorithm and they needed copyright free data. Um, and because a lot of European and America, well, or, yeah, Europe, Europe and America have really tough copyright laws, they took um, musical data from a country that has lesser <laughs> copyright laws and use that as their data set and like the artists who contributed to that were not credited or recompensed for um, what they had contributed so i think there's quite a lot of big ethical questions about sort of that amount of like appropriation in terms of the data sets that we're using well i would just say that the other nice thing about working with the 18 and 19 year olds is they bring me stuff that i wasn't aware of myself and one was this um video called travis bot everybody else may have known about this but i hadn't seen it before um but it was recreating the style of uh of travis scott um without using any of his own material so it trained him trained a model and then it output this uh, this material both visual and audio uh, that replicates his style and uh, one of my colleagues is uh, is uh, lawrence ferrara who is one of the leading uh, so-called forensic musicologists who um testifies as an expert witness in copyright cases all the time so i asked him you know and apparently travis scott had nothing to do with this it wasn't asked for permission um uh and I asked whether he would have a case, uh, a copyright infringement case. And Larry's, you know, just over email take was that he would not have a copyright infringement take because there were no samples of Travis Scott's work used in the video, but he would have a trademark infringement case. They're just trying to make it look like Travis Scott was enough to infringe his trademark, but not his copyright. Um, so yeah, there's a huge, huge problems with all of this stuff. Uh, you know, we've already talked about uh, the racism, sexism, all of the pro. If you're going to use huge data sets of, hum of de human decisions from the past, you're just going to cook in all of the human mistakes uh, from the past. So, um, you know, again, I'm hopeful that music might be a way that we could explore techniques for mitigating some of these problems, but the problems uh, certainly exist nonetheless. Um, I think that these problems, I, my sort of view is that like each problem that we have with these ethics, they create new, very interesting projects. So what you're saying, Robert, about, you know, getting a forensic musicologist to look at Travis Bott, this extends that project, you know, and makes like a new project that adds on to that. That's completely fascinating. Um, and I think that's how I try to view it is is that like if we really and I, I know I was saying this earlier this idea of looking at the nuts and bolts of how these things are made there's possibilities for intervention there's possibilities for for interesting questions to be to be uh, sort of unteased and I there's a project I've been doing at the moment which is taking forever because it's we're, we're building a corpus of all text scores that have been written. So it's everything has to be transcribed by hand. The, the, the folders are a total mess of like Word documents, PDFs, JPEGs, TIFFs, dis oral descriptions, handwritten scans of PDFs from the 60s. And, and we're putting it all together. And then just even to decide what the metadata tags would be was, was a huge, you know, at like like days of discussion but by putting it together the this i this uh, issues of authorship these issues of like um you know is it okay to use people's scores to train to train it on those have all come very much to the fore and what it's made us think about very much is that like the entire text score tradition and i'm really thinking like from fluxus onwards but some some sort of early performances of data that's sort of like a mythology it's sort of a folklore so most of the experimental composers i know that to them is their brothers grim you know that that's sort of what they were raised on and it's in their dna and when they're writing they're writing to that tradition they know they're participating in that tradition 
and they're often even using exactly the same syntax, the same vocabulary as people did 50 years ago or 60 years ago. Uh, and the solution Ragnar, my assistant, uh, came up with was he said, we need to uh, we need to make this project exist on the blockchain so everybody can buy tokens invested in the project by investing their scores in the project. But we were like, that's we don't have the money to, you know what I mean, to, to make this. But even to me, Ragnar's concept of, of like making a tech score machine learning project exist on the blockchain is important because we start to think about these issues of who wrote these works, how are they contributing how does the community use them you know when when even my students are introduced to tech scores for the first time it sort of blows their minds and they all start writing them but they're often writing things that are echoes of you know stuff from Lamont, Yo Lamont Young's anthology 1960 which itself is a collection of you know pieces by other people so so I think I, I always think like we there's loads of projects in the cracks if that makes sense uh, you know there's there's ways for people to sort of be involved with AI and I always say to my students you don't don't need to learn to code to, to have an investment in this project your phone's doing it anyway like right now so you're already involved in it but but if you just try to learn how it's put together straight away there'll be really interesting things that you can sort of draw out and turn into projects so i just wanted to add that um Legal and ethical issues aside, um, I think that the ability of um, AI to reproduce um, the styles of human artists might actually um, help enhance our creativity. Um, Georgina Bourne writes that each musical work exists in continuation of a musical past and in anticipation of a musical future. And I think it's this anticipation and it's this speculation about the future um, that is the most important part of the creative process and that will become increasingly important. So I think that as computers get better at imitating, we will get better at innovating. It's a good point to, to move to the future. In uh, Robert's book from 2004, Machine Musicianship, he writes in chapter one that a large part of the motivation for making music with computers is that computers are less troublesome to employ than people. And uh, talking about, you know, we see the redundancy of people in, in, in positions because their, their work is being automated. Several of you are educators of musicians and composers, and some of you are being trained in composition. So what do you think the future holds for your ability to make a livelihood or your students' ability to make a livelihood as more and more of the mus music creation process is automated? Well, as the one who wrote those words, I would point out that I went on to say that uh, my own work is, uh, is against that uh, idea. That, uh, just because computers are less troublesome to, to employ um, doesn't mean we should... Actually, what I said was that um, there is no meaning to, to machine music unless it engages a human culture. So that we have to find ways to make the machines interact with and be meaningful to human partners. Uh, so in my own work, that's why it has always involved interaction between, between humans and machines. Um, but that's where, you know, that's another reason to be teaching these students how to use these tools. I think that the tools are far away from being able to um, create meaningful musical experiences uh, the way that humans do. Uh, I think that they can certainly contribute to that process and add, um, uh, add uh, even expertise, let's say automatic mastering. Um, or, uh, you know, we don't, we don't credit all of the plugins that we use. There's already, it's, we're already far down the path of machines um, contributing in a very integral way to the, to the products that we're listening to. But I have not yet heard and don't believe I'm going to hear for quite a while a machine all on its own produce music that is uh, as uh, interesting and compelling as, as what humans can do on their own or what humans almost uniformly do in the collaboration with machines. So what's to, you know, to be training the, the musicians of the future, as, as we're all doing, um, is teaching them how to understand those machines and how to use them and how to um, uh, let them empower us to um, make our own expression. I think the, uh, 
I, like Robert, I'm very much doubtful that uh, we're, we're entering an era where machines, where music will be automatically uh, generated with the press of a button. Um, where I do think uh, there is a big difference is that the kind of skills required uh, for working in music are going to continue to develop. Uh, the skills that were needed 100 years ago are different from the skills we needed 50 years ago, from 10 years ago, and 10 years in the future. And I think as educators, that's the, that's the key issue, that we need to uh, prepare or, or get our students thinking about what will be uh, the skills they need and the career path, which I think what uh, machine learning is going to change is probably some of the career path, especially kind of the entry level jobs that are currently done uh, by people, by, by you know, graduating students or in the early stage where they learn on the job some of the skills that eventually they can develop of working in the studios and in small media co companies, how to get some of these. And these are things that, as Robert said, some of them are kind of being automated away. But that doesn't mean uh, that there won't be uh, new ways of making music. And I think that's the, the key issue. Uh, the idea that machines can imitate what we currently do, even if that is successful, which we are all doubtful about, I think, uh, does not mean that in 20 years time, none of us will uh, be needed at all. Because our own demand, our own thinking about what is music, what is musically possible, what is the music we would like to listen to, our own creativity as listeners, as performers, as composers also moves with the technology. So it's just about um, uh, finding innovative ways, like we talked about kind of various failures that get inspired, that inspire us, and there'll be other failures like um, turntablists discovered that uh, while most people just play vinyl records for their playback capabilities, you can also subvert that in sort of very interesting ways, and it opened new ways of making music that were not available before that. So uh, like all technology, um, it can be used in multiple ways, and uh, human um, innovation and capability for creativity moves with that and adapts to that new technological uh, environment. That's where we need to uh, point our students to. This is what we think is coming here. And these are, like Robert said, these are the skills, these are the kind of new systems you have to start thinking about and have to get your hands on to be able to be a productive and interesting musician in 10 years' time. I, I think that for me, when I talk to my students about the future, um, which is very strange because what I talked to them about as the future six months ago is not what I talk to them about now um, in you know late July 2020. But I always say to them, look, I doubt that during our lifetime, there's going to be a sort of an autonomous AI that's writing music that's at a level that a human can, that is indistinguishable. Um, but that doesn't matter because right now AI is affecting every aspect of your daily life. Um, it's, you know, my students, I always say to them, how do you pay for music? You know, because they're studying to be musicians. And I say, how do you pay? Who do you pay and how do you pay? And most of them are on Spotify or YouTube and they're not paying musicians directly, you know, so they're not using Bandcamp, for example, they're using Spotify and and uh, YouTube, and there is so much AI baked into Spotify and YouTube, deciding what we're served, how we're served it. And in the same way that, you know, there's been fantastic work done on how YouTube can sort of steer you into a right-wing rabbit hole. It can also do that musically on Spotify, not into a right-wing rabbit hole, but it can sort of steer you down certain genres or certain styles. and because I do a lot of projects with a lot of different music, um, there's times where my algorithm is completely awful and completely terrible. Like the, the I've trained the, the algorithm in a really bad way because I've listened to too much weird, different music and I'm getting served really weird, weird things. And I know that from day to day. Um, I also think AI is baked into Facebook 
and a lot of discussions about what music is, where music should go, Adorno, yes, no, that's all happening on Facebook. Like new music in a way has sold its soul to Facebook because it, it has made that the repository of a certain type of argument, which is often presented as a discussion rather than an argument. So that, that's already happening. It's already in there and it's been enough to already change how music, how music functions. Um, the last thing I'd add to that is that what, what is what what AI is doing well for music is writing sort of passable background music that can be in the back of a YouTube video that's about like how to make pasta or you know a cool new eyeshadow and because so much video is uploaded to YouTube every single day by influencers and they need music that doesn't have copyright restrictions um, like the company Juke Deck, this London startup, they were saying that's our market is we're not writing music for musicians. We're writing it for YouTubers, you know, who have another 20 minute update about what the family are doing and need to have like an epic guitar, inspirational, uplifting guitar music to put in the background of it. So so it's already there and it's already happening. And I think the first people um, if, that I say to my students, if you're interested in doing film music or you're interested in doing TV or commercial music, it would be smart to be up on this stuff because you'll probably use these tools rather than being Hans Zimmer and having like a live you know group of a hundred people that are writing you know emotional theme 47c you'll just sort of generate a bunch of stuff um, and then you'll you'll sort of tweak it and expand it and pull it apart and make it even better but it'll give you so much raw material for temp tracks for example that like it doesn't need to be it doesn't need to be human level just for a temp track so i think that's where i i view it actually that that the the real work on ai and music will happen in this sort of commercial youtuber background space um rather than you know i i don't think anybody's coming for the music that is played at darmstadt or you know is played in like in new york in the stone or or, or something like that yeah, I mean, I, I sort of agree with all the things I've said so far, and I think I would just like add maybe a slightly optimistic note that um, I think one of the things that AI doesn't take away from us is performance. Like, there's still a like theatricality that's very attractive to other humans of watching another human on stage. Um, doing a performance and possibly crashing and failing horribly um, that you just, I mean, uh, as a live coder, we already have like the criticism that is kind of boring to watch someone with a laptop. And I think it's even more boring to just watch a laptop on its own um, <laughs> making music. So um, yeah, I'm actually quite optimistic about the future of our interaction with AI because I don't think humans are gonna suddenly um, stop wanting to see other humans doing performances. That brings us to the. Uh, okay, Bob, can I um, uh, respond briefly to Shelley? Yes. Or kind of ask a kind of question. So uh, I, I was kind of imagining uh, someone uh, like going into a, a club situation, and there is just a laptop, and the screen is projected, and someone remotely turned it on and then the code starts spewing on the screen like live coding, but it does it all on its own. And I think that could be a kind of interesting performatively, uh, even when there is no human involved. So actually in, in that sense, I think, uh, I mean, to me, it would probably maybe even be more interesting to see it done uh, without the hands typing, which don't add much. So maybe that's a kind of, uh, yes, no question or yes, no option or potential. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's funny. There's already uh, some live coders who've written uh, systems that sort of autonomously code their own um, live coding music uh, without human intervention. And they are actually kind of funny and entertaining performances, I have to admit, um, because, but they're also, you know, trained on quite small data sets, because I mean, there's not like a huge amount of live coding. So um, yeah, it's kind of uh, funny to think about like what's gone into that system and whose live coding is it trained trained on and um, yeah, uh, but yeah, I think I'm all, I'm still like kind of when I'm watching those performances, still thinking about the um, human effort that's gone into creating it and where the system is sort of failing because it doesn't have the same sort of critical judgment as a human would have.
That brings us to the uh, near conclusion of this uh, panel. I would like to ask if there are any final reflections on your part or responses to some of the uh, points raised. I would just say thank you for, uh, for organizing this. It's been very interesting. And um, concluding remark would be that musicians should get involved. There's nothing scary or um, overly daunting or unlearnable about any of this stuff. Um, it's, uh, it's actually, I, I think of it as, you know, at, at one point the, uh, the engineers gave us the fast Fourier transform and we were able to think about sound in a new way and compose sound. And, and people learned to use those tools and now they think of them as a very normal part of their, uh, of their toolbox. And uh, they should think about machine learning the same way. We're being given extremely powerful tools for free uh, that anybody can learn um, and uh, musicians should do it. I, I agree completely, is, is I think it's really important for musicians to engage with it. Um, I often say to my students, if you're interested, Cadenza, there's a Rebecca Fiebrink course on machine learning for artists, so super easy and accessible. But the, the way I often frame it to my students, and this goes off what Shelley was saying about this nightclub with the... <laughs> with the, the laptop playing alone is, is I sort of, I know a lot of you described yourselves as researchers and I'm not a researcher. I sort of think of what I do as writing science fiction. And, and so it's just trying to sort of do thought experiments. And I remember reading um, Dropout by Curry Doctorow and there's a scene in a nightclub near the beginning where he says, it's not a DJ that's playing, it's something called like System 53 or something like that. I, I've completely misremembered the name. But he's saying, oh yeah, it's running LIDAR on the crowd to, to, you know, to accelerate the beats according to the entire energy in the room, the way a human DJ would read the room and think, okay, now, you know, it's this part of the night, I should, I should up the BPM or down the BPM. And so I, I think that I often, I'm, I'm sort of saying to my students, you don't have to make an AI piece using AI and learn how to code, but if you learn about it, you'll get an idea, and then you basically write a piece that is sort of a science fiction story in disguise. Uh, and, and that's the way that you sort of engage with it. So I find myself uh, recommending Ted Chang an awful lot at the moment as sort of like gold standard, gold standard person, you know, to talk about, or William Gibson also to, to talk about these issues with, because I think we all have to think them through together. Uh, you know, whether they come for our, our jobs in our lifetime or not, they're already in our phones, they're already in our laptops, like Robert said, which is even the plugins that we use, you know, so, so why wouldn't you want to think about these things? It's part of everyday life. Yeah, I would, I would maybe just like, like to reiterate what's already been said a few times that um, it's kind of, I, I feel like there's some urgency to have having more critical perspectives on AI. And I think um, artists are like well positioned to be giving those creative perspectives and also sort of introducing those concepts to people who aren't necessarily thinking about AI in their day-to-day -day lives um, through concerts and performances and through like sort of talking about AI, uh, presenting AI in, in different formats. Um, so I think there's um, a lot of interesting work to be that, done there. Um, and I think it would be um, great to have more creative and critical perspectives on AI. So uh, I would say that, yes, I think it'll be good for musicians to get involved. I think it's more than just, uh, it'll be interesting and you can achieve good things. I think. Uh, the field is defined too much by the engineering side. Kind of, it's driven by uh, what engineers think music is, and what the applications engineer thinks people would like to use. Uh, and uh, unless and until uh, more musicians of various hues get involved and uh, kind of shape shape how the kind of research progresses and what kind of the research agenda. Um, we're kind of, in a sense, we are kind of losing part of our ability to make music or, or to kind of engage with the future of where music is heading. Uh, so, so I think it's more than just, it's a fun, interesting tool to use. Uh, it's almost like a, uh, an existential imperative for future of music uh, 
for musicians to engage with it, kind of performers, composers, listeners, kind of in, in all sorts of ways we can engage with kind of shaping where the research is heading. And, and we don't have full control of it, but I think getting involved is better than uh, avoiding. Thank you very much for those uplifting messages and uh, call to action, so to speak, to get involved. Uh, you're all models, examples for budding musicians willing and able to explore machine learning in their own artistic work. I hope you stay safe and healthy. Enjoy the rest of the summer. And hopefully we'll meet you in person soon again. Cheers. The Adriatic Garden will take us now on a journey to the Adriatic Sea. Adriatic Garden Aqua Forensic 2.0 combines two locations on the Adriatic Sea with citizen science workshops on climate change and water pollution, underwater video sound programs, discussion panels, and an exhibition program that includes the values of care, kindness, compassion, environmental justice, action taking, and cooperation with the Adriatic Sea and its creatures. Join the artists and initiators Robadina, Sebjanic, and Tino Sudic now on their journey to the sea. Welcome to the journey of the Adriatic Garden. Adriatic Garden, Aqua Forensic, Chapter 1. The Adriatic Garden Aqua Forensic 2.0 program, presented at the Ars Electronica Festival 2020, focuses on ecological and climatic changes and challenges of the Adriatic Sea. Within the project, we would like to give special attention to the values of care, compassion, environmental justice, action-taking and cooperation with the world's rivers, lakes, wetlands, seas, oceans, aquatic flora, fauna and minerals. Adriatic Garden Aqua Forensic 2.0 connects two places by the Adriatic Sea, Dubrovnik, Croatia, where Gino Šutic is hosted by the UR Institute, and Cooper, Slovenia, where Robertina Šibjanic is hosted by Pina. The framework of the Adriatic Garden project is Aqua Forensic, an ongoing art and science research method, which Robertina Šibjanic from Slovenia and Gino Šutic from Croatia have been developing since 2018. Within the scope of their works, actions and research in the Aqua Forensic Framework, the artists attempt to shed light on the presence of invisible pollutants in the water environment, which are of anthropogenic origin, mostly pharmaceutical or chemical. Gino Šutic is a biotechnologist, postmodern intermedia artist and educator. He is the founder of the Universal Research Institute. He is doing research in multiple areas of natural sciences with a special focus in the fields of bioelectronics and biorobotics. He invented the term biotweaking, referring to the enhancement of living organisms or their parts to completely express and make use of their full potential. The work of the artist Robertina Šebjanic revolves around the biological, chemical, political and cultural realities of aquatic environments and explores humankind's impact on other species and on the rights of non-human entities, while calling for strategies emphatic towards other species to be adopted. In her analysis of the theoretical framework of the Anthropocene, the artist uses the term aquatocene and aquaforming to refer to humans' impact on aquatic environments. To make the Adriatic Garden journey, we, Robertina and Gino, have been joined by various collaborators who kindly help us to realize the program on local and global levels. 
we would really like to thank Mania Ristich for her incredible contribution to the Sonic Wilderness program, Miha Godec, who contributed to the Aqua Forensic Workshops, and also the teams of Ur Institute, Pina, Projekta Tool, Pivcamp, Ars Electronica, Sictor Institute, and many others. The Adriatic Garden is a platform which hosts a wide array of activities. Exhibitions, installations, panel discussions, workshops and much more, while enabling audiences to immerse themselves in the underwater world of the sea, as well as listen to the soundscapes under, above water, in the sonic wilderness of the Adriatic. The sound program featuring guest artists is co-curated by Manja Ristic from the Croatian island of Kurcula and Robertina. Art, science and citizen science coalesce within the framework of Adriatic Garden Aqua Forensic 2.0 opening up a wider discussion about our solidarity and empathy with waters beyond human perception. Chapter 2 97% of the world's water is salt water, 2% is fresh water in the form of ice, and only the remaining 1% is drinking water, which is distributed around the planet very unevenly. The exploration of an ecosystem requires detailed study and observation. The ocean is the most complex, challenging and harsh environment on Earth, and accessing it requires specially designed approaches, tools and technology. With art and science collaboration, our ability to observe the ocean's environment and its resident creatures caught up with our imaginations and helped us to understand it in ways we could not even envision before. Researchers and artists are working together to achieve a better understanding of all the problems and challenges that humanity has in interacting with the sea. Chapter 3 Aqua Forensic illuminates the invisible anthropogenic pharmaceutical chemical pollutants, residues of human consumption, monsters in the waters. The project combines art, science, citizen science in a hunt for a phantom and opens the discussion about our solidarity and empathy with waters beyond human perception. These invisible chemical pollutants, such as legal and illegal drugs, mood controllers, antibiotics, antimycotics, painkillers, hormone pills and so forth, are the residue of human consumptions discharged into underwater habitats that were explored during a residency at Ars Electronica in the summer of 2018 in two specific localities. The Danube River, Linz, Austria and Adriatic Sea, Dubrovnik, Croatia. The project goal is to make these invisible anthropogenic pollutants and the pattern of their effects in the water habitats visible. With samplings of water and the seabed, we are hunting for a phantom of our presence in the context of new mythologies. With pollution, we change the oceans inside out, influencing life and behavior of the whole cybernetic loop of the interconnected ecosystem. The vast complexity of the ecosystem that covers more than 70% of the planet, producing over 80% of the atmospheric oxygen, is still mysterious. We are opening discussions about aqua forming and pushing the question of the human footprint on water to make it as present as the terraforming in the deep age of the Anthropocene. Anthropogenic presence is now aquaforming every part of the water habitats. It is the result of our global socio-technological system and its geopolitical, social, economic interest in water. From the shallow waters on the coastal lines to the deepest points in the oceans. 
By conducting citizen science investigation on forensic oceanography, we are looking into hidden secrets. The combination of science, art and field research is opening new doors in developing sustainable solutions. Bringing these problems and thus development closer to citizens. There are a lot of challenges, but also potentials when working with this topic and prototyping tools for water exploration. The major omnipresent invisible anthropogenic pollutants are the semi-consumed pharmaceuticals that stay overlooked and are changing not just us, but also the life in fresh and saltwater habitats all around the globe. The human body, on average, is able to digest only 20% of the drugs that we consume, while the other 80% is disposed from our body to waste systems, ending up in the world's waters. This has a malignant impact on the whole interconnected ecosystem in an escalating loop pattern. The loop is similar to the food consumption chain, which is entering a never-ending circle of multiple effects on such things as the development patterns of all living organisms. From the micro level, viruses, bacteria and other microorganisms to the largest organisms in the oceans. Aquaforensic. It's a voyage into the relationship between the microbial seas and humans who are aquaforming the water habitats all around the planet. The question is, how do the oceans feel our impact? Aquaforensic lab book and workshops. With it, we wish to help illuminate the human impact on our waters at the micro or macro level and provide a guideline to the fascinating world of aquatic flora, fauna and minerals and their plight. The Aqua Forensic project is known for its special devotion and affinity to participatory engagement through workshops. We all have the capacity to pause, listen, observe and recognize the diversity and quality of the present environment. The Aqua Forensic aims to encourage global and local audiences to familiarize themselves with the topics of water pollution and climate change, as well as actively engaging community work on these issues through citizen science-oriented workshops. Scientific environments provide the sophisticated tools needed to undertake analysis and build predictive ecological models. Citizen science, communities and their DIY approach serve to collect data, conduct local observations and provide insights into the historical patterns of change. They are thus of great importance to the project. All of the aqua forensic practices, research methods and workshops are presented in an extensive lab book, which was produced during PIF Camp, an annual art and science summer camp organized in the Julian Alps next to the beautiful Sotra River. The Aqua Forensic 2.0 lab book uses the methodological frame developed by Gino Šutić and Robertina Šebjanić with the help of Antonia Marcep from the UR Institute team. The artist and researcher Micha Godet joined their endeavors and developed his take on the aquatic forensic structures by adding on water analysis, as well as building a device that sonifies water samples according to their purity. table. We have been and will continue organizing open panel discussions which connect various locations of the Adriatic Sea.
In the panel, which is part of the Adriatic Garden project, we extensively focused on the values the project aims to stress, namely care, kindness, compassion, environmental justice, action-taking and cooperation with the Adriatic Sea and its creatures. In discussion with local experts and citizens, we have delved into the anthropo-social technological relationship with the sea, described the impact our enterprises have on waters, as well as addressed the issues we have to tackle to achieve sustainable collaboration among researchers, artists, institutions and citizens who work in the field of maritime research and conservation. Chapter 6 The COVID-19 crisis served as a stark reminder of the fragility of our lives, societies, work practices and much more. It singularly stressed the importance of supporting communities and systems, their health, condition and resilience. By being committed to the values of care, compassion, environmental justice, action-taking and cooperation with the Adriatic Sea and its creatures, we intend to grow and intensify collaboration between various research and creative institutes who work in the field of the maritime environment. One of our primary goals is to establish a collaborative network of individuals and institutions working all across the Adriatic Sea, which will be able to work more effectively by comparing research data on diverse ecosystems and facilitate their local and global conservation and management. The collaborative endeavors of artists, scientists, citizen scientists and active individuals have the potential to provide excellent support to their local communities. We hope our individual and collaborative missions will contribute to long-term systematic change on local, national and international levels. We should view these unprecedented times, when travel is limited, or at least highly unpredictable if at all possible, resulting in postponements and cancellations of collaboration projects in the field, as an opportunity to intensify and further develop alternative modes of cooperation in more sustainable ways. In the changing world, we should not forget to show our solidarity, and take on the challenge to widen the discussion, as well as our empathy and care to the waters beyond our human perception. Sano Adriatic Tales. Adriatic Garden, Aqua Forensics 2.0. Sound art and field recordings of the above and underwater wilderness of Adriatic Sea. The Adriatic Garden, a special program part devoted to the sonic wilderness of Adriatic Sea, enables the audiences also to immerse themselves into soundscapes of under and above water in the sonic wilderness of the Adriatic Sea. Sono Adriatic Tales is co-curated by Manja Ristic and Robertina Shebjanic. Sono Adriatic Tales immerses audience into the underwater world and take notice of the soundscapes of both under and above water. Audiences will be able to listen to the sounds from the islands of Kortula and Vis, Reflection of the artist on the tide, circulation of the water body, diving in submerged caves of Quarner Bay area. Some of the works that will be presented are dealing with underwater noise pollution from human sonic impact on the underwater habitat and marine life. The presence of the morphologies hidden in the palimpsest of memory of the places once heavily exploited in the name of urbanization tourism and industrial progress that marks the Adriatic Sea and its histories. The artists that we are presenting in Sono Adriatic Tales are Brane Zorman, 
with the work Sea Urchin Underwater Walk. Sasha Spachal with the work Tides. Roberto Bodanovic with the work The Mist Where Circle Begins. Ivo Vicic with the work Undersea. Leah Barkley with the work Shifting Nature, which is part of the Ocean Listening Project. Robertina Shebjanic with the work Aquatosin and Manja Ristic with the work Succubus Mnemonics. The work Succubus Mnemonics by Manja Ristic reveals invisible chambers of the microenvironments of the specific places that were once heavily exploited. Those are the places that suffered environmental devastation, such as abandoned quarries, open large-scale stone cutting sites, stone trade docking sites, which were for many centuries local for the trade, reaching as far as the American continent next to the inconceivable scale of home building the raw material of those is also engraved in numerous historical constructions such as cathedrals churches town halls and public squares all around europe and further Robertina Shebjanic, the work Aquatosin, the subaquatic quest for serenity. The audio compositions of the subaquatic soundscape encourage us to reflect upon the anthropogenic sonic impact of the underwater habitat and marine life, as well as illuminate awareness and underscore the importance of maintaining safe sound environments for animals living in the world's oceans, seas, lakes and rivers. Aquatocene, the subaquatic quest for serenity, investigates the phenomenon of underwater noise pollution created by humankind in the seas and oceans. The sound compositions are remixed between the bioacoustics of marine life, shrimps, fish, sea urchins, etc., and the aquatic acoustics and the presence of human-generated noise in the world's oceans and seas. 
this series of works is now focusing on the underwater sound situations of Adriatic Sea. Garden Paris, AI and Music, IRCA. Panel title, Frontiers of Music and Artificial Intelligence. Young protagonists at the forefront of AI and Music research debate its challenges and future directions and discuss overcoming the limits of AI. Uh, I'll leave you to it. Uh, okay. okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So... Welcome everyone, uh, welcome to the Frontiers of Music and Artificial Intelligence panel discussion. And I'm very pleased to welcome to the panel today uh, two experts in music and artificial intelligence. With me here is Philippe Essling, my colleague at uh, IRCAM, uh, who is uh, also a professor at the Sorbonne. And uh, we have invited to join us uh, in today's panel, Doreen Hermans, who is also uh, a professor, also an academic, um, but working in Singapore. So she's joining us over the internet. And uh, Doreen is teaching at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. So uh, we will begin by having uh, each of you say a bit about yourselves. Um, where, it, where is your area of focus in music and artificial intelligence, how you came to be doing this, and what motivates you? Um, uh, tell us a bit about yourselves, basically. Uh, maybe Doreen, if you could start first. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, my background is uh, actually in operations research so, and in uh, business engineering. But for my PhD, I started uh, to explore how we could use these traditional techniques from operations research for music generation. So ever since then, I've, my main focus in this domain of AI and music has been, can we create systems to automatically generate music? So I did that for my PhD at the University of Antwerp, and then I got a Marie Curie Fellowship to join Elaine, in fact, uh, at Queen Mary in London, where we worked on the Morpheus system. Morpheus was a, um, a mu is a music generation system that can create music following a particular tension profile and with the long-term structure. Uh, and after my postdoc, I moved to Singapore, where I've been uh, leading a research group on AI and music. We have a project running again, not surprisingly, on music generation. Uh, this time, we're creating music with emotion and uh, music, let's say, music with a narrative, so that can be used to match a video. 
Uh, we also do some other projects in this field. Uh, for instance, we're working on can we use deep learning techniques to learn new ways of representing music? Uh, can we process music uh, fast in, on a GPU processor? So we've created a library, for instance, to generate spectrograms on the fly using GPUs. Uh, we do automatic music transcription and some related problems. Thank you. And uh, Philippe, tell us about yourself. Yeah, uh, wow, big <laughs> question. Uh, actually, I have a more kind of a chaotic background, I'd say, because mm -hmm. uh, I did a bachelor in, in uh, mathematics and computer mm -hmm. science, and then I went on to do some uh, distributed systems algorithmics. And then I came upon the masters of IRCAM, which was mm. for me a big revelation. I mean, finally something that made sense. And uh, so I did my PhD at IRCAM, and it was uh, on uh, data mining and time series analysis uh, for musical orchestration. So the idea was to generate uh, orchestrations, so basically write uh, scores for orchestras that could sound the same as uh, input wave files. So after that, I went to do some genetics, and I worked in <laughs> metagenomics at the University of Geneva, and that was completely unrelated to, but <laughs> it was a fun time. So I did some ancient DNA and this type of stuff, very interesting as well. And then I found a position, so a professor position at Sorbonne and IRCAM, and since then I've been working uh, completely focusing on machine learning uh, applied to musical generation. So I created a small research group inside the musical representation team, which is called uh, ACIDS, which means uh, Artificial Creative Intelligence and Data Science. And so basically my main focus is actually on probabilistic models and uh, probabilistic generative models. Mm -hmm. So the goal at IRCAM, I guess, is more to try to find new tools that could uh, kind of uh, uh, propel uh, musical creation to new grounds. So the goal is not to have, you know, kind of obscure machines where you have a button and it generates lots of music. It's more how do we find new ways of creating new sounds and can it be super weird? That would be the best. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, basically I've been working lately on um, new types of models. So uh, I did some uh, research on how to generate uh, hybrids of uh, musical instruments. Uh, recently I did this thing called FlowSynth, which is a system where you can put a WAV file and it gives you the parameters of a synthesizer mm -hmm. that sounds uh, yeah. as close as possible to the WAV file. Mm -hmm. So this thing is quite fun, I guess. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the idea is more, can we use these systems to understand things that we don't? And so mm -hmm. maybe using this as a kind of a, you know, turnaround uh, to alleviate uh, complex problems and to give us simple interaction with complex musical materials. Okay. Great. Um, each of you has touched upon sort of applications of artificial intelligence in your work, and um, I think for for many people, uh, especially in, in the creative and music professions, mm -hmm. uh, a big question has always been: you know, if machines are taking over so much of the creative work, uh, are they going to replace humans anytime soon, um, or or? are they intentionally going to be uh, replacing humans even in the distant future? Yeah. Uh, what, what is your take on this? Uh, maybe um, Doreen? Uh, yeah, that's a question that w we hear often, I think. Yeah. And uh, maybe a, a rightful fear that musicians think, oh, uh, is this AI going to take over the job of composers or musicians? Uh, however, I think that the future really lies in co-creative systems. Uh, we can use AI, as, you, as Philip said, uh, we can develop new instruments, we can have augmented ways of interacting with music uh, so that actually our abilities as a composer are only leveraged and reach a new level using these new technologies. So maybe Philip has something to say about that as well. Oh yeah, I have a, because I've been discussing this question many times <laughs> in many panels and I always have a weird way of answering and I always say if you want to talk about the future you have to look at the past 
and basically, you know, photographs, they were the death of paintings. And then Photoshop mm -hmm. was the death <laughs> of photographs. And now AI is the death of Photoshop, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but does this mean that we aren't yeah. doing paintings anymore? No, mm. we are doing paintings, but we are doing completely different paintings than before. Mm -hmm. And we are still doing photographs. And we are doing photographs that are completely different from before. And for me, mm -hmm. this is the way that you can look at the future, is to see what has been happening in the past. You know, people have been afraid that trains would be leaving the people that ride horses without jobs. And mm. I mean, of course, there are some dangers, and we have to be careful about the ethics of these systems. But I guess in every technological shift, there is new grounds that are opened. And it doesn't mean that you know, it can kind of separate from the other mm -hmm. type of creative fields. So for me, it's a kind of a non-question, because it's just mm. opening up new grounds. So will AI be replacing some music? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the whole point of lots of research teams that are <laughs> working at, for instance, Spotify. I mean, I'm, not, you know, <laughs> I'm not saying, but I know they have a project about um, you know, music generation to, to really create music without artists. Mm. And I mean, yeah, I guess it's going to be bad music, but why not? It's a, a really, a really good analogy that you make, uh, and and I think in the music generation work that we do, we also try to not think of our system as an autonomous system, but really as a way to enhance the way that we interact with music. So maybe we could just have a tool that um, we just enter the chords and it'll suggest as a melody that we can then tweak ourselves. It could be something that's co-creative, really. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you said a very interesting term, which is co-creative system. And I guess we are also very much focusing on this. And I like the analogy of the musical synthesizer, for instance. Like when the synthesizer went out, it was like completely weird and nobody knew what to do with these weird sounds. Mm -hmm. And now it's kind of integrated into you know, a mm -hmm. musical uh, area. And I guess, yeah, in co-creativity, this is where you have like really something new and interesting going on when you have a partnership where actually both entities, being human or cyber entities, mm -hmm. collaborate. And this is the collaboration that is generating creativity and not mm. the entities separately from each other. Right. So, um, so with respect to some, pos so, uh, some possible directions then, uh, what do you think, given that we have this tool that is AI in front of us, before us, uh, and moving forward as uh, developments come along, where do you see AI uh, playing a role in, in uh, music creation or, or any other areas of uh, musical practice or um, any profession involve, involving music? I think, uh, uh, Philippe, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, I guess this is, uh, we're just looking at the tip of the iceberg right now mm -hmm. in what kind of practical outcomes or applications can come out of uh, this AI generation because right now I think um, the problem is that we're doing a lot of copy-paste, right? So mm, yeah. we try to mimic our behavior and right. I think this is logical. That's the mm -hmm. first thing, because we look around and what do we see as intelligent? And we look in the mirror and we think, <laughs> oh, we are the smartest things around. Let's do exactly what we're doing. But I don't think the real power of this approach lies in mimicry. Mm -hmm. I think this is an important step where we're going to you know, shift mm -hmm. out of this and realize that these models can actually do things that we can't. And mm -hmm. this is where the real uh, power, I'd say, of the AI mm -hmm. models will explore maybe new grounds. So in terms of jobs, I don't know, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but it, when you say we're enable, enable, en enabling us to do things that we haven't been able to do, mm. do, you, do you, have you experienced that? Or can you give a, a small example of what that might be? Yeah, actually, um, I mean, this is, sorry, this is a very <laughs> uh, personal, I don't want to you know, brag about my own work, but for instance, um, we did these, um, you know, instrumental hybrids, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I can add some links to videos where we show up sure. some some yeah. things. But for instance, it was one of my favorite sound was actually um, it's kind of a mixture between uh, cello, um, clarinet, and the piano. 
Ah. So you have kind of a hammer, but the, I mean, if you listen to the sound, it's like you hear the hammer of the piano, mm -hmm. and then it morphs into some bow that finish ah. with some vibratos, like mouthy vibrato. <laughs> and it's like the, the instrument itself is morphing along the sound. Okay. And it's super weird because I think it's kind of impossible to get these things even with physical modeling, or you could maybe, mm. but it would require so much work. So for me, it was some kind of, yeah. And another example, and then I let the ring, uh, <laughs> it's just a weird thing. I made this uh, synthesizer sound like an eagle. I think I would mm. never have been able, and I laughed for maybe 10 minutes in my office because <laughs> it was just this super weird eagle sound that uh, <laughs> just was projected onto an additive synthesizer. Right. So, and for me, it was yeah, something I couldn't do on my own, or it would mm -hmm. require me like weeks of work. Sure, mm. yeah. Doreen. Um, so if you're talking about uh, creative generative systems, uh, there, there recently, for instance, was the AI Song Festival, which actually showcased that a lot of uh, AI generated songs can, can sound pretty decent. Um, if you're looking at more non-generative approaches, let's say, um, we, for instance, I, I saw a movie, it was a West Side Story, it was the original movie, but they had uh, they had the instrument track removed, and they kept the singing voice. So then they had the orchestra play the 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 removed uh, orchestra track. So they used AI technologies to remove only the orchestra, keep the singing voice. Uh, so that's a very nice application of how we can use these. Um, it's not a generative system, but it's still an AI system that can do these pattern recognitions and remove, uh, do, do instrument separation from musical tracks, which, which I thought was a very cool. Sorry? That would actually create more jobs, it sounds like. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, plus, you probably have a, there was probably a company doing this uh, source separation too, so. No, I, I was thinking of the musicians who then had to be called mm. in to play with the singer. This was a the, yeah. This was a Singapore Symphony Orchestra. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I guess going into this um, this analogy about right. sorry, me. I don't no, know no. if you you. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> it just made me think about. Do you know the story of the TB three hundred three, for instance? No. Uh, mm. TB three hundred three is a synthesizer by Roland, okay. that was made to do bass lines. Mm -hmm. You know, it was supposedly a best uh, bass synthesizer and mm -hmm. it was supposed to replace bass players in musical bands so for instance you don't have any friends but you like music and you can use this thing to generate you know some fake bass but it was actually really really lame like it, <laughs> it didn't sound like a bass at all and it didn't replace anything and you know groove boxes like rhythm boxes they were supposed to remove drummers mm. and now we have an explosion of people that are actually using these things to do completely different music, and we still have drummers, but we have these boxes that were supposed to replace musicians, and it created more musicians than it replaced, I guess. Uh huh. So, That's right. So yeah. another ex example where AI is actually cr creating jobs, yeah, like because there are people needed mm. to be playing. Um, so. Um, that, that's fantastic. I mean, you, you've given many really good examples of AI enhancing creativity and se enhancing opportunities for musicians. Um, so in, in terms of where AI is today, I mean, it, there's so much that it can do. Uh, but what do you think are some of the look, uh, possible challenges that um, scientists and researchers should be or could be tackling uh, for the next decade? Right. That, so I think uh, we still really aren't hearing AI-generated music on on our radio stations. So, at least not mostly. Uh, we said that partly it's not really our objective to replace and make AI generate autonomous music. However, even if AI wanted to, I don't think we're currently there fully yet because there's. If you watch uh, Star Trek, which was recorded even in the 70s, you see that we have Data, the android, and Data is still not possible to perceive emotion, right? So even in the futuristic view that people had of the future in the past, uh, 
emotion and computers don't equate, right? So, and I think similarly, AI in music uh, doesn't really capture emotion fully yet, or doesn't know how to deal with emotion. Yet, if we listen to music, emotion is really integrated in the experience. So I think that's definitely something that could be improved. Either the human interaction uh, brings in the emotion, or the systems themselves learn to be more um, sensitive or, or emotional, effective. Uh, and I think that's a very important challenge to the future as well. Okay. Philip, what do you think of, um, of where AI could be going in wow. terms of uh, the challenges? Um, so Doreen has mentioned um, so, uh, the fact that humans, uh, emotions are an integral part of being human and AI has yet to be able to mm. capture that successfully. Yeah. yeah, I completely agree with the ring. Uh, for the big challenges, I would say maybe I have like five keywords. Okay. Uh, I'm just thinking, <laughs> so I hope I found them. Uh, so basically, uh, I would say time, ideation, um, control, simplification, and understanding. So for me, this is like oh. the five big things I can think about. Time for me is the perception of, you know, complex relationships uh, across time and at different scales, but that's more of a geeky objective. Mm -hmm. right? It's kind of my pet peeves of understanding the time. But that is also, yeah. a, that, that, that is also a human trait, Yeah, being absolutely. able to perceive these relationships across different time scales. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think most of the yeah. things I, I see as challenges is actually close mm. to what Doreen said about uh, mm. like a, a finer and emotional understanding, mm. because for me, ideation is the question of what is the limit between the imitation, because most mm -hmm. of the systems we train, we train it on a set of you know, knowledge or data, mm -hmm. and basically we are using what I call the mean machine. So we are doing expectations, <laughs> right? So we are kind of computing the mean error across mm -hmm. our thing, which means that we are smoothing out things that are outside and the outliers are usually you know, mm, kind of thrown out. thrown out because we need some nice mean error. Right. But actually ideation, creation, comes from these outliers. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem. We imitate a lot and we don't know how to ideate mm. things. And then, wow, well, sorry, I'm super wrong. <laughs> Tell me if I speak too much. <laughs> or <laughs> or um, maybe we pause for a yeah. moment at, uh, and then we want to hear the other five, uh, okay. of the five. I need you to want, remember. <laughs> do you want to say something about uh, what Philip has? Yeah, uh, I, I totally agree with the. Yeah, I totally agree with the time aspect, and I see that as um, songs will also have a structure, right? We'll have repeated themes and patterns that come back. Uh, what creates these earworms that we keep thinking of? Uh, I think that's definitely a very important challenge. This is, in fact, something that Elena and I have worked at in the past uh, in our Mor Morpheus system. And uh, we, we managed to get some structure in there, but it's still a very uh, hard problem to tackle. So we have so far, uh, we stopped at ideation, ideation, time, time ideation. ideation. Uh, was that simplification? Uh, simplification. Okay, yeah. let's hear about simplification. Uh, simplification <laughs> is one of my big questions right now, mm. but it's already, we are kind of, you know, yeah. moving towards the next question, so. You sure? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Okay, it's just, <laughs> for me, it's a very weird thing to call something intelligent when it requires, you know, the electrical power of a whole country and five <laughs> billion parameters just to say that something is a cat or something is a dog. Right, so, yes. <laughs> I mean, it's nice that we have these scores, but for me, scores should be kind of normalized by the complexity of the system. And it mm. boils down to the notion of, you know, Kolmogorov complexity. Mm -hmm. So, mm. which is how complex is the algorithm that is mm. required to generate a certain solution. Right. And I, it, maybe it's more, you know, thinking about the Occam's razor, for instance. Mm -hmm. I mean, an intelligent, clever solution, let's say, mm -hmm. should be a simple one. Mm -hmm. And for me right now, it's, it's really a pity, I guess, that the current trend in deep learning is just having better scores by having bigger things. And if you look mm. at like the big results mm. we saw, big GAN for me is completely stupid. <laughs> it's, it's really GAN 
and they called it big gun because they multiplied the number of parameters by 10 or 20. If you look at GPT, it's been like the whole GPT things has been all over the news, you know, mm. jukebox by OpenAI, for instance, or okay. these things, it's Transformers. And if you look like the latest uh, GPT-3 models from uh, OpenAI, it requires something around 5,000 days of GPUs work to train the model. And Wow. And yeah. they stated we're, we're not count, we're not even talking about data, right? This is oh, no, no, it's just computing time. Just computing time, and mm. for me, it's yeah, it's paradoxical because yeah, we're getting better results, but does this mean that we? And that was my biggest question: like, can mm. we do the same with less? Which is for me mm. very important because I guess I can only call a solution intelligent if it's something simple that I can manage to comprehend some more. So do you think that simplicity is, is a human trait as well? Being able to succinctly um, summarize wh yeah. uh, what, what are the basic, what's the gist of something and how do you get at a solution? Oh yeah, for me that would be, oh, it, and this is actually a big challenge. Can an AI you know, simplify thoughts, for instance? Mm. So can you take lots of things and you know, having the ability to abstract something that is simpler? So it can be on the size of the solution, I say size of the model, for instance, mm -hmm. but it's also, for me, if I have two models and they give me the same solution, I'm going to call Clever the smallest one, you know, mm. the most efficient. Okay. Uh, Doreen, what are your thoughts on this, uh, on the, uh, this view <laughs> of AI and the techniques? Yeah, interesting concept. Um, so in the past, I've worked a lot with uh, rule-based systems, which I think are very nice because you can, um, uh, yeah, in the case of CounterPoint, you have a, a, a set of, a very limited set of rules and you can use them and if, if you do constraint programming or something and you adhere to all of the rules, your music actually sounds pretty good. But if we move to AI, then we have this black box model that's becoming pretty big and very ununderstandable and the output seems to be okay, but is that really what we want, or is that the way to go? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Are you interested in comprehensible models? Do you think that is something that we should take, that, that we should put importance on? Does that seem to fall under the idea of simplicity? Yeah, I, I think it, it's obviously related, and yeah, I guess it's easier to understand something that is small. But uh, I don't think interpretability or understandability of the models will come in the same way that we are used to. Because we are used to, you know, have labels over each and every variable that we use in an mm. equation. I'm pretty sure this is kind of out of the picture for what we are doing right now. But comprehending some more, let's say, um, orthogonal properties. So for mm -hmm. instance, I don't know if you've seen like the information theory uh, ID, which was a, a very nice paper that mm -hmm. kind of uh, tries to understand the behavior of the model, but really by looking at the properties of what's going on between the mutual information of before and after the transform, which is mm -hmm. how the two things relate. Even though the middle object is complex, you're trying to understand the relationship that exists. So yeah, I guess, for me, it might be easier to understand uh, simpler models, but I'm pretty sure that we're going to need to develop even a model to understand the model. <laughs> so. Which which is something that is done, right? Um, but uh, I, th I think there's some merit to the idea if we do... I mean, in the past, people have generated good-sounding music using Markov models, which are fairly simple. If you combine Markov models in a correct way with long and short-term memory, you can get some, some good resolve that, results that have this time dimension or this time aspect more into account as well. The challenge will be if you use simpler models and you probably will need to make them hybrid and guide them with some rules, which is, I think, a valid approach. And I think the hope of making the AI models super complex is that you can just you know, let them do their thing and you don't need to guide them at all. Okay. Well, I, I think we have touched on uh, the first sort of uh, 
question moving on from what are the remaining challenges of mm. AI, and that is how to do the same with less. So uh, I'm debating whether or not to ask you for the remaining, uh, the last two items <laughs> on your five. Well, there are two more. Yeah. Um, and, and then uh, maybe, uh, uh, and then we can move on to, to other questions about some um, what, what are some of the big challenges uh, or what you might perceive as some of the big challenges for the field. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> we, we just did simplicity. We're going to spend yes. the whole debate. No, maybe we can, we can skip the two we remaining, skip the two remaining <laughs> yeah, ones. Because <laughs> I'm not sure what, I think there was some control and other stuff. Okay, but, well, yeah. you know, I, I think that, that sort of leads us to the next question, which is, um, how do we control and interact with unknown models and dimensions? Uh, now, now, Philip, you, you gave me this question, right? <laughs> so I'm going Sorry. to ask you to explain that. <laughs> okay. What, what do you mean? Okay, that's a unknown very models. weird one. And I think it, it goes to the probabilistic aspect of yeah. what I'm doing, because I'm working a lot with you know, latent spaces. And mm -hmm. my idea is to have these models where you can actually control the generation, but it's kind of also um, Secondary goal is also to try to understand what are the principal dimensions of variations inside mm -hmm. what you're giving the model, right? And uh, I'm saying that, and my sorry, even asking the question is going to take some time. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I ask weird questions. But let's take some examples. You know, when we developed, let's say, the violin, mm -hmm. we needed a new way to interact with the chords. Mm -hmm. So we had the chords, it vibrated, and we created some other instruments to try to control this new thing. Mm -hmm. And so basically my question is, in two, there is two aspects to this question. The first mm -hmm. question is, should we uh, develop some specific ways of controlling these models? Mm -hmm. I'm saying that because we've been working with composers, you know, with probabilistic models, and we had like this very nice um, low-dimensional uh, spaces where you could just move across the space mm. and uh, you know generate stuff. And when the dimensions were not understandable, the mm -hmm. composer was not happy, and it was ah, too complex. Yes, like, yeah. what is going on in this mm -hmm. dimension? I, I don't understand it. And when the dimension was too simple. It was like, yeah, this is fundamental frequency. Mm. I understand it. It's not, an, it's not interesting. <laughs> so we lie in this weird, you know, space, paradoxical mm. space, where we want things that we don't know, mm -hmm. but yet when it's too, it's too unknown it's, for yes, us, right. we can't really, you know, kind of apprehend and control this thing. Well, but that's the same for many create, uh, creative uh, endeavors. Right. It needs to be new enough that it is novel, but at the same time not so new that people can't get it. Yeah, exactly. Right. So <laughs> exactly. Uh, so I guess the first part of this question is more, should we develop some you know, more instrumental gesture of AI, yeah. for instance? Hmm, interesting. Instrumental gesture. So to control AI systems, to control perhaps if the AI system is generating sounds, to control yeah. the sound? Yeah, exactly. So, okay. Because we have new models with new possibilities and right. new complexities, but we're still using knobs or right. mouse. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you want to use gest gestures to sample from your latent space, where you control your latent variables or something? That would be interesting. Yeah, maybe. Mm. I don't know. It's a very yeah. open question. It's just. And mm. this is actually observations that we made like in the past month, working with a, a great composer called uh, Alexander Schubert. Mm -hmm. And he's been working with these latent spaces, and mm -hmm. it's always a back and forth, you know, he's, he's having fun, and at the same time mm -hmm. he's like, ah, yeah. I want something that is more understandable, and then, <laughs> but at the same time he wants something. So it's very cool to see, you know, the yeah. interaction. Yeah. And it asks a lot of questions, because I don't think we have, like, developed uh, specific uh, AI specific control mechanisms that's more kind of the do you, do you think that in in the creative space a composer working with these kinds of systems well you want to know what you're doing because you want to be in control mm. you you want to know uh, to have agency in mm. shaping what the results are um, do you think that that is equally uh, important in other areas of applications of AI, for example, 
uh, other areas where uh, AI systems are employed, do you think that uh, the ability to to control these uh, this parameter space and interact with the systems would also be important, or is is this something that you know music in and AI could sort of uh, influence uh, mm. the field of AI? And uh, is that um, I'm just wondering is, um, if that is something interesting for other domains. So we've uh, um, we just published a paper for the coming Izmir, which is on uh, we call it music fader net because um, this is a, a, a yeah a, 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 this is a. A variational autoencoder, so again, you, you can tweak the, the latent variables, and we, we like to think of them as faders. Um, uh, and uh, by, by doing so, you can control the note density, uh, the, the amount of staccato, uh, and some other features of the generated. Uh, I'm sorry, Doreen, did you, did you publish it this year's uh, Izmir? The coming Izmir. Yeah, we did the exact same paper. Like, yeah. I, and it's, it's based on feather networks, and this is it's yeah. crazy. I have to yeah. send it to you. We, we send, yeah. It's the exact same thing. <laughs> I love well, it. Great minds think yeah. alike. I love it. But please go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, great, great. <laughs> so yeah, I think yeah, and and to to go back on on what you said as well. It's so the initial impulse is always to try to disentangle your features. So you try to find these latent variables that control one aspect, let's say fundamental frequency or whatever. But you might indeed, this is an interesting idea that Philip mentioned, maybe, maybe there could be latent variables that are compound and that control the music in a, in a way that we wouldn't expect, but that could actually be useful or unexpected, in an unexpected manner. Yeah, actually, it's uh, I mean it's crazy that we did the exact same paper, but in in our case, you know, uh, to solve this idea of having understandable dimensions and non-understandable dimensions, we actually regularize the space so that we remove the influence of given attributes like net density. We have like an amount of arpeggiation. I don't remember a lot. You know, we compute uh, symbolic features from the scores, and then we ask the model to remove them from the latent dimensions, and we reintroduce them in the decoding mechanism. So basically, it's kind of, um, we acknowledge the fact that there are some things we want to understand, and there are the, like this big ball of mess that we still want to have, but we are not sure what's going on. And I think yeah, it's a very cool direction where we kind of separate and we say, OK, this we understand. But then we are left with even more mess. You know? <laughs> like, okay, we removed everything we understand, and now we still have these things that moves. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, understanding this one, I think it's going to be a big, uh, mm. a big mess. I love it. <laughs> so, um, do you, uh, in, in maybe it's time to introduce the next question then at this point, uh, which is. Um, with these AI models, do you think um, we are uh, we are limited uh, with, by uh, what we do with the AI models by our own perceptual limits, um, and therefore, uh, well, and, and again, Philip, I have to ask you a question about your question. So, so it's a question about. Um, whether you know uh, the way we're using AI is actually implicitly non-creative, mm. uh, have we just eliminated creativity or, or caused death of creativity <laughs> by using AI systems? <laughs> and uh, that's a very provocative question. Yeah. Um, so maybe if you could like um, explain a bit <laughs> what, what, what that, yeah. where, where that question came from. Yeah, sorry. It's again, <laughs> again a very weird question. Yes. I know. It's just. Uh, I've been. I think it it relates to everything we've been saying uh, so far, right? First thing is we give, for instance, a set of Bach chorales, mm -hmm. and then we compute the mean error. So mm -hmm. we are smoothing out the outliers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. The problem is we're creating systems that we call creative systems, yes. but at the same time, when this thing goes outside mm -hmm. of the limit of what we expect, then we kind of unhappy, 
you know mm. it's like what no, it's not sounding it should be like Bach I want this thing to be like Bach and uh. then somehow I think it's kind of limiting right if your mm-hmm. thing really goes on to you know completely complex and non-understandable dimension this is kind of creative you know mm-hmm. and so I'm wondering how much we impose and limit this system which they don't have our you know genetic jail I, I like mm. I call them jails but it's a very weird concept you know it's just that we are bound by our own body and by our mm-hmm. own society so we have implicit biases mm-hmm. in what we do and I'm wondering how much do we transfer these biases mm. to something which has actually no constraints somehow you ask it to compute randomness it's almost close to doing some real randomness we are completely mm-hmm. unable to do randomness right. you see? So I'm wondering, this is just a very open and weird question on how much can we be creative with systems that we impose our own biases to and mm-hmm. given some sets of data where we kind of delimit what is the creativity, where creativity is going outside of these limits. Mm-hmm. Is this yes. more clear? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, crea- so what you're saying is creativity is about breaking the rules yeah. of bucking the trend mm. and, and the systems are designed not to do that. In fact, they're trying to find the most common principles. Yeah, exactly. So, Doreen. (laughs) This is a a very relevant problem, this implicit bias, right? Even in in non-music systems, we see that uh, this AI model trained on Amazon job applications was most likely to hire the white male just because in the data set, historically, those positions were given to white males. Uh, and same in music, maybe. Um, what AI really does is it looks at existing data, finds the patterns, and then generates something in the same probabilistic distribution as those patterns it found. And you might almost argue that the system would be more creative if the model isn't very good and it breaks uh, that probability distribution of the original data. Um, yeah. It, it, how do we, what is, I mean, it, it's a, a whole subdomain, right? Musical creativity, uh, what makes the system creative? Maybe it's actually the programmer of the model that's creative. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I think uh, this is, again, why we, we shouldn't necessarily be expecting the, the AI systems independently to be creative, because they're just replicating things that they've seen. Sure enough, they actually, they're actually AI systems, so they can actually process a larger data set than we're ever going to be able to listen to. Uh, but they will still be replicating from that data set. And uh, I think there's a, there was a paper by Pache from, I think, maybe a decade ago that also talks about the fact that if, you, if you're generating with Markov models that are quite short, for instance, in the end, the generative model is just going to be replicating the data set and you're going to run into plagiarism problems. So that again makes clear that these systems aren't really creative. So how do we introduce the creativity? And, and again, I think the best way to do that is by having someone interact with it. Mm. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And it's interesting because it, it kind of shines well with a a theory from a friend, I don't know if you know, Philippe Codonier, mm-hmm. and uh, I mean, he had, he, it's not a <laughs> published thing, it's actually a discussion we had, and he has this theory, and I think it's very interesting. Like if you look at the, the ways uh, new musical genres were defined mm-hmm. over the past century, it was usually given some social context, mm-hmm. and the fact that little uh, pockets of people were actually secluded for a long time because they started doing things and these things were bad, <laughs> like really, really bad. But then they stood to their bad things and they stood together. And after a while when the, you know, their style kind of evolved in this remote place, uh, mm-hmm. secluded place, then when it was mature enough, it started you know, blooming and exploding over the world. So for instance, psychedelic rock and punk and also techno music. You can see that is uh, you know, a group of secluded uh, information that kind of reinforced itself for a long time mm. before going onto the world, right? 
And what they're saying is now at this era of ultra information and ultra you know smoothness of information, whenever something new pops up, it's immediately taken over and you know remixed mm. and reinforced and mm. it's just blurring out into the gray. I see. And I think it's it's an interesting point of view. It's like, interesting. So so that's actually saying that you need. Uh, uh, there needs to be kind of a signature, a definitiveness about a particular new trend or mm. new idea. Uh, and in, in this case, it came about because people were isolated and there was time. Mm. There was a period of latency yeah. where it could strengthen exactly. and be grounded before it could then take on the rest of the world and still hold mm. its ground yeah. against all the other ideas out there. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. I think it's kind of, you can see the same thing yeah. in scientific research. I mean, sure. yeah. deep learning itself was something that was on the yeah. fringe for like 10 years, and you know, some weird people continued to say, oh, this is going to work. <laughs> and they kind of stood by this thing. And yeah, it works. And somehow now, you know, when something new pops up, like transformers, then it's regular transformers, and regular batch norm transformers, and regular batch norm transformers, regular <laughs> blah, blah, blah. So it's kind of, I think. Yeah, it's normal. We like to mix things together, and that's mm. how we create new stuff. But but you're saying mm. it's not just about the mixing. It's, it still has to have an identity. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think so. Okay. Mm. Um, and let's see. In the last five minutes, I'm going to ask each of you if you have sort of parting thoughts. Um, and uh, or, or maybe you have more, more things you want to say about what what has transpired here. Mm -hmm. um, so, Doreen, would you would you like to? Um, um, wh what would you like to share with the people who will be watching this panel uh, as some uh, parting ideas? Right. Um, I think actually music and AI is becoming a really exciting research field. I have always found it exciting, but you can tell that more and more people are interested in it and that we have sort of the resources to bring things a step further than we used to. And I think a lot of very cool applications are going to be built in the, the years to come. And through mobile devices and cloud computing, all of these things are going to come closer to every one of us, like we all having our Spotify apps and Shazam on our phone. And I'm quite excited to see uh, what the next years will bring in terms of creative systems. And Philip, what about you? Well, <laughs> big uh, philosophical things. Yes, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> we, uh, we, we, don't, we don't aim low. <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, first I'd like to, to thank you both for this very yeah. interesting uh, conversation. And uh, I mean, we can continue on for hours. But uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I would just like to address this kind of, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how to, to say it, but there are some fears about AI. Mm. Uh, this uh, replace, uh, will it replace humans and right. this type of stuff? And there are some, you know, I think it all boils down to education. And mm -hmm. everything boils down to education all the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I think if people would just take some time to understand what's going on inside and just if we can push forward the, the education of AI, you know, mm -hmm. even to younger generations, and I'm pretty sure, you know, intelligence vanish with explanation. This is something I say a lot. If you see something which seems to be complex and, you know, yeah. doing something crazy, and then you look at the inner workings of the system mm -hmm. and you understand, mm, this yeah. is not that intelligent. That's right. In the end. <laughs> so I'm, I'm pretty sure most of these, you know, doubts and fears about AI can just vanish with explanation. Mm -hmm. And regarding the creative aspects of AI, I completely agree with Dorian. There is like so many cool and interesting stuff going on all over the world, and you can see mm -hmm. the trends of like lots of big companies are now opening, you know, labs that are devoted to creation. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's magnificent because it's in creation and arts that lies the evolution of humanity. So. Oh, that was a little bit too much. <laughs> but seriously, I mean, we've been always, you know, kind of pushing the limits through kind of dreaming in, in the arts. And I think yes. it's super important that we continue to fund and uh, support the artistic endeavors. Mm -hmm. 
So for Absolutely. me, this yeah. is uh, like primordial uh, aspect, and I'm very glad I'm part of it. Wonderful. Well, that, that was quite a discussion, both of you. Um, we, we traversed a lot of ideas and a lot of groundbreaking ideas and a lot of ideas that haven't been tried and mm. come to fruition yet. <laughs> um, well, I, I uh, hope that this um, has been as inspiring for all the viewers as it has been for me. And um, I want to thank both of you very much for your time and for sharing uh, your expertise and also experiences working with AI systems in music. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Elaine. Today we increasingly encounter robots and AI systems in our lives. Think of manufacturing robots in industry, social robots in nursing homes, algorithms that doctors use to make decisions with voice assistants in our homes. But what does it actually take for us people to trust all these clever machines? How do we want them to communicate to us? Do we actually want to listen to the words of a robot or do we prefer to stay in command? ourselves. These are fundamental questions for our research at the LRT Robopsychology Lab and these are also the questions that we want to tackle with our project Robots Talking to Me at the Ars Electronica Festival 2020. So what to expect? The first um, VR game is called Cobot Studio. Cobot, the term Cobot comes from collaborative robot and this um, VR game is all about the creation of mutual understanding in human robot teams. The preparations are running at full speed. Um, here at the Robo Psychology Lab, test users are currently meant to identify last bugs in the game. Um, what are we going to do in COVID Studio VR? Um, we are using VR headsets um, to beam the player in the production halls of our fictitious company Rubber Duck Inc. It is a self-declared producer of the most excellent rubber ducks in the world. And I, I'm not gonna deny that we had some fun making this up. Um, by using hand tracking or a controller, in there you can sort and pack and paint rubber ducks together with an industrial robot as your partner. Sometimes you're gonna control the robot and sometimes you must try to read the robot's nonverbal signals in order to guess, to correctly guess what its intentions are and react accordingly to them. There's one part, for example, in the game where your aim is to guess as quickly as possible which target location the robot is moving to. And by the way, the mobile robot you, you're seeing here, um, its name is Chimera, will also be physically present in our robots talking to me area at the festival. And I hope Chimera will be in a good enough mood to give our festival guests a nice and warm welcome. Um, Seron 13 is about saving the creatures of an untouched island world by means of a serum which um, you as a player first must produce in a virtual biotech laboratory. You're gonna have tricky puzzles to solve for this, some of them pretty stressful. Yes. But you'll have an AI assistant on hand to provide support in, um, in these puzzles. Um, this AI assistant will talk to you and give you advice, for example, on how to decode X-rays. But one question remains, and this is the question that is central to this game. When to trust the AI, when to better decide for yourself to produce as much of the saving serum 13 as possible. 
Our wood panels are going to be mobile display boards made of wood, very haptic, which invite you to vote on fundamental questions about the use of robotics and AI in our society. For example, should robots simulate emotions? Do we want them to pretend to have feelings, even though it's always just a simulation? Visitors can give a pro or a con vote via a web interface that you can use on your smartphone. And in the lower part of the vote panels, um, and this is the, the very cool um, part about this project, I think, a vote counter and a mood meter will display the voting results in real time reflecting the festival people's approval or rejection of the electoral question that was asked to them. Come by, put on a VR headset, raise your democratic voice for a bright future of technology. We are looking forward to seeing you at Robots Talking to Me at the LIT Open Innovation Center here at the JKU campus. And now we are hopefully done. I mean, who has time for a video interview right now? We really could use some superpowers to get everything ready for this festival.
This year's workshop AI music program was organized in the form of an online hackathon with six groups having different challenges. Here the hackers are presenting their results. To facilitate audio production, we have invited our partner institutions to give a hands-on workshop on artificial intelligence and music to all the contestants. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Annelies Termeer. I'm the creative director of the Vigoro Media Lab, and I'm moderating the next hour where we'll present the, res the results of the AI X Music Hackathon, the very first. Um, so welcome to everyone watching wherever you are around the world. We have all 33 participants of the hackathon in the Zoom call right now, and they'll present the re results of their work over the past week. Um, so the, the last year, uh, Arts Electronica organized the AI X Music Festival for the first time. That was in a physical location, a beautiful physical location in the St. Florian Monastery. But uh, since everything is different this year, also uh, the AI Times Music Festival is taking place online. And um, they were hosting the very first AI Times Music Hackathon to explore the creative potential of using AI in the music uh, arena. Um, and again, this time it was also made possible in a collaboration with the European Commission as part of the STARTS initiative. And in the coming hour, we have the participants presenting the work um, that, they, uh, that they worked on remotely over the past, uh, the past week. So each team will have about um, seven to eight minutes to present uh, the result of uh, or their prototype or their concept and talk about it. Um, if you uh, have any questions to the teams or to me or to whoever is talking, you can share them on Twitter with the, uh, with the hashtag AIXmusic20. So AIXmusic20. And I will check Twitter uh, during uh, the presentations and uh, share the questions with the team members um, if you have them. And good to know that this stream will also be shared after. Uh, it's not only a live stream, but it will be shared on the YouTube channel of Ars Electronica. So if you can always rewatch it and all the links and references will be there as well. Um, so I think we can start with the first team. Um, the first team is actually team 2A. Um, and their project is called uh, AI X Music X Human. And uh, I think we will start first with their watching their end result video, just to, to uh, I'll draw you all in. So I think uh, Mauricio can start the video now.
Life as we know it has been upended by the pandemic. We're forced to separate physically and our primary means of communication is through technology and screens. We only have this limited range of expression and information when we're behind this frame. You know, we can't experience touch or the experience of being with each other like their body stature or scent or things like pheromones or intuition, just, you know, that energy you have when you're around someone. But instead of feeling separated by this, our group asked, how can we use this medium, this new way of digitally interacting with each other, not to feel so separated, but to actually understand each other better? We considered what could add more depth to our communication and thought about this idea of sharing emotion and how that's done through music and art, how sometimes you can make music and have this way of sharing an expression or emotion with people that you couldn't do in any other way. In addition to seeing each other's faces on the screen, we wondered how we can express feelings through image or sound over this digital medium and use these um, technological tools as part of the Process. We explored of interactions when humans and machine learning models are together in the musical loop. And we were questioning when we explore new ways of interacting and using our digital tools, what will we learn about ourselves and each other? This project is the experiment and expression of this inquiry. I'm Amy Carl, and I'm an artist in San Francisco. Pierre will share next with you more about the technical aspect of the project. Pierre, we're not able to hear you. Hello. Um, so thank you for that. Um, basically, um, we, we thought, okay, what technology are we able to use to um, basically express um, our emotion and, and how could we uh, get people's emotions? So we decided to go for a um, uh, emotion analysis and then this emotion analysis uh, runs on the web browser and then you um, we decided that instead of doing everything on the browser would send it to uh, two different softwares uh, offline to trigger the visuals and trigger the sounds to to create a richer experience for the user so we have uh, a sentiment analysis which is you can see right now uh, I'm fairly neutral and then on the right if I smile, uh, you uh, you have basically uh, I'm smiling, and you can see on the right that it's smiling. And if I'm angry, um, then this is my my angry state. So if I if I show you the technical the the stack here, emotion states: angry, happy, and uh, disgust as well, which I won't be able to do. But the emotion state is number two. That would be this, and so this is the visual part, and then we've made um, we've made uh, a another part which sends OSC signals to Max MSP, and Max MSP processes those emotions. Um, and so um, to go back to uh, this uh, this kind of hackathon spirit, we also thought of, of doing like web RTC, doing everything on the web. Uh, but we, we decided in the end to go for this solution. And now Ying is gonna is gonna present the uh, emotion uh, tracking to you. Ying, we can't hear you. Obviously, in the spirit of the uh, the hackathon, um, what you see here is an evolution of uh, what we've done uh, as we've been working on it uh, this morning. And the video is not as up to date as this content uh, is um, right now. Ying, we still can't hear you. Uh, okay, I'm here. Uh, so I will introduce this part. Um, 
It's a web application. It's another part of our app um, project. So we want to um, set up an application for users to experience, uh, let users to explore the relationship between color, emotion, and music. So it's a interactive um, website. Let me show you. So now you can see my face on the screen. I just visualize it. And uh, it can recognize my emotion. And I use the emotion data to control uh, the color. The sound is produced by my musician, our musician. I think um, I can pass to. Yeah, I mean. Okay, you can hear me. Sorry, <laughs> the interface was good. Uh, so um, I'm Sergio. I'm the. I was the musician of the group. I designed uh, the sound with the feedback of my. Uh, group mates. I designed uh, all the sound experience of the of our project. So mainly it was, I mean, as the project uh, evolved and uh, taking in consideration that we were focused on the concept and that's what we wanted, our message. Uh, we start, we ended up with a uh, kind of like automated uh, mixing uh, project that I did in, in Max for it, which is connected as Pierre, my colleague said at the very beginning with OSC. So it reacts to the, it's changing the different, the mixing the, the music. I can change to it so you can hear a bit. It's gonna be fast. Yeah, I'm taking out the video and going back to my mic. 
so yeah, that was it. It's like it was at the end a mix of the different expressions that uh, the of the users that we're using our uh, we're interacting with our project. So yeah, on that uh, I will pass uh, to Suyas, who is the last member to present in our project, and he was in charge of the all this connection. Hi, everyone. My name is Suyash. I want to show a little bit more behind the scene of the web version that we were trying to implement. So as you saw the artistic implementation, this is just bare face tracking. And you can see it's pretty decent. I also wanted to see if, you know, these days we all wear masks and can we crack emotion behind the mask because the algorithm looks at all features of the face. And as you can see, it kind of works just even if I show surprise using my eyes or if I show happiness, but it's not perfect. It needs more training with the data set with masks and here uh, below that, you also see uh, the audio visualizer uh, that we wanted to uh, showcase uh, how we're receiving voice input, or I can sing and it will work. So just some more exploration. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Team 2A. That looked incredible for a week's work. Um, I think we're already <laughs> running out of time, but I thought um, it was interesting. Uh, uh, Jing, you shared the link, and uh, did I understand that people can try it, try your part out themselves? Is it online? Yeah, it's already online. Perfect. So people can go and try that out. Then we'll move on to Team 2B, um, and they're, they're called Exploring Memories. And I think Damien will uh, kick off from this team. Yes, thank you very much. Just wait a second for the slides. Here they are. Yes, so thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Um, we are Rohit M.A., Eric Talhammer, and Adrien Bitton, and me, Damon T. Jewis. And um, we did the project Exploring Memories uh, for the AI X Music Hackathon here at Ars Electronica. So let's go to the next slide. Yes, so in the past uh, few days, we were exploring the possibilities of human interaction and machine learning in the context of uh, music, art, and artificial creativity uh, under the topic of designing user in interactions when humans and machine learning models are together, hacking the AI mind, it's now a variation of how to code in the virtual um, spatial environment. So as a proof of concept, you know, a system which acts like a spatial sequencer, and which the player can move uh, through a 3D space, placing objects in it, uh, which then are sampling MIDI sequences uh, in the lab and space uh, of the music VAE model. Um, the resultant sequences are then spatialized as uh, yeah, musical audio loops uh, into this environment. So let's talk about the music VAE model. So uh, for the note sequence generation, we use a pre-trained music VAE model, a variational autoencoder provided by Google Magenta. The model is trained on two bar MIDI sequences, so it's trained on symbolic data. Uh, to obtain the latent space, we encode a data set of two bar loops. Uh, the latent space itself is uh, 256 dimensional, 
And to reduce it down to three, we use uh, principal component analysis, and uh, we scatter the space in a three-dimensional space. So uh, let's now look at the overview of the entire system. So basically for uh, user interaction, we have uh, used a virtual environment where a user can uh, navigate into, a, it's decorated with a point cloud and mainly the user navigates and can place objects. And based on the coordinates of the object, we will sample melodies from the music VAE Latin space. And in order to give the user a feedback about some style properties of the generated uh, melodies, loops, um, we will send back a color for, for example, coloring the object. And as we show on the right side on the Latin space, basically the color gradient has been computed in order to give an idea about the node density of the melodies that are generated when sampling the space. So for example, when the object is placed red, it will correspond to having a, a melody with a lot of notes. And when it's blue, it will be more quiet melody. And so by moving in the space and placing object, the user gets feedback about what sound, what melodies the model has learned to produce. So that's the first um, interaction. And then these two modules will interact with uh, Maxim SP patch that is doing the audio rendering based on two things, based on the melodies generated by uh, the music VA models and based on the current user uh, coordinate, the position, and the relative position of the object it has placed for doing audio rendering and audio spatialization. So now um, let's talk about the implementation of the virtual re reality environment. Yeah, the explorable 3D space was implemented with Unity and the setup is actually quite simple. So we have a player camera um, that can freely fly, fly around in this space that we defined. And with a keystroke, you can spawn so-called sound probe objects which will then be used as the coordinate points that go to the model. Um, the whole thing is wired with OSC, which actually at the moment is not, um, because we had a problem there. So this morning we mocked the um, audio within Unity, so also the specialization, and the audio samples come now from the Unity script for the demo you're going to see in a moment. And as already mentioned, the virtual environment around it um, consists of a point cloud. Um, and there is one problem here. The latent let, let space we have is roughly cubic, but point cloud scans hardly ever are. So as you see in the right side of the slide, um, the visuals only cover a certain amount of the space. And it's actually quite unintuitive for the player to also explore samples further up or down. So we're now going to see a short demo video.
So what we have seen in this uh, short video were the basic implementations of the interaction and the uh, modules we were using. There's still um, some um, developing missing, so this is still a uh, work in progress. Um, but I guess it gives uh, gave, it gave some kind of clear idea um, what the system will be capable in the future. Um, but of course, in order to uh, make some kind of meaningful artwork with it, or you know, some kind of installation or performative. Um, um, yeah, presentation. One would need to, um, of course, merge the sounds with the 3D environment, develop an own 3D environment, um, and uh, training uh, the, the, the music VAE model uh, in order to, to get some kind of um, connecting system and, uh, yeah, like linked uh, environment here. So by doing this, um, this tool uh, would be, um, yes, um, or like the perspective using this tool is uh, creating, uh, for example, installation soundscapes um, where the player can, in, in VR, possibly um, exploring the space and creates like its own soundscape by doing so. Or it could also, um, be some kind or in an abstract way, some kind of uh, generative uh, composing tool for uh, virtual reality. So there are quite some possibilities in which direction uh, the system can go. And um, yeah, to achieve this, um, there's also um, improving uh, the interaction. Yeah, move this is basically what we thought of it, that it would also be good if you could move or remove those objects that you're placing. So you could move them around and, and try out different sounds that would be generated and thereby create your own kind of soundscape. And also with scaling and the size of the objects, there could be a lot of um, optimization being done. And another idea we had in mind that um, not just the MIDI would be generated, but also how the MIDI is synthesized would come from a Gansen based on the position within the 3D space. And yeah, that's basically it from our side. Thank you so much. That looks really awesome. And do you guys have any plans of, of uh, going on with this project to develop it into an actual physical installation? <laughs> have you talked about it yet or have you just, just been busy? Yeah. Yes, so at least we were planning like uh, continuing the development of it. So uh, yeah, we'll become a system where we can, yeah, for instance, create a soundscape installation with it. So awesome. That's what we planned. <laughs> Maybe next year at a physical uh, Ars Electronica. <laughs> Let's hope for yeah, it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Okay, we need to rush on with the next team because I think we're already behind time, but um, there, I think there's a, a few teams that have a bit shorter presentations. Um, now we're on to team one, uh, developing lightweight AI uh, and Cyrus will kick off. Hello, uh, we are group one. We spent the last few days discussing philosophical and technical issues surrounding um, the current state of deep lightweight AI, in particular for audio generation. I'll pass over to Stefano. Thanks, Cyrus. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, just to clarify that uh, what I'm presenting now it was not implemented uh, during the last four days, but it was is rather my personal approach to using AI for music generation, which I contributed to this group in the context of our theoretical discussions and framework. Okay, so deep learning applications to music generation, it's not a secret, require vast amounts of data. And I argue that this encourages blind and non-critical usage of uh, available data sets, perhaps to the detriment of the musical results, most uh, sometimes. Um, next uh, slide, Cyrus, thank you. So often, regrettably, we just grab data sets without really inquiring about their intrinsic quality. For example, a common strategy to increase the data size is to include MIDI encoded performances, 
which has proven to be an error-prone method. Here you can see an example showing this issue, and it's taken from a um, known data set. You get the gist, and it's, you know, the time, the, the meter is different, the key signature is different, all the inflections are different, and so forth. Uh, okay, Cyrus next. Despite the need uh, for large amounts of data and the danger of over, um, incurring overfitting um, when not using this, uh, it is possible to work with small, high-quality and homogeneous corpora. So we personally edited and curated a bespoke corpus of only 475 multi-track symbolic pieces. Next. And uh, we framed the task accordingly. So we framed the task of modeling this corpus using a neural machine translation approach. So generate a target sentence given a source sentence. Therefore, we prepared a data set of source target musical sentences by making all combinations of pairs of tracks in the corpus. Next. We use the transformer uh, architecture and retune the parameters. Uh, these parameters included um, the number of attention heads, the epochs, etc. Each model was trained for a set number of epochs with ranges determined by observing the overfitting behavior of the base model. This formed 180 parameter sets, which uh, we, we trained simultaneously over 24 hours. We then selected four models uh, that were favored by common translation metrics. And um, as we can see, um, smaller networks were favored, they're doing pretty well. For the, um, in the interest of time, I include the, 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 if you want to listen to some examples, please visit that um, link on this slide. Uh, so smaller networks brings us to the next um, topic of this presentation. I pass the bat to Cyrus. Thank you. So um, one particularly interesting application of lightweight deep neural networks is neural audio generation. So um, neural synthesis uh, depends on neural networks that analyze audio to produce a representation of it that we can use to have control over the timbre of sound in the process of synthesis. But the current state of AI has largely depend on, depended on colossal models with millions, billions of parameters, which require heavy amounts of training, which is significantly detrimental to the environment. And generally, the hands of the future of um, creativity is in the hands of big tech data technology corporations, which are kind of defining how we interact with AI. This isn't being developed from the perspective of um, musicians who only have uh, bespoke hardware, perhaps embedded hardware or just their computers. We don't have heavy GPUs on which we can perform inference with neural networks. So we need to develop neural networks that can generate audio in real time and um, fit the memory constraints of embedded hardware. And it seems that we're still quite far off from seeing um, neural nets in a, a Eurorack module. That would be pretty fun. And um, one thing we've seen over this hackathon from presented by Professor Eslang, which is a pretty interesting development in lightweight AI is the lottery ticket hypothesis. Now this depends on finding um, smaller subnetworks of a very large network and compressing this very large network to achieve a smaller network that um, provides the same performance as the larger network. So these models um, can fit on embedded devices such as um, a Raspberry Pi. But um, questions that remain open are, how do we select the information to keep, which is um, aesthetically and perceptually uh, important? Um, and the potential for these models is that we can start using smaller, more bespoke data sets to um, transfer these models to. But um, these models still require lots and lots of training, um, even days perhaps, to find a solution. Uh, one application of using lots of networks is perhaps being able to instantiate many at once on your own computer within the memory constraints. 
and having these networks represent different timbres. And we could perhaps scatter an audio sample across these different networks and create um, clouds of new interesting timbres that we've never heard before. Um, I'm going to pass over to Robert now. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Cyrus. Give me a second. Mm. Uh, we try and we to experimentize with some hypothesis. As you mentioned, the problem is with with uh, with lottery ticket hypothesis is that you finally need to train first this big network. So I asked myself during hackathon what we can really do uh, if you don't have time and if you don't have GPU. So here is one radical idea, not so universal, like lottery ticket, that you are not dealing with any large database, but you are starting with some equations. And then you are proceed this equation by a very simple neural network like LSTM or recurrent. And you can make predictions. So you are collecting some parameters you like from your patch uh, in maximum SP pure data or something. And then these meta parameters are, are computed and processed by, the, by a neural network. So here, Here's example that you can deal with really also in this method with very complex objects uh, defined by differential equations, and it works. Uh, so this is very simple, but 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 useful method. I'm focused on machine learning, but like meta learning. So I'm not interested if any network is is trained in part. In part, part uh, in one task, I'm I'm looking for something more general. So here's Robert, the final... Sorry, can I just interrupt? I think we're running out of time. How much time? Which time do you need? Like two minutes. I'm just okay. Okay, please. Um, yeah, because otherwise people won't be able to present. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I developed the concept of meta composer and actually you are starting deal with with network with smaller networks which i called mod modules and here's like group of rules for composing these small networks so for example you have the task one of this and a neural network train checking you the best uh, or optimal uh, small network which you can combine and then you will receive like uh, answer to your task yeah so this is my idea some results also are from uh you can check out i recorded that put at the night some some recording on on Git uh, on on Bandcamp. People will be able to listen to it here. Okay, Perfect. that's 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 only like small disturption by sound but anyway i'm working with like masses of, of sounds events like millions of sound events but i don't need to have like gpu for this thanks so much sorry to rush you I, there's so many interesting things coming out of this hackathon we'll rush on to team 3a uh laura and antonio um their their project is called uh, soundscape dash ai <laughs> And please uh, be be quick because we have uh, two more teams after you. So yes, sorry. sure. <laughs> Hi, we are Group Three A, and our topic was generate, interpolate, orchestrate. We are Laura Ibanez, Antonio Ramirez, Sengun Lee, Sadvi Kwenkatesh, Anja Scheller, Jing Wang, and CJ Carr. Antonio and me will be presenting our project and doing a short live demo. So. There is a new age of music starting, so we can call it the AI aesthetic. 
So in the 40s, the electric guitar was the technology that allowed rock music to, to surface. And yeah, with the invention of synthesizers and sampler, EDM, uh, electronic dance music, and most of electronic music came into place. And now we have powerful artificial intelligence models that can help composers and musicians make new pieces of music. But then what is this AI aesthetic? How can we interpret it? And what are like the characteristics of it? Okay, so our motivation. During Hanoi from Google Magenta's talk, we observed several references to environmental and animal sounds. For instance, bird sounds. Therefore, we concluded that our approach to this AI aesthetic would include turning everyday environmental sounds into before and heard soundscapes. This intends to make us change the perception of our environment by breaking its patterns and transforming them into a new hearing experience with the means of AI technology. It will also mean finding a new way to capture the unique atmosphere of a place by turning noises into instrumental sounds and by that creating an additional level of sensual experience. Yeah, so the key concepts in our work uh, can be reduced to environmental sounds. So I guess these are soundscapes and field recordings of uh, ambiental sounds. So let's say you go to a park and you record the, the sound you hear. And we want to convert these to existing musical instruments. In this case, we are using four different string instruments that we will show later. And yeah, for these, we use two techniques based on uh, deep neural networks. The first one is source separation, which is basically taking uh, sounds from multi sounds mixed that have multiple sources and try to separate these sources. And I'll also go into detail a bit more on what we used. And neural style transfer, so using the AI to go from one sound to, to, to another. So in this case, from environmental sounds to musical instrument sounds. Okay, so our project steps. The first thing was to find the right sources, which in this case was the field recordings from different environments. We've chosen three environments. The first was a beach scene. It had seagull sounds and sea sounds. The second was a park scene with sounds from children and birds. And the third was a construction site scene. Yeah, so <clears throat> from these sounds, we then used Open and Mix, which is a, a source separation algorithm. This algorithm was trained to split sound into vocals, drums, bass, and other sounds. And basically, the way this was trained was using multi track recordings and use them as the loss for. Um, for a mixed track piece. And then the model is able, by able to learn on how to convert a mixed track into normally a, a mixed track, which has all these elements, right? And it can learn how to convert them to, to four stems, to the isolated segments. And basically, I mean, this is completely oriented towards, uh, let's say, more popular music with all the without the, these four stems. But in our case, we are feeding it the, um, the environmental sounds as an input, and we are trying to obtain the four outputs of this. So I guess it also creates some kind of artifacts in here on the separation because, uh, for example, the vocals, normally it goes for the bird sounds or the children sounds in the park, uh, and then the drums go for more percussive elements of these soundscapes. Okay, so next we've used DDSP library, which is from Google Magenta, to perform timber transfer on these obtained stems. And so we've used both pre-trained models, in this case a violin, and also our own trained models, which are a double bass, a cello, and a viola, which we've trained during these days. So we've associated each of the stems to one of these instruments, the vocals to a violin, the drums to a double bass, and the bass to a cello, and the other elements to viola. Obviously, the vocals, drums, bass, and other will be others, other things than this. So the findings when training these models 
where that quality and homogeneity are better than quantity in DDSP, which means that less data but with similar recordings and similar performers are better than more data from separate sources. Okay, so to show our project, we've created a web interface which recreates each of these environments by using mixers and crossfaders. And I'm going to show it briefly. Okay, for each scene, I will first play the original recording, which here is separated into the four stems, but I will play it together. And then I will slowly convert it to the transferred version. This is the construction site scene. So this is the park scene. And this would be the beach scene. So as a bonus material, uh, just a quick thing, you can experiment with the, with the website. It's open to, yeah. every, to everyone. So as a final thing, we, had for, we started with a different idea a bit, which was taking existing music and render it with bird sounds. And basically, we have a, an example here. So that didn't work very well. So that's why we changed. But we have Satvik singing over the rainbow first. Somewhere over the rainbow. Yeah, and then we tried to use the timber transfer from DDSP with two models we trained. So the red cardinal and the seagull. So let's listen to the red cardinal. And I guess the seagull example is more clear. Wow. So that's our seagull would sing. <laughs> so like I said, I can totally imagine the whole seagull orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's it. Thanks okay. a lot. Um, thank you for watching. I, I'm, I'm gonna, yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, mm -hmm. Let's quickly go to um, Team 3B. With, uh, I think Max will take over. And uh, then Zeng, I, I'm just going to check with you because you guys have the video. You're up after them. It's it's That's a shorter one, right? Um, I think that's only yes. a few. Yeah, okay. So we should have enough time because they've given us until 
3.30. So take it away, uh, Max. All right. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, to the festival. Uh, I want to thank my wonderful teammates, uh, Berker, Marco, uh, Anna, myself. Well, I don't need to thank myself. Thanks to Denis and thanks to Joseph. Uh, our uh, experiment is called Breaking Models to Learn About Models. So uh, we used uh, DDSP, which was just used to beautiful effect in the previous presentation. Uh, one of the things that we really liked about this was the idea of timbre transfer, which is basically you take a recording with one instrument, like a violin, you remove its melody and loudness, and you get this essence of timbre, and you can move it on to some other instrument. Um, there's a schematic. Now, this is an interesting research question, especially from the perceptual side of things, which is, what is timbre in general? Um, this model gives us kind of an interesting insight into that. Um, you have this sort of maybe problematic definition from the Acoustical Society of America that it's, and I'm paraphrasing here, it's that thing that lets you tell the difference between two sounds that have the same loudness and pitch. So if I play a violin that's medium loud at a C, and I play a trumpet that's medium loud at a C. The difference between those two things is the timbre. Um, is that really the case? Well, maybe uh, DDSP will help us find out. Um, so here's an interesting timbre that we found online. So Mark's a phone. Got that short in the interest of time. Uh, so this on the right is basically what the model sees, at least in this iteration. Uh, there's the loudness, it's just how loud it is over time, and you can see that it's kind of bouncy, and that's because these hammers are bouncing on the string. It's very much character of the instrument. Uh, and there's the pitch contour, which is the melody. And according to this ASA definition, everything else should be the timbre, the timbral essence of the instrument. Um, I want to mention that one of the things we really appreciated about working with DSP is that it's so fast. And um, this is just maybe a lesson for uh, AI in general. Um, it's nice, but it also really changes the way that you interact with the technology. We could train it within a couple of hours instead of some of these things are months. And of course, there's environmental concerns for that too. Um, but because we could train it so quickly, that allowed us to develop this exploratory approach where we're like, okay, well, let's just see what makes this thing tick. Let's map as many possible melodies as we can to as many possible instruments. And we had some interesting discoveries along the way. Uh, this technique, also known as pair everything with everything. So uh, we developed uh, 18 instruments in a short period of time and cross-pollinated those with 18 melodies. That's 324 sounds. Uh, and I say plus because it's a script that's running. Uh, this repository is growing. Many of these sounds are a minute plus long and make for very interesting listening. Uh, we got everything that you'd hope to get out of a situation like this, a subtractive synth uh, playing Mariah Carey. <laughs> And uh, why stop there? Uh, subtractive synth making dog barking sounds. Uh, naturally, with great power comes great responsibility. So we had to make the Jimi Hendrix electric guitar singing uh, Heard It Through the Grapevine as performed by Marvin Gaye. This is all just a bit of fun, of course. Um, one of the things we were very lucky in the group to have a talented electroacoustic composer, uh, Anna, and uh, we took one of her pieces and called Phonation, and we used that to train a timbre and wanted to test how much that would transfer. Um, in that case, uh, in this case, we used uh, Oh Superman by Laurie Anderson, just cool enough on its own, but even cooler now, arguably. <laughs> forward in the, uh, in the interest of time. But I do want to say that we're going to put this up on a Dropbox. Uh, there's lots of sounds, and I think it could be very uh, educational if you want to check it out and see what cross-pollinates well with what. Uh, again, because we could iterate so quickly, we could do these cool experiments. Uh, Denis in the group had this really interesting idea of taking the sounds from an 808 drum machine, uh, putting them individually one after another, the kick drum, snare drum, hi-hat, 
um, into one long file and trying to train a timbre of that. Now, this is interesting because really each one of these sounds is its own timbre. Um, so there's a multitude of timbres in this file, but we got it to train one thing. And then we wanted to probe what it could do. So we built a very clinical uh, pitch that just sort of steps up all of the chromatic uh, MIDI pitches and just spiked it with a loudness uh, amplitude envelope uh, that you can see here, just like a decaying exponential kind of generic percussive envelope. Um, I'm going to play the sound, but it's not super easy to hear. What you'll hear is that in the low tones, it's a kick drum. And then as it goes up, it starts to get a little bit sharper, a little more noise. It becomes a snare drum, and then it becomes a clap, and then it becomes a hi-hat. Let's see if I can scan through that. That's the wrong song. Really interesting finding that. Now, what about this question of timbre as being the thing that isn't loudness and pitch? Um, well, going back to that Marxophone idea, here's the Marxophone, and here's uh, something that we built from the Marxophone timbre that we extracted, and we gave it to a melody line that was from a synthesizer. Um, and the results, uh, I think, speak for themselves. Now, you can hear that's nothing at all like the timbre that we were expecting. And the lesson is that in the marxophone, all of the bounciness that is so integral to the sound is carried in the loudness, it's carried in the amplitude envelope. And what's more, this synth melody that we trained it on had this vibrato in it. And that vibrato is very much part of the synth sound, it's part of the synth timbre. Uh, so really, this is just kind of a neat toy example of how uh, pitch and loudness are a part of timbre too. So. Uh, that was kind of a fun discovery. Um, now, as we were doing this, we were dumping all the sounds into a Discord where we were chatting with each other. Um, and uh, Anna was listening. She was also asking for speech samples. I have a bit of a cameo in this uh, sample coming up. So Anna, uh, we're very lucky to have a talented uh, composer who created this piece of music based on these samples that we were generating. And uh, Marco in the group uh, created some visuals. And I'll just jump over to that right now. Um, but first, let me say thank you again to the organizers. Uh, thank you to the festival. Thanks, Maurizio. Thank you to my wonderful teammates. And uh, I'll play this, and that should send us out. so much Max and team uh, 3B. <laughs> Great work and uh, have a look at that Dropbox if you're interested in watching. Um, I think we'll put up all the links together with the stream. Um, okay, I think we're doing okay for time and we're up. Um, we came onto the last team which is team six and uh, they're called Dialogue and I'll hand the mic over to Zeng. 
Hi everyone, we're a group of composers and programmers, computer scientists and music lovers. We want to create a music piece that embodies the dialogue between human and machine in the musical creation process. Our project is a musical piece composed collaboratively with our human composers and the music transformer model from Google. Our composer, Martin from Poland, first played a melody on his flute. As a response, we left the transform model harmonized it. And based on the AI's and Martin's melody, I carried on the music with another melody and then let the AI harmonize that one. As the piece progresses, I further develop the piece by starting a A-bar harmony with more color added to the original chords. On top of this new harmony, we had a jam together with play bass played by Thomas and drum by AI. In the final part of the piece, we went back to the original musical motif from Marson and answered it musically with an open resolution to this dialogue between human and AI. Now Ray will provide some experience about our team's AI generation process and then show a short video of our final piece. In this project, we first use AI to add both the harmonization and the drums to the music. First, we use the music transformer melody conditional model to harmonize the music idea proposed by the marketing. Different from the transformer decoder model to continue the music generation, the, the company generation model is an encoder and a decoder transformer, which first encodes the melody input and uses the transformer decoder to output the accompaniment part. In our composition, the orchestra part is a result of AI. The Drumify plugin in the Ableton Live is used to add drum sequence. The realization is realized by the HTML MIDI player JavaScript package. Now, please have a look at our composition and hope you enjoy it. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Team Six. That was that video was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm so impressed with all you guys' work. And we actually, I think we have three minutes left. So maybe um, does anyone want to say something about their whole experience during this hackathon? Because I can imagine it was quite tough working at a distance with together with all these tools. Um, Zeng, how, how did how did you guys um, go uh, about it? Uh, for me, this hackathon was a really amazing experience because I ha I can connect with people with different backgrounds. We have composers and programmers, and also uh, people doing machine learning. And I think our team member has overcome the difficulty of, of the the time difference and finally produced a very good result. And so we are very happy that we joined the hackathon. Great. Anyone else? Did you guys have any life hacks to make this work? <laughs> Stay, Amy, you're still awake, right? Uh, what time is it at your place? I'm still awake. Um, it's 6.30 now. I actually just didn't go to bed. But that's, a, that's what a hackathon is about, right? True, true. At, at least you have some pizza and beer. <laughs> to... No, no pizza and beer. Oh, no. Well, I hope we can all, like, I mean, even though this hackathon was amazing and the results are really very impressive, I really hope we can reconnect live maybe next year in Leans. That would be awesome. I think I we all want another week to projects now that we did a deep dive into them. Yeah, but I mean, I hope the, that some of these projects will be developed further and maybe presented at, at the coming festival. 
Um, but for now, I think the next the next uh, program is up in the live stream. So I really want to thank everyone so much for their participation and all the effort and all the great work that you guys did. And um, I want to thank people out there uh, for watching and um, hopefully see see you soon. So that's all from us, the AIX Music Hackathon. Bye. Now we take a brief break from AI and dedicate our time to women in art, science and technology. The founders of FEM Meeting, Martha de Meneges and Dalila Honorato, were driven by the desire to develop and promote more direct collaborations between individuals who identify as women independently of wow. their sex. <laughs> Martha and Dalila will now give us an insight into the strong support of such networks for the individual that foster research and artistic creation and enable communication and trust building among members of the group. Welcome. Welcome to Fair Meeting 2020 Garden at Ars Electronica. FEM Meeting, Women in Art, Science and Technology, is a community founded in 2017. In 2018 and 2019, we organized two first international conferences in Portugal. And in 2020, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have kept a continuum of digital encounters. We are very happy to introduce to our panel today at Ars Electronica 2020. Welcome. And this is our panel for today. Welcome. Representing women in art, science and technology. Dalila Honorato is a tenured Sophia at the Ionian University in Greece. She is the founder of a conference Taboo Transgression and Transcendence in Art and Science. You know when you have a uh, a little bird inside your hands and you can kind of feel its heart just going really fast. So that's, that was the feeling that I had, and I know this is super, super cheesy, but that was the feeling that I had when um, the development of the first fan meeting was taking place. And we didn't even know that it was called fan meeting. I think we were just calling it the fem thing, the fem, 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 and then the meeting and, and somehow it just stick together. So I'm sorry if there was some sort of mystery around the name, but this is the, the raw truth. So this has been a project that has, um, well, gained a lot of energy from the excitement of the people that heard about it and that we invited. It's also a, a thing, I don't have sisters, so um, I just have two brothers. They're enough, and I'm very happy, but this has been my introduction to sisterhood. So developing a project with someone and talking about it with you know, other women, it has uh, taught me that there are, there are other kinds of collaboration and more positive uh, feedback that I ever thought about. I work in a very traditional um, um, field as an academic. I am very happy with the support that my colleagues and that the institution has given and the fact that uh, they do consent that I uh, divide my, my time, my spare time with other activities. Uh, so thank you to the Ionian University and what they have been um, also allowing a full uh, space for creation within them too. Um, what I find also very, 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 uh, I would say lovely and, and positive is the uh, reconditioning of uh, the social status of a woman in a public space. And I know that some of our speakers have referred to that. The fact that it's okay to feel some sort of uh, jealousy because it's a positive jealousy. Uh, we hear about what other women are doing and we get all excited about it and say, damn, I would like to be doing that, but I'm so happy that someone is doing this. 
So that sort of clearing up the space and knowing that whatever is happening and whatever you're sharing, it's being well received. Um, you, I feel the impulse also to try to achieve new things and things that I, I uh, could have felt nervous about in the beginning. Uh, it's not a question of uh, uh, copying, it's more like, uh, well, conquering fear. And this can happen in even, uh, even when you're apart and far. I remember the first time um, one of my students did uh, her thesis on a topic that uh, is on art and science, and I was quite nervous because this was not the usual way or not the usual semantics uh, in uh, my department. And I just decided, let me post a, a photo to Facebook on social media. And let me say, what's the topic about? And bam, the first like, the first like came from Jennifer Willett. When you're in academic, in an academia, and you're working on art and science, if your first like is coming from that person, you know you're going the, the right way. And it's just so wonderful to feel that, okay, I'm in Greece, she's in Canada, but she paid attention and there is that support. And obviously then you, you, can, you can talk a little bit about the experience that, uh, well, teaching this kind of topics and coaching younger women um, and, and, and just learn by the example. It's a little bit old school maybe. It's an uh, ethnographic experience too. No, uh, I think Victoria Vesna referred to this in um, one of her uh, presentations. And she, she referred this, that it's not only that we are in between and our status is very interesting. We are in a position to learn from others. And we are in a position of somehow try to pass our uh, experiences. I think that in each encounter, and these encounters can be in place or, uh, I mean, in a physical space or um, in a digital space. In each encounter, we try to find new words and new concepts that can help us uh, introduce or uh, regain the, the space that women that have worked in art, science, and technology have not been given. There is, there are many ways of doing art, of doing science, of doing technology. I mean, the, the, our attempt to define technology is probably a very interesting one and will not uh, be solved in two minutes of conversation. So I think that what we are doing is just showing that there's a different way of keeping um, serious conversation, keeping a, probably a more holistic approach to what it means for a human being to do research and to create. And it is important that we introduce these new concepts and this new vocabulary in the public space. I believe it is the only way of making less patriarchal our uh, community. It, because there is not only one way of one, one and single code. And it is the right time to fight for this code or to introduce this um, new vocabulary because we have reached a point that has, well, I do not recall being in this position before. I didn't leave 100 years ago. So this is a time of pausing, but also of rethinking 
the way we approach the other, the way we touch the other, the way we describe the environment. Ebru Yitzkin is a researcher based in Istanbul, Turkey. She is affiliated with the Department of Social Sciences and Humanities in Istanbul Technical University. My name is Ebru Yitzkin and I'm an independent curator and a sociologist based in Istanbul. In this short video, I'll introduce Fem Meeting, Women in Art, Science and Technology by sharing my own story. Huh. In recent years, with rising absurdity and political economic pressure in Turkey, I felt suffocated and almost isolated and silenced while dealing with the high frequency of local problems, such as ecological destruction, political corruption, economic devaluation, censorship and violence against um, humans and non-human entities. Silencing actually is a political tool of control and it involves sophisticated tactics. But as John Cage famously said, there is no such thing as silence. Something is always happening that makes a sound. In these days, I saw a wild boar swimming in the blue waters of Bosphorus. These are captured photographs of wild boars fleeing from the northern forests of Istanbul. Their habitat was destructed because of political economic decisions of the state government. Where would they flee to, I wonder? And how would they survive? Then I thought, how could we coexist? Like the fluxes of refugees from Syria, women who were imposed to domestic violence and femicide, and thousands of academics, activists, workers, and journalists who have exiled. Millions of human and non-human entities have been forced to explore new ways of survival at a planetary scale. Besides, rising authoritarian measures, climate change, pandemic, and systemic stupidity, as Bernard Stiegler would call, we need performative infrastructures and collaborative platforms that would work at translocal contexts, I thought. So in these days, I met Dolila Honorato and uh, Marta Dimineges in Taboo Transgression and Transcendence Conference in 2017. And we discussed that there are so many brilliant women in art, science, and technology all around the world, but somehow our presence, along with our works and research methodologies and experiments, are not very well known, heard, or recognized. So in the first FAM meeting that year, I met wonderful women, independent of their sex, in art, science, and technology, beside, beyond, and alongside neoliberal conservative networks of academic elites, industry and market-oriented professionals, and closed circuits of contemporary art. Like those fleeing wild boars, we found another habitat in which could, we could flee, survive, and coexist collaboratively. So Fan Meeting has become a free and safe habitat in which women in art, science, and technology can share their experience, research methodologies, experiments, and knowledge. Right from the beginning, Fan Meeting has been a queer feminist empowerment based on creating trust, friendship, and wit. Indeed, I've never seen a conference with stretch breaks where almost everyone is giving genuine feedback to presentations and listen to one another and engage with one another with care and full attention. So since then, I realized that performative thinking decentralized decision-making and collective action are fundamental aspects of FEM meeting. 
We want Fan Meeting to become a hub of solidarity among women in art, science, and technology at a transnational context. We decided that in near future, Fan Meeting can expand its ge reach geographically and embrace diversified sounds, stories, visions, knowledge, research methodologies, and experiments, and all kinds of performative thinking and action. Thank you for listening and take care. Joe Wei is a curator and researcher and the founder of Fun Bio Art Studio, currently affiliated with the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing, China. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Joe Wei. I'm currently uh, live in Beijing and uh, I'm a curator and also a researcher on art, science, and technology in the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing. So uh, it's my honor to have the invitation from uh, both Marta and Darila on the um, fee meeting. So I will answer uh, the questions that uh, they gave, gave to me. So uh, the first is, what was the impact of fee meeting in your life? So uh, I think it's very important for me because I uh, got many new friends and also um, got many support from uh, this community. And also I uh, start to realize the importance of uh, um, feminism in art, science, and technology, this field. So uh, the second is what new uh, venues of projects, ideas, passes, have opened up with your participation in fee meeting. Um, I think um, uh, there's a lot of inspiration from the meeting. Like uh, yesterday, I, I uh, had a talk on uh, Donna Haraway in the uh, most uh, um, influential art organization in China, UCCA. So it's also the first time uh, people start to talk about Haraway uh, feminism. Um, and and her influence on art in a big art institute in China. So I think that is uh, um, how to say this is a result from the fee meeting. Then the third is uh, have you changed your perspective with, uh, with your inclusion in this community? Uh, I think I'm I come with um, with no idea what fee meeting would be. I, I think it would be interesting. And I live with uh, um, gratitude because I, I got, I, I uh, received uh, friendship, support, and also uh, uh, a lot of inspiration from the meeting because people share um, ideas, uh, their happiness, their, um, their um, pain in, the, in this field. So it's like very... Um, a uh, large scale uh, exchange, um, private and uh, inspiring meeting for me. Yeah. And the fourth, what do you think the future of a uh, fee meeting could be? Is there a need for such a community? I think um, uh, like the, uh, the post uh, uh, Kronos um, period, if I can call that, um, I think a lot of a lot of meetings will be hybrid like half online half uh, physically exist so the the fee meeting might be like this um, people can I mean uh, women can um, get together in front of their computer and sit in their own home but we can also communicate so this is a uh, um, a new trend, maybe uh, different from the previous two uh, editions of the meeting. So uh, the fifth, uh, would you like to host a fee meeting in the future? What form do you imagine your fee meeting event will have? Of course, um, I think it will be interesting to host a fee meeting uh, in China and from an uh, Asian perspective and of course, it's also uh, universal or international perspective. 
and uh, uh, people can talk about um, feminism or or beyond because AST Iron Science Technology is is emerging field in China, so uh, it would be interesting to talk about it and how women play a role uh, inside this field. It will be uh, very important in in China and also in uh, East Asia. Uh, the six what are the specific aspects of fee meeting and its format that you think distinguish it over other communities? Of course, uh, as I mentioned, um, I was a little bit late when I arrived in a fee meeting uh, last year. So the the first thing I, I saw is uh, Anna, um, the, the, the uh, famous um, bio artist, uh, she sat on the table and um, spoke in a very relaxing style. Then I, my first impression was very, very different. That okay, it's a uh, it's a it's a different style. People can share each other their their own um, actual um, how to say their their real feeling on a, such a public meeting. So it's it's quite different. We we've attended um, so many public meetings every year. But this is a place that we can share uh, a lot of um, feelings together. That's um, very different. Okay, so I hope I can answer these uh, questions um, according your list. And um, I would show my uh, gratitude to fee meeting because it's a very very unique experience for me that I travel across a uh, time zone to meet so many fantastic women in my area um, so specific and they're um, so generous to share their stories to each other uh, and it will um, grow into a very powerful um, energy to um, women in the field of art, science, technology. And I hope, and I sincerely hope and uh, foresee it will um, boom, it will develop, it will glow into a, a really, really important um, team. Kathy Hai is an interdisciplinary artist and she's professor at the arts department at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York, USA. Hi, my name is Kathy Hai. I'm an interdisciplinary artist. I work in many mediums. I'm also the head of the arts department at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and a professor there. Um, I'm here to answer some questions about Fem Meeting today, which is one of my favorite alliances. Oops, hold on. Thanks for waiting. Um, and organizations uh, and networks that I belong to. Um, the questions I will answer in a second. I just want to say that Fem Meeting is an incredibly important network to me because it's an example of how these kind of networks can manifest. How support can occur through a rhizome of connections, years of learning, watching, and supporting each other. This particular network of FEM meeting is a connection built on trust, but one that also allows for differences. This heterogeneous gathering finds the glue between its people built initially on professional alliances and identification with each other and a caring for one another, but also on the belief that we inherently form a kind of clan. What might this kind of coming together look like on a larger scale? How could this model be used for future teaching or future network building to reconfigure and reimagine what our world in the future might look like? 
So what impact has femme eating had on my life? It's enabled me to have new friends, collaborators, um, access to Europe in a way and other international communities in a way that I had before, but this has only like extended it and made it much more viable for me. And the fact that everyone in this network is incredibly generous and supportive beyond imagination. Um, the next question is what new avenues or projects, ideas, paths have opened up with our my participation in FEM meeting? This question, my answer to this question is vast. I'll just say that um, I have been able to really extend my professional career through FEM meeting. I have been able to um, extend my network of people who allowed me to exhibit, who allow, who encouraged me to extend my educational practices. As a professor, I've garnered and gotten PhD students who've come to my university because of FEM meeting and meeting them through this network. Um, and I have also tried to set up a FEM meeting myself in Troy with the amazing Brandon Miller, who's an artist and professor at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute where I teach as well. And she and I tried to um, hold a FEM meeting Troy with Marta Jimenez this past March in 2020. But because of the pandemic, it was canceled. So um, there are ways that I can see this network growing and growing and growing and extending to many different communities, including my own. Um, and I mean, literally my own local community, which would make it really viable and beautiful. Um, has Fem Meeting changed my perspective and uh, with um, my inclusion in this community? No, it's really only heightened my beliefs in this community. I knew that this was a, a feminist and activist and political and artistic and professional and um, amazing alliance and network that I wanted to become part of and to support and also to, uh, you know, extend. And it is my, my work through this network has only continued to grow as the network has continued to grow. Um, what do I think the future of FEM meeting could be? Is there a need for such a community? Absolutely, yes. As an older person, elder in this community, um, I really can see the history of how women in technology and then women in art and science also has been a kind of, um, you know, thwarted one and, uh, we need to continue to support each other, to hear each other's voices, and to um, you know promote each other as best we can in this still male-dominated uh, arena. And the fact that we are um, here also extends to the fact that we need to consider uh, opening up this network and alliance. Uh, racially to include kind of intersectionality that um, will uh, have a kind of uh, breakdown so that we don't just have uh, what privileged white people like myself in this kind of network, but we represent all people and particularly all women as, um, you know, minority women, also black, Latinx, indigenous women, also completely need a voice and a place. So this is my goal for this network as we go forward. What do I think the future of FEM meeting uh, could be? Is there a need for such a network? I just answered that, sorry. Would you like to host a FEM meeting in the future or form an, uh, a FEM meeting event? We have 
already tried to do such a thing as I just mentioned. So we will hope that Fem Meeting Troy and it was the alliance of that was Fem Meeting Paris will actually happen in 2021. Um, the outcome of the cancellation of Fem Meeting Troy was the acquired immunity video contributions that over 35 women contributed to. Um, this is on the Fem Meeting web forum, and please check it out because there are these amazing short videos by women who are speaking to our coronavirus moment, how we have all endured the pandemic, what kinds of skills we have learned, what have been our thoughts, how our thoughts have changed since the spring 2020 until now. So please look at that and, and enjoy it. Um, and then finally, um, what are the specific aspects of Fem Meeting and its format that you think, think distinguish it from other communities? I really love that Fem Meeting is women only or people who identify as women, um, which hopefully will be really inclusive. As a queer woman, I really want to be that inclusive to trans people and um, queers such as myself. Um, I think that this is an intimate and social space that we need to continue to uh, evolve. And this network, much like a kind of, you know, rhizome, can bring together people to um, support each other, hear each other's voices, and contribute our works to the sort of greater um, questions and philosophies and ethical dilemmas that we're all um, working around and push our aesthetics etc cetera, etc cetera. so thank you i really love fem meeting that's all i can say thanks much dr lara belloff is an artist and a researcher currently she is associate professor at the head of the program at alto university finland hi i'm sitting in the metro i'm on my way to work um, what is a fun meeting for me? I think fun meeting appeared and felt a certain uh, hole which was there, which I didn't realize that it is there before fun meeting came and took the place of it. It is the, it is the extremely important uh, professional network of women most of whom work in, in science, with science and technology and many others with experimental arts. Um, first fun meeting was totally life-changing experience and I think this network will not disappear because there is a call for it. I think that would be really uh, great, especially enabling those who cannot get the funding together to be able to bring. Uh, another thing to the previous uh, discussion, I just wanted to point out, um, I come from this geographical region of Nordic countries in the Northern Europe. And there's, um, there's uh, uh, something very peculiar here, which is that I have um, written a little bit also about the, the history of media arts and also now art and science. And actually it's women who are coming from this region. So somehow the males come after birds. And it's very clear, but it's very interesting that it seems the the public and the the main so of course a very, very different history and it's interesting we're both in Europe, the Europeans but we in the uh, different scope. So so this I I'm yeah, I don't know what to say. I think the meeting is very important. Um, what I was thinking a little before is the, really this, uh, I like what Marta was also saying, this reaching, reaching, how to reach, how to be in some sense inclusive in this meeting. Um, and how do you make 
even if someone hears about it, how do you make them feel they invited? This is, I think, the, one of the uh, questions, because it easily always, when someone establishes something, it starts and then often there comes this feeling, oh, that's that group now. So, so how to go beyond that is, is I think, one of, the, one of the hurdles also to think about how, how to be able to do that. I remember the first FEM meeting um, when I came and I looked that there's almost 70 women and then you listen to these short talks and you're just astonished of the, the quality. And my big question was, why are we so invisible? In, in generally that was a like a big revelation for me that we are actually not few we are quite a lot so wow. just to put that here was a chat about how many people are in the chat but first fair meeting almost 70 women came and i think that's a lot and i think the second had same amount or maybe more i don't know yeah Maria Antonia Gonzalez Valerio is a philosopher and professor at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, where she is also the head of the research group Arte Marxienska. Hello, I am Maria Antonia Gonzalez Valerio. I am a Mexican and I am based in Mexico City. I am a philosopher. I have been working in academia for the last 20 years. I am a professor, but this is not an academic statement. Feminism is not my research field, nor gender studies. I am a feminist in my heart and soul. Feminism is embodied in me. I have no other choice, because being a woman means more often than not living in a battle. As Barbara Kruger stated, your body is a battleground. But we get to choose what battles we fight, where do we fight them, and with whom. We get to choose, sometimes. Living in Mexico gives us perhaps no choice but to assume the battleground. Everywhere. In our own bodies that have been subjected to gender violence since the beginning. In our own rooms which we have to fight for in order to get a room of one's own. Maybe, but it's someone else's house where we had to make a space for us. For an us that was not behaving according to the traditional norms. For an us that was not built according to the traditional standards. For an us that needed to be invented, to be named, to gain a space, to breathe, to stand up and not waiting in silence, to fight for a place in every space where we dare to appear, a battleground indeed. Because it has never been a question of just being there, but to make, to open, to preserve the habitat for being what we are. What are we? Who is we? There is no universal woman. There is no universal way of being. The existence is something specific, sight and time specific, culture specific, mood specific, tradition specific. And the white women from wealthy countries do not represent us. Who is us? I do not represent the different women from my country the black women, the indigenous women, the poor women, the immigrant women, the illiterate women, the religious women, the conservative women, the mothers, the spouses, the Zapatist fighters. I do not represent them. Who am I? Am I a woman? What am I? I have this ancient rage living inside me. I have this untamable desire of existing, even if I have to fight every step of my existence. And I have this will to share whatever I have accomplished, whatever fight I have won, whatever space I have found. 
I have this will to be part of communities, to build communities. Maybe by living in Mexico, I do not get to choose to permanently live in battleground. But I can choose who I fight with, who I think with, and who I make a common habitat to exist with. And I have chosen to be part of FEM meeting. When I think about that, I feel joy and excitement and love and tremendously noisy laughs. I feel a safe space. Surrounded by women that know how to embrace their vulnerability and how to share and how to care for each other and for the many others that we entangle our lives with. My body is not a battleground when I am with them. I can be whatever. I do not have to compete or to behave. I do not have to constantly look over my shoulder. I do not feel menace or threatened there. I do not need to be smart or beautiful or powerful or compelling. I can just be. We need safe spaces. We need to feel safe. From time to time, we need to lay the guard off. Fem meeting is my territory because a territory is not something private or possessed but something shared with multi-species, with the air and ground, with the sounds, for a moment in which we have learned to respect the other for what she is and inhabit together for a while. This is not an academic statement. Feminism is not my research field, nor gender studies. I am a feminist in my heart and soul. Feminism is embodied in me. And from time to time, my body is not a battleground. Victoria Vesna is an artist and professor at the UCLA Department of Design, Media, Arts, and she's the director of the UCLA Art Science Center. Well, if you think of video art, right? I mean, it was of this window of opportunity for women to express themselves because there was no room in painting and sculpture. They really created the whole scene and then the guys came and we don't even know who was there. So I think a big mission is to make sure that people don't forget we were here. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to add that one of the things that I really appreciated about Fem Meeting uh, to tag on to what Maria Antonia was saying. So many times I saw many of you and others and people I didn't know in conferences or exhibitions like snapshots, you know, and I would like to spend a little more time with this person or that person or discover a little bit about someone. And it would just all just happen at the speed and to have an opportunity to meet somebody deeper in a more relaxed atmosphere just meant a lot. Um, but additionally, what was really a gift was to see all the work from the really young, um, some of the women were really young, like 21, 22, and just uh, having this kind of sense of, wow, there's a whole generation coming and they need a lot of support. So I really felt this um, idea of importance of being a mentor as you get older as a woman and not to have this kind of competition thing going on but rather to kind of figure out who you would like to support and to have a community of people who are, have that kind of intent is really amazing and it's something that's very rare and important so it should be nurtured absolutely it is the kind of women because I, I, I will say that I've also had a lot of women who were not that great for me, you know, who really actually undermined me in many ways that, you know, you just go, wow, you know, so you can't just say, oh, it's women, so everybody's wonderful. But it's the kind of women that got attracted. It's really very cool. I found that really just so wonderful to see so many women I had no idea about their work, just get the spectrum. And 
honestly sitting in the room listening one after the other. Normally in conferences, I would be out of there after two talks. <laughs> this is too much, but I sat there because I was just really fascinated, you know, how varied and the quality was just so high. And why are we not seeing all these women? Why are they somehow in the dark? Um, and how do we pull them up? So I agree with you. How do we put the light on? Um, it, it's also an opportunity doing it online with the network. If you just think about tonight's meeting, you have Greek, Chinese, Portuguese, Israeli, Turkish, Finnish, Mexican, ex-Yugoslavia and USA. I mean, in one meeting, right? That would cost a fortune, you know, if we had to meet somewhere just in travel and hotels and all the stuff that goes along with it. So yes, of course, there's nothing that can replace, you know, being in the south of Portugal in a swimming pool with a bunch of awesome women. Of course, that's great. But to build that network, this is a great way to do it. And um, I would just, just suggest keep going, you know, just have also, I would like to think through with everybody, how do we make events so we don't sit on Zoom, but actually are using these windows to do performative things and allow uh, some kind of new art form of expression to emerge that doesn't require travel or money or anything. Just somebody in their living room can act it out um, and just make a thing out of it, you know? like create a massive collaborative project, some kind of crazy corpse and, uh, you know, it could be fun. <laughs> it would. Marta de Menezes is a Portuguese artist. She is the artistic director of Ectopia and director of Cultivamos Cultura. She is the co-founder of Fair Meeting together with Dalila Norato. For me, um... I wanted to make sure that um, that you understand a few aspects of fair meeting, which are um, important, I believe, for the for the atmosphere, for the feeling, for for what is fair meeting, and and for that, I think I it would it, it is important to to let you know a little bit of what would happen if we were all in the same place uh, um, presentially uh, and not just in a digital form. Um, so if this was a meeting uh, like the previous ones that we had, um, I would be with, together with Dalila and probably a lot, a lot of the members of this panel uh, welcoming you to a specific place, wherever that was. Uh, but more importantly, to the feeling of, of, uh, of safeness is to be in a meeting with fem meeting. Um, it is um, usually a feeling of being relaxed and at home, and I think it is. It's um, it's clear in 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 the women that have talked that this is this is the case. It is a place, and you can see it in the testimonies that we have in the videos on our uh, hub and on the landing page at our Electronica. It is a place where we can um, be ourselves, where we don't have. Uh, much to prove except how brilliant we all are, how uh, interested, how committed, how, um, how hardworking, uh, how passionate about what we do and about our lives, how, how we overcome difficulties and how we um, are human, how we are uh, fragile, how we hurt, how we, um, how we, uh, um, have feelings and how we um, uh, live through them as, as human beings. Um, and I think this is, this is a very important uh, statement to make at, at any beginning of a FEM meeting because it, it is uh, one of the most important things about, um, uh, one of the most important reasons why we, we created FEM meeting was to give um, that feeling of, of being in a, in a, in a in space in, in, in a moment where we can be uh, um, without fear. Um, for me, uh, making FEM meeting is, is a pleasure. It's a lot of work, 
but it's never a work that I am uh, uh, that I that I don't look upon with great joy in 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 um, in going going through it. Um, I have to say I have a great team at Cultivamos Cultura, which makes everything that we do, no matter how hard, um, always a joy. Uh, being at Ars Electronica is and was a lot of work. But again, the team has come through. I can't let this go by without thanking them. Um, all of the members of Cultivamos Cultura have been absolutely exceptional inexhaustible in making sure that everything for the hub was good, that all the videos would, was, were edited properly, that every, every person's name, and I have to thank Dalila for, for this as well, Dalila and Diana and Claudia and everybody made sure that all of the names of everybody involved in, in, in Femme Meeting were there uh, and and I'm <laughs> I'm I'm pretty sure that nobody was forgotten because they were very careful um, in doing this. If if so, I apologize in advance, <laughs> but I don't I really don't think we forgot any. But um, I also wanted to say that um, for me, uh, fem meeting is 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 not something that you. Um, um, that you become a member of it's it's not about membership and so in my mind and i think this is this is um i'm not sure if this is the same way with everybody but for me from the very beginning and i think Bella understands what i'm saying every woman whether they know us or they know about fem meeting are already a member of a fem meeting um it's it's uh, for me the objective of fem meeting is to reach out as a network of, of, of um, individuals who identify themselves as women, uh, a support network for everybody who's, um, who's going through life and going through their profession within the realm of art, science and technology, um, who may need to know that we are there for them um, anyway, that we are already there for them, whether they know of us or not. And it would be much better if they did know, if they were active members of, of or active participants in the activities of Femme Meeting. But um, for me, um, it is, they're already there. It's, 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 uh, it's just a matter of, of um, being conscious about it or um, finding out that we are there. And, and hoping that when they do, it will help them go through any of the you know, difficult parts in our life, uh, any of the moments where we feel more alone or that we feel that we're not understood or that we feel um, less happy or a little bit more lonely about. Um, and this was one of the main reasons why I think the meeting is such a powerful and, and needed presence in, in my life. Okay, so um, so far, Fem Meeting, in terms of uh, of its format, in terms of its uh, uh, um, objectives and and ways of operating, we have uh, now achieved a stage where um, we think that every three years there should be an, a, a meeting, an international, a more international meeting in Portugal, to which Cultivamos Cultura is uh, committing to to organizing. So every three years, we will hopefully uh, be able to organize a meeting where as many people as we can uh, support or 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 encourage um, may come and 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 um, meet with us, uh, meet privately, but also also give a, a, a public part uh, or a public face to to the the work to the community, and and we would like to encourage in as much as as possible, and we will continue on trying to encourage as much as possible meetings in between those three those events in Portugal in more local uh, uh, more localized communities. So part of what we want to achieve with them meeting is to identify and to bring to the fold um, in a way um, the women that we don't know yet that are working in the field uh, and and for this we feel that uh, that it is important to um, organize um, um, with with some 
um, whatever that may be. It can be one week um, in a coffee place. It can be once a year in in a in a um, um, uh, an, uh, an academic uh, institution or a non-academic institution. It, it doesn't really matter, but somewhere where the local um, women or uh, people identifying as women can find each other and find a node that will more locally su support them. Um, I don't know, Dalila, is there yeah, anything you would like to add? I think you're, you're, what we were saying in Resume, or what, what Martin is actually saying is that if you have a space or if you have the will to organize this, we will be there for you. So please contact us. It is extremely important to have a, someone in place because you know better than us what is happening in your environment. You know better than us who is around you. And if you don't know, you will know very soon. And only through, by being local, we can have impact in different sectors of society. Our, one of our uh, dreams, let's say so, one of our wishes is to be able of having an impact um, further than the academic community, further than the, the adulthood, let's say so, because we know that unfortunately the social models that are being uh, shown to young girls and young, and young boys, they are still um, unbalanced. So what we are trying to achieve is a way of collaborating maybe with schools, maybe with uh, cultural institutions, museums, uh, and show that there are other ways of doing things, that there are women working in extremely interesting fields, and that those fields are not gender biased. Garden Fem Meeting 2020 at Ars Electronica. Fem Meeting Women in Art, Science and Technology. <laughs> I think we can unmute everybody, no? <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> it was really fun. So it was really fun because I couldn't hear nothing, only you, Marta, and <laughs> nothing else. <laughs> but hello from Linz to everybody. I'm really Hi, Anna. Hi, Anna. Hi. Hello. <laughs> this is pity that uh, you are not here, but um, I, I am really near. Bratislava to Linz is so close. Well, you are our representative. <laughs> oh, perfect. Maya also and Sasha Special was, uh, was here also. That's yeah, that's so good. Yeah. Yes. And uh, so now we're live, and this looks very much like a, a regular fan meeting on Zoom. <laughs> yes, it does. It does, it does, it does. <laughs> So as usual, we're we're not really. It's like the teapot chat. Absolutely, Stephanie. It's it's um, as usual. We're not very good at keeping the rules, um, <laughs> but that's part of our strengths. And uh, we didn't want to uh, have this Zoom uh, meeting be just with the nine people of the panel. And so I am really happy that you were able to join us because there's so many of us and. Uh, I know a lot of them can't make it um, here, but it's great to see you all again. This is so amazing. So thank you to our speakers uh, for their participation in the video. Thank you to all of you too for your participation at the Fem Meeting Garden 2020 at Ars Electronica. And 
just for the kicks, I would like you to tell me where you are. We know about uh, Ada. She's the only FEM meeting member presently present here that is actually in Linz. So everybody, I am at this point in uh, between continents. Oh, that oh. is my disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> on a plane? Are you on a plane? <laughs> Not yet, no. <laughs> so Marta is the only one in Lisbon. Our garden is located in Lisbon. I am. Ebru? Hello, I'm uh, in Bodrum in Turkey right now. <laughs> Dolores. Uh, in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, North America. And this is my message of gratitude Aww. to all of you. Thank you. <laughs> and Kathy. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm in the USA. I'm north of New York City um, and south of Troy, near a beautiful lake. So welcome and hello to all my beauties. Jennifer Willett. I'm in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, and we're right on the border with Detroit. So we're a border town to the US. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm in Paris, France, Europe. Len Ortega. Oh my God, oh my God. Oh, she can't. You speak. are in Mexico. Yes. <laughs> Well, you're not you're not um i'm yeah i'm in western australia um i can't live no one is allowed to leave no one is allowed in we are yeah in a parallel world i presume <laughs> but lovely 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 to see you all beautiful beautiful women really i wish i wish i could see you in the flesh but this will suffice for now Stephanie. I'm in Buffalo, New York, which is also close to the border, which is very exciting that I can take the Harriet Tubman, Tubman Railroad and escape if I need to. <laughs> <laughs> Maria Antonia. Friends out there. <laughs> Hello, all. I'm in Jalapa, Veracruz, in Mexico, and I'm so happy to see you all, beautiful women. <laughs> Laura Bello. I I'm in the Northern Europe, Helsinki, Finland, and I'm very happy to see everyone here and being in good mood. Mm -hmm. Hello, Julia. Nice Hello, to meet Julia. you. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm between Toronto and Montreal in Kingston on the lake uh, in uh, Ontario, Canada, and it's so wonderful to to join. Thanks for having me. Victoria Vesna. I am in, uh, at the border of Palm Springs in California that's burning up right now. So we're staying inside because the air is just horrendous. But I'm so happy to see you and escape reality. <laughs> <laughs> like you're not, <laughs> we can't go anywhere. <laughs> Hello, Joey. Love, love to all of you. Hey, Joe. <laughs> Joe's frozen. Yeah. Joe? Well, Amy? Amy Hanks. Hi. Hey. Hi. Hey. Hey. I'm here in Columbus, Ohio, beneath the Great Lakes, <laughs> just <laughs> off the Great Lakes. And um, so happy to see you all. I'm giving you a big hug. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not really sure how to uh, <laughs> Welcome. Always hacking, always here. Yeah, exactly. Yes, Linz is awesome. It's quite cool, but things are going on. That's a good message, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, it's quiet. It's it's easy. Nature is here, like people there, people friendly. Program is still ongoing physically, 
and also online. So this hybrid thing, it's cool. It's cool. Yeah, we yes. keep on doing things, making, right? Making is the key, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sending hugs to everybody, hugs to everybody, solidarity. All channels open, we do both ways, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Maya. This is wonderful. It's good to hear that everything is going on in Ars Electronica. Yeah. I wish we could all be there at na right now. So this being said, questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or answers. So our panel is on Femitting Women in Art, Science and Technology. How about Anik? Tell us about your project. Oh, you mean with Fem Meeting? With Fem Meeting and with at Arts. Oh, with Fem Meeting, I want to say um, um, that um, I should have had, like uh, Kathy, a Fem Meeting this March. Um, it was women, um, all women crew, so women dealing with space, art and science, space being out of space, and astronomy and astronautics. And um, I had the courage to do it because of fan meeting. The fan meeting I attended, I would never have put that 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 workshop together without fan meeting. And when it was cancelled due to uh, to the COVID, as everybody else, uh, I think I had the courage to try to to do something remotely with all the participants because it was a fan meeting uh, workshop. Probably if it had been only. The, 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 the usual Leonardo Space Art Workshop, I would have said, well, it's cancelled. But I felt a huge responsibility toward the group and toward this this um, this energy and this uh, strength that was carried through through the meeting. So it's why we produce the podcast. And it's why with Daniela Dupolis, we used her um, art technology, I mean, her art, uh, how can I say, system uh, to send all of us to the moon because we couldn't gather in Paris. So what is going to prevent us to gather? So we went to the moon. And I know it, sound, it, it may sound silly, but uh, I'm very proud of this and I'm very proud that it happened because of, of the group and the strength of the group. And in Ars Electronica, with uh, Marta and uh, Tatiana Kuroshkina, um, Claudia Schnuck and Robertina Shebjanic, we have launched for a traveling plant, the very difficult travel around the, the world of a true imaginary plant. And I think I had also the, the strength and courage to launch uh, this project um, because of fan meeting in a way. I mean, I think fan meeting gave me the the, um, um, the power to believe that I could do something. And, and I invite every one of you here around this Zoom and everyone listening to us to contribute to the preparatory logbook for the traveling plan. It's open until the end of the month. You can write a few words uh, to the plant of what it can expect in your neighborhood. So please uh, join us. Thank you, Annie. And I will, would like to ask the same question to Victoria. <laughs> Well, I uh, contributed a stinging nettle to the traveling plant. Uh, I love stinging nettles. I think they're so amazing and they've been around as the witches brew forever. Um, right now, as we're talking, I'm setting up this project. So that's going to happen in an hour, but I didn't want to miss it. So I told these guys, you know what? I have something I got to do on the side. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like Anik, I like escaping into space. Um, but just for a second to say that I wanted to send you uh, two videos, but I'm not going to share a screen. I'm just going to tell you and then send it to you. The first one was for your request. What is fan meeting to you? And I happened to be uh, in a place that has a swimming pool. So I jumped into the pool and I said, that's what it is for me. I remember, <laughs> that. I remember the moment when we were in 
you know, this beautiful space and suddenly I didn't give a shit what people thought. I didn't care how my body looked. I didn't, and I knew that the women there were the right women. Uh, so, and women that I could see only for split seconds over the years. I've known Kathy for 30 years, you know, and finally to kind of sit together and just hang was just amazing. And then speaking of Kathy, because I'm quarantined, I had time uh, as many of us do to go through archives. I found an interview I did with Kathy <laughs> where I was wearing all white and I was just in this weird phase, uh, almost embarrassing, I have to say. And I was interviewing Kathy about <laughs> a video that she put out, and we were on cable TV. <laughs> and I remember, Kat, and I have to share it eventually because it's gold. I mean, she's looking at me like, what the f <laughs> She and was I'm a butterfly. She was a butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's just so wonderful to see you and to have that kind of long-term relationship. I've seen Yanat, what, 20 years ago in Perth? And so, you know, there's a silver lining to this. I don't know that we would all meet uh, in Linz right now with all the, even with without the pandemic, it's tough to meet and to have this kind of time. So I really appreciate it, even though I'm really juggling at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, that's that's me. And you'll probably see me disappearing, but I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thanks. So happy, no? Yeah, what do you have to say about it? Yeah. <laughs> she was delightful. She was a butterfly. <laughs> it was prescient of all her other future projects that's all i can say victoria it was really quite wonderful <laughs> i had a, i had a window into what your future and our future with you would be but yes it's so wonderful to be here and i agree it's it's been a really uh a salvation to me to have all of you online during this pandemic because we can't go anywhere and we're all stuck and yet I get to talk to all of you, you know, more than I have in a really long time. So it's a beautiful opportunity, which I hope will end soon. <laughs> but I would like to keep up some of this energy. And we too were to have a FEM meeting this past spring with Anique in tandem with Paris. And we were looking forward to it so much. Marta and Kira O'Reilly were going to be our, our keynote speakers and coming in person until dum, 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 everything shut down. And so we then, you know, it, it was a disappointment, but at the same time, people, we decided to ask people to please send us their reflections on the pandemic. And now it's such a curious archive and snapshot of the first two months of lockdown. And it's, it's part of the FEM meeting website. You can find it under... Uh, the fem web and it's it's the acquired immunity there they're beautiful they're like 35 different uh you know getting inside different women's brains little videos and they're fantastic so it it was it was a gift that was a gift to make um lemonade out of lemons and uh, as Brandon Miller, my colleague in all of this who's not here today but sends you love would say about it all so this was to be done with the Sanctuary for Independent Media, which is in Troy, New York, an amazing nonprofit, which if you are interested, please go look at it too, mediasanctuary.org. And it's a kind of sister organization to Fem Meeting. And I just am so happy to see you all. Thank you to Marta and Delila for all your energy for doing this so courageously and with such love. We thank you for that. Well, we thank you all thank because you. Um, because you've you've done an amazing job. I I can't thank everybody enough, not only to um, to have us um, to be a part of this, um, uh, and but also the testimonies that Boriana, that Jennifer, um, that Lena and Maria Antonia sent us. They are absolutely amazing, uh, amazing. I, I I was saying earlier that I was crying so hard. Almost every time I put, 
myself working on this <laughs> on this website and on the on the hub and on on the fan meeting at Ars Electronica, I was crying and it was it was um, it was very moving. It was not sad tears, so it was sort of a sad because I can't hug you, but also amazingly moved by how generous and how how you are so um, giving and telling us how we're actually touching you and how it actually is working because we try to do things and we try to do, do them as best as we can. But it's, it's really rewarding to hear from all of you how it actually affects you. Uh, and I think this communication, this feedback is, is probably one of the most important things for me and the Leela, no? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I would like to bring your nut uh, because I believe uh, in the future we will have a fan meeting somewhere near you. Oh, I hope so. I mean, yes. Let's <laughs> let's be yeah yeah. Let's be optimistic. Yes, you'll all come <laughs> down under to uh, Western Australia, um, and um, I'll give you such a good time. I promise. And um, we will discuss the, you know, the way the world is is evolving in a crazy, crazy way. But uh, you know, I don't want to sound too um, naive. But I think you know we we should look at it as a possibility to look at a different way of um, being in this world than you know the the feminine way. Let's let's get rid of this patriarchy that really brings us to nowhere. And I think we all know we're ready. I mean, this is the time to do it. And um, let's do it in Western Australia, definitely. So it's a great <laughs> place um, to do that. You have um, swimming pools, yes? We do have, we have the ocean. <laughs> we have um, the ocean too. <laughs> we have sharks as well, as you know. Um, yeah, but, um, but the good, Good sharks, not the bad one. <laughs> they're all um, good. They're all good. Yeah, yeah. They're all good. That's right. They're all good. The beautiful sharks. We just have to give them the space that, um, and share, you know, space with them, which we'll try to do, um, and uh, continue this this beautiful legacy that started with fan meeting, which I think. Um, is important. Again, I missed the first one. I came to the second one, and it was such a, a great experience that um, yeah, until you actually experience it, how you are a, among women around you, you let off so many guards that you unconsciously have all the time. And um, you know, I'm trying this kind of openness and, and love that we all share in something in me always say, is it real? Is it real? But more and more, I, I understand that it is. And, and that's, that's really nice. So thank you. You are very, very welcome. We just let this um, Corona, we learn to also um, share space with this virus and kind of um, um, try to cohabit this world mm -hmm. together and Come over. <laughs> Thank you, Yuna. And um, another. You were saying something? No. Yeah, I was. Um, I wanted to say, just listening to what each of you said, what became very clear is that this very heavy machinery that the patriarchy is took a long time to wrap their minds around the new situation and how to deal with it. Whereas um, Kathy, Anik, uh, you, um, um, Rumi and you, Marta, immediately it was such a flexibility and such a suplice of spirit and this is something that's in us, I guess, to immediately adapt and turn this very stressful situation in an empowering one and immediately being able to give even more opportunity to all the women around us. And I think this is brilliant and this is the best 
that could could have come out of it and see how being isolated physically just helped us to better get together. Thank you, Dolores. Can I pass the word to Maria Antonia? Amazing, extraordinary philosopher. Absolutely. Uh, yes, and mute yourself. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, good Dalila. Uh, while listening to you all, I was thinking how important it is to change our mindset. Instead of being aggressive and, com and competitive, as in the patriarchy, to build communities of care. And I think that Fem Meeting is a perfect example of a community of care, because what we do there is to care for each other and to care for the environment and to care for our surroundings. So I would just uh, call, like a call to how do we build communities of care? And in that sense, I would ask, where do we go from here? Thank you, Ionat, for the invitation to go for, to Western Australia, but because it's going to be a while, I think, we can start planning. What are we going to do there? So we will have at least a year to plan that. So it's going to be fantastic. <laughs> thank <And> you. <laughs> thank you. Um, you are an amazing collaborator, an amazing partner in crime, one of the most complete persons that I know. And thank you for being also one of the two voices that were really working in, on the underground to make Fem Meeting happen without knowing you and Kathy. So I would like to ask Laura. Hi. Mm, yeah, so. Oh, there's a, a Fem also in, in, uh, in Scandinavia group and uh, I know that there was a plan maybe of doing a fan meeting local Hopefully in Scandinavia. Holds. <laughs> of course there's a lot of other things always coming in between but what I wanted to actually say is that um, yeah I think the first fan meeting was totally astonishing when you see the amount of brilliant women there and, and you just realize that why where are we why are we so alone everyone and kind of trying to cope in the structures of the world so that was really a big deal for me at least to sort of uh, overcome that. Another thing which I just now realized because I haven't been too active in the teapot chats and there's a very clear reason for that. I'm sure some of you are also very burdened by the having all the um, academic and other works on Zoom and the teaching on Zoom and everything on Zoom and you're just sitting eight hours a day in Zoom and it's just like sometimes impossible to add an extra. However, I've noticed something. In my academic work, I get angry when administrative meetings come to my home. But I do get angry when you come. So you're all very welcome. And I'm very happy about that. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, from our formal panel of speakers, Ibru. I'm really um, happy to be with you, and um, I, I, I said this before, and uh, I will keep saying it a thousand times. I, I felt really alone here, dealing with all this um, stupidity and uh, and all the other problems, and um, I, I thought I was going crazy really before before I met you guys. Um, so I tested myself with <laughs> or not and um, I, I feel really lucky that, that I've met you I mean um, during pandemic I, I, I felt so depressed and uh, I worked so much and um, I didn't feel um, doing anything but um, it's it's the constant I don't know the the solidarity and and the care of this group is is just amazing. So that it's refreshed me and it refreshed myself and re, it revitalized my 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 self integrity. I, I, I suppose um, I've been working um, on something that I call paratactical works, and um, as you know, um, we 
I, I, I suggest that we need to um, grab and explore the tactics of this patriarchal system and then subvert it for, for commons and for other, other causes so that we could experience and create perhaps other worlds. So I don't see right now this, this, this crazy weird world situations as a, as a, as a stopping, um, as, a, as a preventing issue. So that um, we're just faced with the unknown and the unknown doesn't scare me. The unknown is, is for me is always um, finding alternative routes and, um, and, and ways of organizing. And this FEM meeting is, is a way of organizing and, uh, uh, and, and this is just the beginning. Jennifer, would you like to say something? Will it? I would just like to say that I know we're almost out of time, but Fem Meeting is a magnificent phenomena and it gave all of us a home. And I want to say thank you to Dalila and Marta for bringing us together. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Stephanie and Amy and Lena and Dolores and Joe and Cecilia and Maria Manuela, thank you for your support to the community. Thank you for sending some of you these amazing videos. Thank you for um, expressing uh, your, um, well, vision of the world. And there was a question to be answered in one minute or in whatever will happen between today and next year. Could we address Ars 21 for the future? <laughs> oi, oi, oi. <laughs> I'm sending love in this minute that I have available to all of you. Go on, Anik. Anik. Yeah, so so we, I was listening, listening to you and thinking that uh, fan meeting was really this this um, situation, um, this context in between a place where we physically met and, uh, in, in uh, Portugal and revealed ourselves to ourselves. And it was then the second uh, element, which was which were the Zoom teapot meetings during uh, the lockdown where we were every one of us. And this also electronica uh, is also something in between with the on-site in Lens, but all of us, uh, spread all, all, all over the world, and I, I and I and I feel a strong bond in everybody trying to bring something low. I mean, to, to this uh, arts electronica, which is also totally unusual. So, what could we bring to arts electronica twenty one uh, from our experience of being both uh, a, a group on site and, and and online and and. Yeah, and maybe do something both inside and online in Lens next year with our perspective and our vision and our different way of uh, doing things than the usual things, conferences or whatever. Well, I hope to see you soon. It's a work for you, Marta. I'm just heading a workload. <laughs> That's okay. You can always give me work. I will always work with you. I As part of Garden Brussels and the AI Music Festival, Bosa presents a panel and performance featuring musician, composer, and programmer Dago Sondervan, who is focusing on his life coding practice. Dago is joined by musician, producer and researcher Andrew Klaas, part of renowned Belgian band Stuff and known for his projects ranging from obscure and abstract to techno. Armed with an arsenal of specifically developed tools and apps, the two musicians will train a virtual agent towards musical autonomy and real-time interaction, becoming a trio along the way. Join the upcoming live session to see Dago and Andrew perform and discuss the outcomes of their collaboration. Welcome to the AI Music Festival at Bazaar in Brussels. Uh, we are very excited today to be hosting this event uh, in the framework of the Arts Electronica Festival.
in particular because this um, AI and music chapter of the festival is very much in line with uh, Bazaar's mission to connect different disciplines. Um, in a few moments, we will be sharing with you the world premiere of Bot Bop, an experimental music performance by Dago Sondervan and Ander Klaas. Bot Bop is an improvisation that builds on a combination of live coding and adaptive algorithms based on live inputs uh, from an electronic sax. Um, it is a performance for two humans and two AI agents. And it was recorded right here in this room here at Bazaar yesterday. So what you're about to hear uh, is the recording of that live performance. And you will see also um, a sort of improvisation experimental live video mix. It will last about 30 minutes, and then we will be back here with uh, Dago, with Andrew, and with Frederick Leblazer for a um, short talk to touch upon some interesting points about AI, machine learning, and creativity. See you in a bit. Rushing. Rock. Sorted. Mounted. Subsequently. I Aquinas. Sorry. Towards. Seashore. Of. Isolation. Club stage. Din. Of. A. Terminately. Unknowingly. A. Joyous. Paleolithic. Wafer. A. Your tail. Hat. Tail. Thermal. Thank you. 
Disaffected. Unfortunate. Hello. Two. Potluck. On. Discontented. <laughs> Levitate. Partner. <laughs> Thought. <laughs> Certifiable. <laughs> Aviator. <laughs> Chomp. Wait. On. Bottom. A spider. Welcome back here at Bazaar. Uh, I'm here with uh, Dago Sondervan, who is a drummer and a live coding expert that uh, passed by a step uh, making electronic music with generative uh, software Atari in the 90s. Uh, I, uh, next to him, there is Andrew Klass, who is a musician, a producer, and a researcher uh, that's definitely known <laughs> for uh, his um, role as EY, EY player in uh, the Belgian band Stuff. Uh, his uh, taste uh, led him to projects uh, that range ranging from very obscure and abstract atmosphere to quite straight up techno. And uh, we are here also with Frederick de Blazer, who is the co-founder of EMRG and the author of Notebox. He holds a PhD researching uh, the links between computers and art and the impact of procedural graphic applications on graphic designers' practices. Um, before starting, I would like to remind you all that you can ask questions. Uh, you can just type them in the comment box, whether you're following the stream on Facebook or on, or on YouTube, and they will be passed on. Uh, so, um, questions are welcome. Um, we are uh, starting, well, I will start straight away with, uh, with you, Dago and Andrew, uh, straight, jumping straight uh, into your uh, performance. What we just saw is basically you two working um, in a collaborative way, in a sort of two humans, two AIs uh, live show in which there are literally four performers improvising on each other's creation. So. How did you get to this point and how 
or it all happens on stage? Well, we were asked by Bazaar to make a performance uh, that involved AI. Um, uh, I also did some performances with live coding here uh, a while ago, so they hooked me up with Andrew, and they didn't know that we knew each other for like six years ago. We, we worked together on a project, and we know each other from the town we live, Antwerp. And uh, we were very happy that they, hooked, that they hooked us up. And so we could pick up on uh, working together again. So he used an, uh, a different environment. He can explain a little bit later. And I'm, uh, so we combined it with uh, live coding. And the two agents uh, were like programmed. Uh, a friend of our is Casper uh, Jordaans. He's an engineer who works for IMEC and uh, he works with uh, AI. And he helped us making two friends, Rob and Bob. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Rob is actually our uh, poetly kind of uh, MC. And uh, Bob is, uh, uh, how, how do we call him, a melody, yeah, he's melody, a melody creator, star. something like this. So uh, Andrew, maybe you can explain a little bit more about your environment. Uh, well, I, I've been using uh, patching uh, software uh, since, um, since, I think, 15 years or something. Uh, I've been using the program uh, Usin, Hollyhock, um, which is a uh, visual modular programming environment. Um, uh, basically, uh, the, the program is also called Usin, and I think it's a good word for what I'm doing. It's like making uh, this, uh, this, this plant, which... Uh, which does things for you. So actually, I'm, I'm recording uh, my, my instrument. I'm, I'm an EWI player, so it's an electronic wind instrument, which is like a digital saxophone controller. So basically, I'm, I'm putting out uh, node data. And I can record this data, so I'm not recording my sounds, but the data. Um, and then uh, I've, I've made uh, the, uh, a program which, um, which randomly uh, shifts between small uh, sentences I've recorded and then because of the, the nature of the data uh, I can uh, it, the program tracks also the last let's say 16 or 8 played notes so uh, when uh, the program is playing back randomly my re recorded phrases it shifts them to the new notes I've been playing so this uh, so this means that Actually, I'm recording loops, but those loops are very fluent. Uh, if I if I transpose my playing, so if I'm soloing and I'm just going one step higher in another key, transposing, then everything which is running is also following those new notes. And so that is like, a, I think it's a very um, a naive uh, way of uh, machine learning or something. That was actually what I was thinking about when they asked me, like, okay, can you do something with artificial intelligence? I started... Uh, looking up some things and I was thinking like okay in my environment what would would, would that mean like uh, giving me some input which I didn't play but which is based on what I what I played uh, and uh, and constantly evolving which uh, enables me to to uh, to shift things in a in a very easy way because I, I didn't have any controller normally I have uh, lots of knobs and stuff like mm -hmm. that but I really chose to have just like a computer a system which is running even if I played my my uh, lowest note on the EWI which doesn't uh, which uh, which d didn't sound the message triggers actually the AI the AI system which Casper uh, uh, helped us with uh, a lot um, uh, so and then and then the AI is also feeding input so it's uh, like this combination of, of generative adaptive system uh, together with uh, with uh, machine learned AI actually so yeah good uh, so here I, I would like to invite Frederick to jump in um, as we are talking about creation um, what are your uh, what, what's your take on on AI uh, augmenting the the creatives work basically in uh yeah so I come from a visual background I've uh, uh, dabbled in audio AI uh, as well um, the way I see it there there the the computer has three levels of interpreting or working together with you and I think um, automation is the first step. It's basically the computer doing the road boring uh, jobs that we want to get rid of. And uh, that happens in all environments, but it also happens uh, in music or in imagery. Um, 
and then you have, uh, and, and I think that's what we are getting at, we, um, we have the AI actually assisting you or helping you or learning from you as a creative partner where, and I noticed that in the piece as well, there's this feedback that goes on, this conversation that you have where you are playing uh, a piece, the AI is riffing off of that, and then you are al also riffing off what the AI is doing and sort of exactly. creating this interesting feedback loop and actually even playing with the AI because you understand the system, you understand, okay, if I feed in, for example, these specific notes, then it's going to do this or that. So you have this, this dialogue. And I think it's a really interesting place to be. Um, and I think there's also a third level, which is um, autonomous AI, where we are no longer, as humans, we are no longer in the loop, and it's just the AI producing its own thing. And maybe we are um, curating that, um, that what comes out of the AI. So we're, we're basically selecting from an almost infinite supply of uh, whether that's audio pieces or back pieces, uh, pieces by Bach, or it's uh, visual pieces where the AI is just generating stuff and it's up to us to select these pieces. Yeah. So yeah, um, I, I, I was talking to a Japanese calligrapher a few years back and he said this system is the same in calligraphy. When they learn it, they, they talk about shu hari. Shu is basically you with the master and basically replicating what the master does. Ha is is going a bit over that and basically making variations on what the master does. And I think Ri is the level where you extend what the master does and go beyond what the master has taught you. Um, and I think it's a really nice way of thinking, of looking at what the AI can can give us right now and what it's still, what we're still expecting it to give. And how does, um, how, does the, how do the, the two AIs you interact with during the performance uh, influence your actions, your decision during the performance? Well, uh, that's more a question for Andrew, I guess. Uh, my part wasn't really uh, interacting with uh, the AI. Uh, also, in my live coding environment, I have the same thing as Andrew. Um, I use it to um, really uh, create variations on uh, on ideas that I have. So I also have the feeling that it's a sort of uh, AI which I'm uh, um, having a conversation with. Um, I'm making suggestions in, in between a sort of uh, uh, environment that is really like uh, limited. Um, so it comes up with ideas that I can use. And so uh, I'm interacting with, with those ideas and changing the ways uh, I think, uh, like uh, Predix said, like a curator. So it's like this is helpful for me to use. Um, Andrew uh, uses like uh, the melodies that uh, one of the AIs is coming up with and making l the most interesting parts that we noticed was when they play together actually. Uh, what we noticed uh, from the program we are using is like a Magenta module and uh, it's trained to behave like Mozart in a bit, <laughs> <laughs> which was not very uh, useful in the way that, that we were aiming to do something in the in that kind of area of Mozart's, but but uh, yeah. we we could uh, use it uh, by transforming it in another direction, so it was useful for us anyway. Yeah, it was it was useful. If we say like the the, the AI, if you, we we talk, we're talking about like the, the machine machine learned uh, part, which was trained by by uh, the music of Mozart, which is actually uh, we have the feeling that it's. Um, also, it's, it's a particular style we're playing in, and this style is heavily influenced by uh, machines, actually. So, actually, we want to sound like machines. <laughs> that's, yeah. the, that's the whole point, actually. So, it's, uh, it's, it's like a crazy loop to, to get that. It, it's like, it seems like a bit pointless to train a, uh, a, uh, a neural network to sound random computerized. It's that, so that was the was the thing. Like my, my, my the, the things that I've been programming was uh, uh, um, a one to one basis. It's it's my input, so it will sound like me in an altered, mutated way, and this is what I was what I wanted. So so I actually I made something with a with a specific. Um, as an intention. Uh, with, yes, and also with a specific sound in mind or something. And so and then comes the AI, which. <laughs> 
<laughs> which does things which he learned from Mozart. <laughs> but in this context, I mean, sometimes it was like in the in the last part where I was playing like more the 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 clave clave symbol uh, like sound. Then I then I started the AI and I was like, no, <laughs> come on, stop. You know, so uh, that's that's the thing. So so that was like, um, uh, and then like also Dago said, we had some moments in the rehearsals where when we started playing together. Then, then it was really like really nice because then you could feel the difference because when I when the 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 naive AI my own AI was uh, actually I, I know what to expect actually uh, it, I know it's gonna sound a little bit the same and and just shift my melodies but then when I was playing in duet with the AI then something I really didn't play came up and this is really inspiring and I think this this is like the kind of feedback loop uh, which which transcends what you can uh, expect from the from the system and I think that's a really interesting thing which are but but as we speak it's it's like we, we say like it's a toddler like our little rob it's a toddler i mean it's it's mm -hmm. he's very powerful like you say like yes and also uh, i might uh, like to add something uh, we started with the idea to use a different kind of ai system so that we could train our model Mm -hmm. But uh, it was really bleeding edge, just ready, uh, made by some universities. Um, and um, they stopped working on it uh, during the summertime, and I expected to use it right away, which was a <laughs> bit like uh, too positive from my side, I guess. And um, so mm -hmm. we were aiming to train our own robot, not like Mozart, but more like something else we would uh, suggest. Um, but we didn't have the opportunity to make it work. So voilà. I, I think also it's a lesson in like the, the more complex the AI becomes, the less playable it becomes. It's, it's, it sort of helps to understand what's going on behind the scenes to be able to influence it. If it's too much like a black box, the, um, the system becomes very difficult to control. Also, it doesn't know what which inputs trigger what output and then having that in a live setting it makes it actually harder if it really wants to turn it into mozart then yeah you <laughs> you're fighting the ai much more than you're trying to play together yes, exactly. yeah it's it's like a like a player who also always wants to go and do its drum solo or something it's like no stop just come back and <laughs> play together with the band not just do your own thing yeah, yeah. yeah. so ai's are stubborn that's what we're learning <laughs> oh yeah yeah definitely <laughs> Um, still related to this performance, um, well, I, it's, there's clearly um, a crescendo of complexity. Um, the, the sound gets very textured, very multi-layered, then it dives in very um, dreamy-like atmospheres, so very dense and hypnotic, then it's back. Uh, so my question here is, is there any of you uh, guiding in these changes of moods and colors? Uh, is the bot lead leading? Who is leading? Well, we, we, we don't have a leader. We're like a cooperative uh, company. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but we, we aim for music we like. Uh, so when we, when we try to code or, or, or program and, and we discuss, well, uh, uh, well, the machines are already uh, performing some, some music and then we can discuss, oh, we would like to have more of this of that and the colors. Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, it's a mutual uh, thing that we try to do. So there's not really a leader, but we, we enjoy the idea of getting to a certain level of involvement between machines and that they start producing a lot of stuff themselves yeah. so that we can just take uh, a drink and discuss it while they are performing yeah. and uh, so we have a little bit rest and try to decide where which planets to fly to yeah we had the, we had the image of a of a like a cooking a cooking session where you have like a, a, a some fires and there's some there's uh, some soup there and there's some sauce over there and just it's like it starts uh, like uh, bottle uh, like uh, very like, organic like cooking like yeah. very organic mm -hmm. and um, and also we're very yes fortunate as musicians that that we we've been uh, uh, music is or, or the uh, playing a, a particular also I think it's every kind of music but uh, for us like as jazz musicians you, you can get to the point that everything seems to fit together and this is actually a uh, yes let's say it how it is it's a transcendental experience it's not something you can quantify or something no, no. It's, ju it's just like this flow is mm -hmm. something where everything fits together and I think uh, as uh, children
component of our time, we, we, we are searching with things that are here to get to this feeling because maybe the the old ways maybe they are we we're also searching for, for something new and then and then i think it's really interesting to as as musicians to to become on a on a on a flow mm -hmm. where things just happen and i think that's also it's it's uh, i think that's transcendental to ai or something is because we don't know what's happening we're like we're looking at each other and we're like okay yes yes okay let's push it a little bit more and we, we don't have to say words for that it's like okay, we really get we along in that way because I, we, I think we come from a really uh, similar background yes which is not really uh, something we often uh, uh, discover with uh, with our colleagues yeah. And uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, some uh, patterns we recognize yes, that's, uh, true, that's yes. really mutual, and that it's about. <laughs> you see some, some uh, like uh, Frederick told me, like you you throw some clay to the wall, and then you have to see some images you want to to carve out of it. It's like a sculpture, and 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 luckily we we, we uh, it's very easy for us to see the same image. Yes, sort mm -hmm. of. Yeah. Yeah, I found that beautiful. We were talking about it beautiful during the performance that you see that there's this really rough material that gets added into the mix at some point. I think you call it sirens or police. Yeah, the, uh, the police the sirens. Police, uh, or, I don't know. It was from like uh, you know this CCB uh, car. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah cool. <laughs> and then and then it's very harsh and it's very in, uh, out there. And then you 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 see that you're you're shaping it. You're it becomes part of this mixture. It gets a bit more rounded off and it, it mm -hmm. sort of integrates into this mix and then dissolves into this um, other pattern. Yeah, it's really nice to see. Yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, well, then um, we're zooming out from the performing itself. Uh, and my next question is uh, about what does an AI learn? Um, like what does it takes from the learning process? And <laughs> as we were saying earlier, does an AI get it the way that a human can get it? Uh, can we, you know, have a... I mean, we have uh, many senses, of course, that we rely upon uh, when to perceive and to learn about the world. Uh, can I, an AI mimic that or have something similar or the analogic? The analog yeah, thing? so I, I see that a lot. So the, the black box uh, image really works, I think, for AI because at some point you have to almost trust that the AI has understood what you think it has understood and 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 sometimes it's completely wrong. I think Google did a research when they took ImageNet, which is a really famous trained uh, image network, neural network, and they tried to ask it, like, okay, what do you now actually see? And things like Deep Dream, for example, came out of that. But, um, for example, if they asked, like, a halter, which is what weightlifters use, if they asked, like, what is it? what do you think it sees? It, it not only saw the halter, but also part of the arm attached to it, because every picture of that is also with the arm attached to it. So for the AI, those two things were, were one, there's, it's like a unified thing, and we don't see it that way. So it's learning from, uh, from one, from a two-dimensional perspective. It's not actually perceiving that in 3D, but then also it... It doesn't know which part actually belongs to it and which part is not belonging. Maybe it takes all its time uh, examining the noise around it or the background around it, where, whereas that's completely not part of the whole thing. And um, we were talking about dead metal music, for example. There's a stream of dead metal, mu endless dead metal music that gets learned. And we were also thinking, like, if if you have an AI and um, you train it on an album of I don't know Metallica or whatever group. Is, is that enough? Is everything inside of that album, inside of that CD, is that enough to actually be able to, to train the whole system? And I don't think so, because there's this entire context that it's missing. Um, and like, do you get it? I, get I was thinking part. of the, the, the teenager who talks to his mom, like, mom, you don't get it. You don't <laughs> get this music. And it's the, the same thing here. The eye doesn't really get it. It just gets the album and takes it at face value doesn't really understand what the music is or what the time spirit was and and that's sometimes it can feel a little bit soulless because it doesn't know actually what what goes out outside of the world it's basically it has blinders on and it's only looking at that part mm -hmm. and do you think that that thing that is missing can be taught well <laughs> We're trying, right? We're giving it more and more information. The latest models for text generation now are trained on the entire internet. 
um, that helps, but it also means that it's going to take over our biases, which are inherent. Um, the fact that it's a very uh, Western white male bias, the whole, the whole AI that we train, and that's an extremely problematic in, in trying to train that. So again, it's learning from its environment, but maybe it's there, it's also learning too much. Like, and then it's, it's going to have all that moral issues that we as humans also have. It's going to yeah. just take over and, and repeat that. Um, so yeah, you can give it more context, but that also causes more issues, I think. Oh, the life experience is complexity. Well, yeah, yeah, it's not really a life experience, right? It's 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 learning from a certain point in time. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm really wondering if we go 20 years in the future and we still have these old AI models that we trained, if it's still trying to say, oh, Trump is president and hopefully he's no longer president then. But <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if, if he keeps like... Uh, um, gaining new knowledge as we do through our life experiences or if it's going to be stuck with generating Mozart and back until infinity because that's what it's learned in the beginning so yeah I don't I don't know it, it for me it's super fascinating but it's almost like we also have to do this opposite movement of unlearning certain things that we don't consider important and those are really tough questions like which parts do we consider important and valid and which parts do we consider unethical so, mm -hmm. so. and again uh, who defines who the we is yes uh, because yes again it's the we it's a eurocentric or anyway north of the world yeah, uh, it's absolutely problematic right yeah. now i think yeah and uh, there are so many examples of people trying to game ai algorithms that are used for example in grading uh, essays uh, for children where uh, well, you have students in school and their essay gets graded by an AI, so uh, the, es the essay is no longer read by the professor, it's too much work, so the AI sort of gives it a grade. And students have learned to game that system by introducing more keywords and basically keyword spam, saying, okay, here's all the names that you probably <laughs> expect, and now the scores keep higher and higher, but the essay is just garbage because it's just basically spam that you're generating, but you, you know that the AI is going to react positively to it. So that's, a, I think, a very negative feedback loop, but it's mm -hmm. something that we see as, as the moment that AI gets introduced into our society as, 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 as grading us, as basically giving us a score instead of we giving the AI a score. Sounds like Facebook algorithm. <laughs> so it is. That's, that's what they use, right? I mean, um, yeah. um, you were talking about biofeedback, for example, like, okay, let's attach an EEG sensor to your brain. And I think um, Facebook is that is that sensor that's basically tracking our emotions, but just by how we react and then giving us more of that and sort of ex uh, amplifying these emotions and making them stronger and stronger and stronger. So, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely not just a positive thing, no. Definitely not. Uh, so, uh, from this, I mean, I really would like to keep uh, zooming out uh, and um, and ask you all of you, this question is for all of you, um, how um, in the scope of your very different researches um, and, you know, the different art forms, different styles, different backgrounds, different applications, what... What is the role of AI f for you individually? Uh, and how, especially the question is, how do you think that your role as artists and uh, creatives uh, can be enhanced by it and can enhance it? You know, in all this complexity, what's the role of the well, artist community? Uh, I, I think, uh, like, uh, uh, AI is assisting uh, humans to um, to work with uh, uh, to, to do boring stuff like uh, if you're a producer and you're in your software sometimes you're cutting up samples or sometimes you end up doing uh, having to do 50 times the same thing that this AI can assist you in making uh, these uh, these operations and these and some maybe not decisions but mostly operations like suggest them like I can do this for you and so we can have more freedom to focus on the on the artistic side of things and not so much the technical side of things because we've been uh, we've been all uh, uh, sitting 
on our computer trying to make art uh, and uh, and ending up like uh, doing a uh, like a, a, a uh, feels like an office job. An office job sometimes. It's yes. not all fun. And no. But some some of the fun parts we like to see uh, increased. Eh? Yes, that's it. And so also you were talking about like this uh, this text uh, learn thing that I, I can imagine that mm. if if you can code a program just by I want a program that opens this program and search for that and then makes if you can type to a computer like that a little bit like yes like space odyssey I guess like HAL 2000 and <laughs> so so he can assist you in in, in, in uh, so you don't have to 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 deal with the boring things I think that's a really interesting uh, interesting thing and also a, uh, a thing we saw was like a sample browser so so we have so many samples and now all samples are getting or, or some samples uh, or there are cloud-based services so you have access to millions of samples so how do you how do you find your way in that and so an AI can assist you like if you say like okay I'm searching for a snare drum which should be a, a little bit uh, in that style or here is a, a an example search me 10 other snares which are a little bit similar or something I think AI in this in this data driven world where there's so much data it can help us um, find our way in in this in this ever expanding uh, mm -hmm. virtual world yeah. this make me, make me think of a conversation that we had Frederick uh, where you brought up uh, this difference between the a template system and a costume made system uh, in which um, would you like to uh, yeah expand a bit on that it's, yeah yeah I, th I think it's about curation a little bit I think if we feed it with all samples everything can easily start sounding the same thing which which might be okay for some applications, but I think the most interesting aspects of AI, and it's something and, uh, that you also uh, mentioned, Dago, is that you take AI and you feed it with your own stuff. You feed it with your own um, samples, your own um, research, your own images, for example, in image generation, and then you create, you let the AI be based on that. So you give it, again, it has a very limited view of the world, but the interesting part is that it's your part of the world that it can experiment within that part of the sandbox that you think is interesting in that sense it's really i think augmenting not everybody's creativity but your creativity because you understand the system and you sort of have this expectation of what comes out there so i think ai really works really well if it's not this black box uh, anymore but if it's um maybe as simple as possible i um where we can understand what's going on behind the scenes we know how the system works and we have some control over it not mm -hmm. in the sense of like um yeah not in an evil sense but more in the sense of that that we we sort of have expectations of what the output can be and and it can still surprise us it might still go a little bit outside of these bounds and get, generate new inspiration for us um but we the things that we feed it are are things that we like um, <laughs> I did this experiment <laughs> with uh, with uh, Jukebox, which is a new AI from OpenAI, where they generate music. And we, I was working with uh, Marco Siciliano on this, generating music. And for some reason, whatever I put in, we were working with 90s techno music. Um, it always went to Western music because it, it didn't. It always wanted to make like a Western a spaghetti Western music <laughs> uh, or or like country songs. Or, but, but I like it. You can see it just completely go bonkers after like 12 seconds or something it just went its own way and this is like off in the distance and did its own thing and while that's funny and it's uh, it can generate inspiration it's much less controllable so i think we we are now at a stage where we know what ai can do but we want to sort of take it back to our own studio to our to our own practice and basically use it for things that we are interested in and have a bit of control over it instead of just yeah generating fun tweets or memes mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. and uh, this somehow um, this, this way of you were saying that it would be better if it was simple the, the, the simpler the better uh, that's somehow also very much tied with your work and with the, one of the directions of your research that goes very much into the direction of accessibility of uh, these AI tools no? yeah so there are two aspects I think one is um, understanding what the AI thinks, uh, mm -hmm. which is the example of the halter that I gave, is trying to visualize what the AI thinks. Um, 
And the other thing I think is democratization of these AI tools because they're still very use, uh, difficult to use. I heard you drop the word virtual box, but for people who are not familiar, <laughs> Uh, it basically means that you give it a container that it can play in that a completely, almost its own PC that's completely set up to do its thing because it doesn't run on your PC. It runs only in this very specific machine and you can't touch it or everything breaks. I think we need to go beyond that where it can just be um, something that's easy to install, easy to use, accessible to everybody with, without having like a mathematics back background or understanding everything that goes on. Um, and then also be able to run on everybody's machine, ideally open source. Um, that's, I think, is really important. That's that's currently not happening. AI is so, for me as, as well, even when I know the libraries and I can program, understanding all the things and it, they break every six months because a new version comes out and nothing works anymore, that's... Um, very frustrating to build something on. So you see people just immediately jumping off and then it sort of peters out because nobody can can sustain it anymore. It doesn't work anymore or it's too expensive to use or whatever. So uh, that, that to me would be, I think, the next breakthrough where AI becomes much more accessible to everybody and where it's easy to use, it's easy to understand and you really have a feeling of, of, of control being able to use it in any kind of practice. Yeah, and this democratization would, of course, then um, uh, impact uh, the, the, the artistic practices of artists like you or visual artists or whoever artists and creative that would be interested to approach this type of technology, no? What do you think? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's really interesting because for now, we have the feeling that uh, we are interact uh, that our, uh, like, uh, the, uh, the beauty of the code... Uh, is, is something that's really inspiring us. It's something which we cannot play. Uh, it, it can do things which no human can play. And for now, we have the feeling that the AI is actually coming behind. You have to feed them things you have already done, and then it spits out some things which are a little bit like we did. But it's not coming up with something new. Mm -hmm. it's not, so we are still finding inspiration in uh, in random, in, in controlled random, conditional mm -hmm. random stuff like that. So that's more interesting to us. So that would be. So I think we're not there yet for for like the creative, uh, like creative music on stage. It's uh, it's it, it's still. But, on, yes. but on, on if I may, uh, on that point, I think the combination would be really interesting because we have those things. I like to call frozen random. Eh? We let it do random things until we say, yes, that's what I meant between certain certain uh, boundaries. But then we could uh, have the AI learn which which uh, artistic decisions we, we choose. Eh? Like we want this, this kind of random seats we use. And then uh, for us, it would be too complicated to remember all the parameters we're using in all those different instruments. But that's something an AI could really be very good at. So I think the combination of those two would be would be something that might be a winning team. That's it, because I think really, like when I was playing with uh, with, with the AI, it's uh, you can feel the potential. It's like uh, it can. It's like okay, it's 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 giving me something I did not play, and I actually like it. But mm -hmm. then you also feel like okay but he has no sense of knowing that i was actually liking this particular mm -hmm. point and if that would be uh then it could uh, learn then yeah. yes and it could learn from that on a personal basis mm -hmm. then this would be my uh, my accompaniment friend you yeah. know it's like it could be like a, a, like an enhancement not re maybe it's too much to say like another musician but still yeah maybe it can evolve to be that but it can start like a, a companion like uh, to, to, uh, for now, I was able with my own system to play chords, and I really didn't know which chord it would be, but it was a chord which would be uh, harmonious with what I was playing before. And this is already like this, because then you have the, the same thing that if you're playing with, with another, uh, another m human musician, he gives you something which you didn't expect, but it sounds good because he's playing with you. And this is the excitement you need to to go on further and to be uh, to have inspiration and uh, to be inspired by it? Mm -hmm. And I really think it, you can feel the potential. It's uh, yes, it's very exciting mm -hmm. for that. <laughs> I was I was thinking that that one of the 
partner is then excited, that's you, but we need a way that to make the computer excited about that as well, because <laughs> it's just generating stuff and he's, he doesn't know, like he's like, oh, okay, I'll generate another one, but it would be cool. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah I no, feel it as well. Yeah, yeah, this yeah, is yeah, going like on. Coaching, yeah. That would uh, be cool. Computer, yes. yeah. <laughs> and it's cool, uh, co the cooling starts going faster. Like <laughs> <laughs> That, uh, that would be the point in which the, uh, the AI get it, exactly, yeah. Yeah. as we were saying earlier. Um, so, um, what do you think, if you think so, about uh, how the artist community can have an impact on how AI will evolve in the future, in the next future? Do you think that there is something that can influence the bigger course of things. Well, I like I would like it to be that way in <laughs> because you see a lot of stuff happening with AI and then like we discussed Facebook and then there was some uh, AI they they let loose on the internet and it became very uh, discriminating Extremist person. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. So that's the scary stuff and I like the idea that we as artists have uh, an input in AI and that we uh, in, in in how it evolves and that we l that we are we are looking for something we find very beautiful and hope that something uh, the AI community or, or or like the entity that AI could be uh, would have some of that kind of seeds as well, and not only the uh, the the ugly stuff you see. Yeah, because I mean, artists uh, have always had more or less consciously this role of of being a sort of lens through which society reflects on itself, and the artists take something elaborate it in their own way and produce an output that it's presented to the world more or less. Um, I also think it's very important it. because it's, it's, it's like with uh, making a musical instrument. It's not the one who makes the instruments who is playing the music on it. So it's, it's the, and it's, uh, so we're a little bit, we're building our own tools. So we're a little bit like we're, we're uh, reaching towards uh, instrument building, uh, but, but we're not programmers. So we're still, I'm, I'm, uh, we're musicians, and we we, we try to be uh, technical and, and try to to uh, have uh, to to expand our possibilities. But I think it's really important that the the ones who are making the AI should not be the ones feeding the AI. Maybe we should, uh, we uh, it it should be also it could be an artistic endeavor to to make to make the AI do something really pleasing because maybe the programmer is not an expert on uh, aesthetics. Yeah. Yeah. I <laughs> I think in some way that, that artists can form the, the conscience of a society, basically critiquing what goes on in society. And uh, as with any art, using AI or creative AI um, to critique the issues that we have with AI, the social issues and the social political issues that, that come up when you use AI in a wrong way as as a way of uh, grading candidates for a job, for example, based on uh, um, a recommendation letter or whatever, then that can be that can be the raw material that we as artists can use and and to indicate that something's wrong, either through humor or uh, through very uh, very uh, raw critique that we that we provide in, on this or uh, yeah like a performance or so. It, I think there as an artist we. Uh, we can en engage with AI and even with pre-trained AI because then then that black box actually for us as artists becomes the material that we can use to indicate that it's not all uh, neutral, whatever that means. Okay, so uh, we still have about 15 minutes more or less. So I have two last questions for you. Um, the first one is a bit philosophical. And is it, if you think that there is a need for consciousness in order to have creativity? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, I, th I, think, I think one side at least should be conscious while we're making creative <laughs> works. Um, we can't both be unconscious and uh, make art. So um, <laughs> th the way that I see it is that the AI can be unconscious and uh, we can be the conscious one, basically looking at the work and saying if it's good or not, because we, there has to be critique of the work. You can't just accept everything and put it in a book and just be finished. Like uh, you make a selection, you curate the work that the AI comes up with, and then you maybe you tweak the AI. So 
in that sense, there is a conscious process and a conscious effort going on. Um, what I think is interesting is also maybe switching the roles where we are actually generating almost like randomness and it's the AI's job to, ba to basically provide critique. Um, mm -hmm. There's this uh, interesting work uh, by Dries and Verstappen where they take a, uh, just pebbles that they get from the beach and they let them be scanned by um, an AI that does face detection and all the pebbles that look like faces they select out and that becomes the work so it's basically all pebbles that look like faces so it's the AI doing the selection no longer the, the human doing the selection they're just cleaning stones basically that's their job um, so it, I think at least at least one side should be conscious maybe not both sides that's not ne really necessary but this this idea of like uh, it has to be conscience or like it has to be an um, complete AI system that understands the world and something. Uh, there's a lot of things that, that are in, in this interspace between that's, that are really interesting already. It doesn't have to be like fully complete yet before we can actually use it. Andrew? Well, uh, you said it's a, it's a philosophical question. So uh, what is consciousness? So uh, if, if, if it's, uh, if it, W w do we know wha what it is? Like, do, uh, are we conscious? At 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 what extent? What I what is it? What is the definition? There are many definitions. We really don't know. So I think it's uh, it, uh, that's also very exciting. Maybe uh, the quest for uh, for a consciousness, an artificial consciousness, will lead us uh, closer to understanding what consciousness is. Because we are saying, like, do you need to be conscious? But are you conscious? We are conscious of some things. But this consciousness is ever expanding. We are learning new things. The AI will learn new, thi uh, new things. So the, the AI is conscious of what I'm putting in there. He's conscious of my MIDI notes. Mm -hmm. So he has a, a sort of limited consciousness. But to say my consciousness is unlimited would be really a weird statement because my consciousness on this moment is also, I hope to expand it ever more. But at this time, it's really limited. So yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah, I think it's a really it's really deep. If you're talking about consciousness, we we don't know what consciousness is actually. So is it awareness? Uh, but and and to what extent? Mm -hmm. So we don't know. So and and I think that's the really nice edge of the artificial intelligence because it when we were working on this project we also had like very philosophical uh and even yeah ethical but at a very philosophical uh point like okay but what what are we doing and, and what, what is this thing so it, it takes us to uh to very um um even theosophical questions actually in yeah. the sense that the humans are be playing god like hating what do you mean by yes but we are talking about these things but we don't know what w we have no definition of these things what is what is this to you what is consciousness for you yeah uh, of course i mean it's so yes it's we we, but we, we have to have this discussion because we're talking about artificial intelligence but we we don't have definitions about those things it's like psychology yes we are researching the psyche but what is the psyche we don't know what it is but we need it we need this research but we're not we don't know what we're talking about so and this is and this is I think this is the main point of life. And now we are doing this with this technology because we're in we're in this technolo uh, technological uh, society. But th those are the questions we were uh, researching with the means we had for for a time immemorial. This this uh, this uh, Homo sapiens sapiens has not changed. We have the same brain capacity as the ancient Romans or uh, the Egyptians or the Indian. Uh, Indian people so so we are we have the same hardware and we have the same questions but we have other uh, another culture mm -hmm. but we are we are still asking these same questions and so and 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 to get that that oh we're still asking these same questions I think that's that's really valuable it is and of course uh, the development of this type of technology help us and uh, works a bit of as a mirror, no? Through which we, yes. we learn also about ourselves. Um, okay, we went very far <laughs> in that direction. Um, we have um, a question from the audience, uh, something in the, the very opposite direction. Um, it's for you, Dago and Andrew, and 
the question if you use uh, if you use a specific method every time which uh, in turn you also learn by having session and what would mean that not only the machine is learning or if you start and progress always in different ways. Do you have a specific methodology or not? If it's uh, improved uh, every time? And if so, are the results still always different? Um, to the last sentence, yes, it's always different. Um, but we use kind of techniques that we um, have practiced before, so we know the, some actions will have some success. In what degree, we don't know, but we can adjust really quickly to come up with new uh, directions. So it's a very flexible system that we use, but we're not um, aiming for, and we cannot aim for the same results because it will, there are so, much, so many different kind of parameters that are generated. And also we use a lot of random in it. So the computer suggests and comes up with a lot of stuff we are not making up. So it's really a, a joint effort. So it's actually almost impossible to do the same thing twice. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and for me, I'm, I'm uh, using uh, my techniques, which also uh, uh, give different results every time, even if I do really exactly, almost exactly the same, if I just add, uh, alter one note, the whole system will react in a different way. But I do have uh, sound sets. Like, I know that this bass sound will go well with uh, this sound which I use for the chords. And so, and then, and this library is ever expanding, like the, the, the sounds I know that are uh, working. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, uh, maybe the, 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 not the structure, but how do you say it? Like the texture, the texture will be similar but the uh, the exact music will always be different uh, a little bit in the same way as playing a jazz standard it's like the team will be the same mm. but the uh, yeah, the, exactly. the everything which com which comes after like the solos and stuff like that will always be different. different yeah for my part also it makes it different now in the live coding community we know something like the mexican rules and it means like uh, it's like a mystic thing uh, no it's just uh, starting from scratch from like a white uh, uh, canvas and you start coding from nothing and then uh, you you start using uh, techniques from your memory and, and, and then it will be uh, even more completely different every time now playing with Andrew, that would be. Uh, I noticed uh, that it would be uh, not the right approach because it takes too long, too long of time to to make something interest, interesting for us together. So, uh, of course, if if I would render the same code every time, uh, it would produce something very similar, but uh, still, then with with uh, with the random uh, possibilities, it would be uh, would be a variation uh, very easily. Okay, we have another uh, well, extremely interesting question from uh, the audience that is following us online. You talked a lot about how AI can enhance, inspire, etc., from an artist, producer's, and coder's point of view. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, what about the way the music is consumed from the point of view of the end user that we almost all are? For instance, how the use of AI in music streaming, distribution, etc., could impact listeners' music taste, diversity, and or curiosity. I think that's already happening. If you uh, have a look at SoundCloud, they suggest the tracks you are supposed to like every week. That's uh, probably uh, AI decision uh, which tracks uh, are suitable for you. So it already is uh, um, having uh, an impact on the music you like or listen to. So I think it's already happening. Uh. Also, and also on a deeper level, it's actually, I, I forgot the name of the of the system. It was my sister-in-law who, who gave me this link. Uh, and it was uh, a system which, uh, where you could also, it, it was like the music was a little bit scripted. When, when it was, uh, let's say, if it's evening and you put it on uh, and you want it uh, to, uh, and, and let's say you have somebody over for dinner, it would repeat some parts of the song a little bit more or would change subtle the tempo a little bit we would do some variations and i think that's uh, actually it's it's really it's really interesting because the the the, the music is not just like a like a, a, a thing fixed in stone yeah. but it's 
is becoming more fluent and, and more uh, organic, actually. That's something we discussed. Eh? Actually, uh, I read a paper, I think it was uh, something of uh, the, the founder of KLF, and he, and he mentioned the death of recorded music. And it means there is so much, uh, and I find it a very interesting approach, because there is so much uh, music put out uh, daily on SoundCloud. Uh, um, like in the 80s, every week there would be like 20 new albums of the things you liked and, and it was really like okay you can dig it you can you can check it out uh, but now every day it's like 200 new albums and you cannot uh, really check them all so the, the so the interesting next thing could be that there is an ai that would generate the music in uh, in combination with mute you are in in i think in uh, it will be a future project. Uh, it will be not for next week, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, then you no longer have like the search for all this uh, stuff in, in like these millions of albums put out every every day. And I must say, the more music you listen to uh, over the years, it, it you get a bit more critical. And a lot of those uh, albums, I think. I, I don't have the time, and nor it. Uh, it That's it's it's and there's also uh, like a, a program. Uh, uh, it's uh, made uh, also uh, by uh, uh, Imic, and it's uh, it it um, it tracks your uh, movements, and then it will generate uh, or shuffle your playlist on the BPM which you are ta uh, uh, walking to. So so things like that, like also like uh, like 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 we discussed, like uh, helping you choose the right thing, like uh, zooming out in this pile of. Uh, of uh, information of music which is coming out every day mm -hmm. in an ideal situation when there's no uh, no ads uh, uh, campaigns going on and and things which are the evil the, the 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 evil side of things like the youtube algorithms and facebook but if it's if it's kept clean then it could really help you find the music where you're uh, looking for yeah and and yes and i think th that will happen it's just like we have to install things uh, which uh, make a barrier because it's an easy spot to plug your thing in, and this, and if it becomes advertising, then I, I, th I really think this is we, we. It's like this right now, and I don't think it's a good situation. Fadek, well, yeah, one minute. The, yeah, to wrap we it are. Up. We are. Um, <laughs> We noticed that the music industry is also trying to game itself in the sense that it's trying to put out music that fits into that recommenda recommendation algorithm that is actually exactly. analyzing the music and understanding what, what is going to be the next hit or the mm -hmm. next thing. And by doing it, it's basically self-reinforcing. It's basically saying to itself, oh, this will be the next hit because somebody else used an AI to actually figure out what that system is, is <laughs> looking at. So it's it's... In that sense, I, I believe it, if it comes out of commercial interests, then we will get more into that. And you get this idea of the, the filter bubble where you're just listening to music that the system knows is safe and that you're always listening to, which means you're listening to, I don't know, 10 albums over and over on repeat forever. Um, I think also the AI sometimes needs to take a risk and say, okay, I don't know if he's going to like it, but I'm just going to put it out there and we'll see what happens. <laughs> that would be awesome. That sounds like an interview I saw from Frank Zappa, who told like uh, the situation in, in the end of the 60s, uh, this is decision of the record companies, they, they saw all these hippies with this weird music and they didn't understand it, but it was like, oh, put it out anyway, because there are probably people who are going to buy the records. And then in the 80s, something different happened when the executives came in and they thought, to, to oh, know the what the, the good hippies, music was. The hippies became yeah, executives. Became it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> they were first the guys who bring, brought in the coffee, and then they had uh, got involved in the decision-making of what was good music. Mm -hmm. And so I think it would be a very good situation that there is no judge in uh, who says what the good music actually is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. To give the AI a little bit of room to breathe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, or, or, or the AI on a personal level, so it serves you uh, personal, but but not with commercial interest. So keep it mm -hmm. clean of uh, of the of those kind of inputs, and then it's like okay, you have an, a tendency towards like uh, experimental classical music or or something, and so it will guide you more towards that kind of uh, kind of music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as, as I think, as long as you. As it, it its intentions, whatever that means, are are pure, <laughs> and it it sort of allows you to explore more than than just keeping you on that specific safe spot yeah, where exactly. it knows like this is the top of the mountain and I can't get off because yeah. Mm -hmm. 
he's safe there. He's he, he likes the all yeah. the albums, but I don't know how to get to the next peak and basically yeah introduce you to new music. Yeah, that would be that would be awesome. Yeah, I go all in for that. Great. Uh, so I think that we are running out of time. So we're going to close on that. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to be here with us today. Thank you for thank you. performing. Thank you. thank you for this super interesting talk. And uh, well, thank you for, to you for being with us and uh, enjoy the rest of Alsa Electronica Festival. Goodbye.
As part of the AI Music Festival 2020, co-organized by Asa Electronica and the European Commission as part of the STARTS program, Open Austria will invite us now to Silicon Valley Garden. Our partners in San Francisco will present the panel In Search of Genius, AI and music inviting experts from Google Magenta, Open AI, and our Asa Electronica Future Lab. Let's hand over the microphone to the moderator, Clara Blume, Head of Art and Science and Technology at Open Austria and President of UNIC in Silicon Valley.
Technology flings us into the future towards efficiency and productivity and speed. What do these achievements give us and what do they strip away? In art, we create our most profound aspirations. We recognize who we are and imagine who we must become. Both art and technology show us our horizons and seek to transcend these limits. Our world teeters on the brink of collapse. To meet this challenge, artists and technologists must come together to imagine, to make, to create. The grid connects these two worlds by fusing their strengths. Because art powers technology. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Are we live and streaming to Linz and the rest of the world? Okay, so welcome everyone to the fourth and final day of the Grid Exposure Art at Technology Days 2020. The last three days have already been immensely stimulating for fascinating individuals and opinions and even some tangible outcomes. So we'll start today with a panel discussion on AI and music. It's part of this year's Art Day Project of AI and its music. some tangible outcomes. So we'll start today with a panel discussion on AI and music. It's part of this year's Art Day Project of AI and its music festival at Kinkos. After that, Gabriel Caprilli and Amy invite the studio to send postcards from the future in a new fashion series hosted by Bill Hall. Happening at the same time is um, the Great Area and the Great Competition Series. Notes, Art and Tech founders recently invite you to join their fascinating, fascinating festival, Universal Basic Income for the Arts. And we'll wrap up this festival with a live music performance by San Francisco local artists Logan and Emily presenting. Our apologies as we are working on our host sound. We will be with you in just a moment.
Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Hello, can anyone hear me? Okay, no bumpers, no bumpers. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> okay, rock and roll. <laughs> I'm just gonna, you know, jump right in this. Um, hello, it's me again. I'm sorry, you must be sick of seeing my face. Um, I actually have a lovely voice, look at that. <laughs> So hi everyone, my name is Clara Bloom. I'm your host today, and I'm sorry for those technical glitches. Um, but here we are, live streaming to all of your homes around the world. As I said, um, I'll be your host today. I'm the curatorial co-director of The Great Exposure, Art, Tech, and Policy Days. Let me just double check. Can everyone hear me still? Okay, perfect. Um, I'm also the head of the Art and Tech Lab at Open Austria in San Francisco and the president of our European Cluster for the Arts unique Silicon Valley organization behind the grid largely responsible for this wonderful festival. In my previous life, though, I was a touring singer and songwriter and pianist. And this is why this panel has gotten me excited for months. It was initially um, scheduled to be part of this year's South by Southwest conference in Austin, Texas. But on Friday, March 13, it finally dawned on me that we would have to reschedule. So now, half a year later, we reconvene and finally make this fantastic panel discussion happening in the framework of the Ars Electronica AI Meets Music Festival and Exposure. And with me today um, is the avant-garde of the AI-generated music sphere. As true trailblazers in their fields, all three panelists uh, have been pioneering transformer models that generate music. They will allow us to peek behind the curtain of their process. We'll talk about the, um, the models, potential, and limitations. And we'll discuss what AI-generated music means for the future of music creation. And with that, uh, my first panelist is Christine Payne. She's a multimodal team manager and member of the technical staff at OpenAI, a San Francisco-based AI research and development company whose mission is to ensure that artificial generated intelligence benefits all of humanity. She's the author of MuseNet and currently work working on AI, OpenAI's next transformer model, Jukebox. She's a Stanford-trained physicist, neuroscientist, as well as a classical-trained pianist. So truly combining the best of art and science. Welcome, Christine. Thank you so much, Clara. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're extremely excited to have you. So Christine, MuseNet is trained to recognize patterns in music, and your transformer model is using the same technology as OpenAI's GPT-2 did to generate the language. So I wonder, how do you train a model to understand music? And what are the differences um, to language? Oh, that's a great question. So 
as far as uh, as far as the transformers model is concerned it's just looking for patterns in a sequence of tokens so as long as you can figure out how to translate the data you have into this sort of sequence uh, you're good to go. The transformers happily happy to train and then generate. So, in fact, I made a short video to explain uh, our two different models. One is MuseNet, which will do tokens in the MIDI world, and the other is Jukebox, which does uh, a more complicated way to do tokens in raw audio. Um, Excellent. Can you go ahead and play the video. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk briefly about two of our recent music models, uh, two different ways to use transformer architectures to generate music. Uh, the first is a model called MuseNet, uh, which we published about a year and a half ago now, and uh, lives in the world of a MIDI representation of music. This means uh, a representation that's capturing when notes turn on and off, what the pitches are, the volume, uh, what instruments are playing, a very event-based kind of notation. It's very much the way composers think of the world. Uh, and the nice thing about it is that it means we're able to capture a fairly long-term musical structure and some of the, the sort of signature um, calls and answers and phrases and, and things that feel very musically satisfying. Our second model, uh, Jukebox, is our more recent model, which we published uh, earlier this spring. And this one actually captures the full uh, raw audio of a sound file. Uh, the neat thing about this is that means we're able to reproduce, say, the sound of a great cellist or even a singer's voice. Um, and we get sort of much more the sense of, oh, this sounds like a real pop song. Um, the trade-off there is that it, it gets much harder to, to kind of get a very long, coherent musical structure. Uh, and I'll play some examples of both so that you'll be able to hear some of that. Um, first, within MuseNet, um, and actually both of these models, we use a transformer architecture to, we train the, that architecture first, and then we're able to turn that into a generator. And you may be familiar with doing this already for text. Um, it's, it's the way GPT-3 worked and, and, uh, and several other um, text-based applications like that. Um, and so here, the, the big thing we have to do is we have to figure out how to translate music into a similar kind of sequential notation. And since MuseNet is already dealing with MIDI files, this isn't too difficult. Um, and the system I ended up with is here I always tell MuseNet first the composer of or the band for the MIDI file. Uh, next, it always sees a token that indicates the set of instruments to expect in that file. In this case, you see here there's a start token because we happen to be at the beginning of the piece. And then we go note by note. Um, so at each moment in time, here the first moment in time, the lower C turns on and then the upper C turns on. And then we have a token that tells us to wait a certain amount of time. Uh, and then at the next moment in time, that lower C turns off and the G turns on at a specific volume and we again wait. Uh, and then of course the G turns off and the E turns on. Uh, and the nice thing about a notation like this is it's fairly concise. This is what uh, the first minute of the first Chopin Ballade looks like. And this is actually a performance by a human uh, pianist. And this notation is capturing all the nuances of timing and of volume and, and all that sort of thing. So it's, it's a very musical representation. And then all we have to do is we, we feed lots and lots of sequences like this uh, into a standard transformer architecture. Uh, and we're able to have a trained model that can generate in many, many different styles. So here are just a few examples. Um, this is asking MuseNet to generate in the style of Beethoven um, and for violin and piano. I'll go ahead and cut that off. Uh, but here again is the same MuseNet model, but now uh, asked to generate jazz. Uh, 
All right, and I'll cut that off again. Uh, so jumping over instead to Jukebox, which is our more recent model. First of all, why is this such a more difficult problem? Um, well, as we saw, MIDI notation and the sort of notation that MuseNet was using um, is a very concise way of looking at music. You're throwing away a lot of information about the details of how the instrument sounds. Certainly, we're totally losing, say, human voices, anything like that. Whereas if you want to uh, deal in raw audio, we really want to save all of that information. Unfortunately, that means sampling extremely frequently. Uh, most uh, audio recordings are either at 22 kilohertz or 44 kilohertz. And even within that, you might have a left channel, right channel. So, so that's talking about, you know, at minimum 44,000 samples per second um, that we need to be able to generate. And if you get any of these wrong, you start to get high-pitched noises. Um, and of course, if you get it long, wrong on a longer time scale, you just end up with, with raw audio that isn't that coherent. So it's really important both to capture the detail and the sort of long-term structure. So in order to do this, um, we came up with a, a relatively complicated uh, set of auto encoders um, to compress the raw audio. So here, I'm not going to get into the details, but we basically end up with three different levels of auto encoders. Uh, at the lowest level, we've barely compressed the signal, and it's, it's very easy to get back to the original raw audio. But at the top level, this is a very, very compressed signal, and this is at the point where we have around 300, 400 tokens per second. Um, unfortunately, unlike MuseNet, where the tokens actually were sort of human interpretable, these ones are entirely learned by this other neural net. So, um, so they no longer have sort of the semantic meaning that we might have wanted, um, but they still do capture a lot of information. And what we end up doing is we then send uh, this series of tokens. We translate many, many pieces into these tokens, and then again, just train a transformer architecture in much the same way that we would train uh, a GPT-3 or, a, or even Usenet, anything like that. Uh, and, and the other nice thing we did was um, we were able to uh, pair the lyrics that we would expect for any given piece of music with that sequence of tokens. And we found that uh, the transformer model is actually able to figure out paying attention to the right place in the lyrics. And in this way, we've made it so that now um, when we turn the model around and generate, we can then feed in any set of lyrics that we want and the model will generate as if our singer is singing these sort of novel lyrics that we feed in. So as an example, this is uh, when we've asked Jukebox to generate Hot Tub Christmas uh, as if it were sung by Frank Sinatra. Uh, and to be clear, these are lyrics that Frank never saw. Um, these were lyrics generated by our GPT-2 model. It's Christmas time and you know what that means. Oh, it's hot tub time. I'm gonna jump across uh, to play that one. It's Christmas time and you know what that means. Oh, it's hot tub time. As I like the tree this year, you'll be a tub. Oh, it's hot tub time, it's Christmas time. As I know of that news, it's my twelve time. All right, I'll cut that off, but please do feel free to, uh, to visit uh, either of our blogs, this openai.com blog, Usenet, or Jukebox um, for more information about these models. Thank you so much. Wow, this is fantastic. It's hot tub time. Um, I've, I'm really looking forward to the Christmas album here. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, That's fantastic. So we'll talk about this um, MIDI versus audio um, approach in a bit um, once I've welcomed all our panelists for now. Thank you so much, Christine. That was an outstanding presentation. You. You'll be back in a couple of minutes. Um, and right now I'd like to welcome our second 
panelists are um, joining us from Linz, Austria, in fact, from this year's Ars Electronica Festival, sending my love back home. Ali Nikrang is key researcher and artist at the Ars Electronica Future Lab. He also has an academic background in both music and technology as a computer scientist trained at the Johannes Kepler University in Linz and trained composer and classical concert pianist at the Mozarteum in Salzburg. He was involved in numerous projects that combine AI and classical music and has recently authored his own transformer model, Ricerca. Welcome, Ali. We don't hear you. Uh, hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry. Um, I love that sound when someone says, can you hear me? And I can hear them. That's that's where I want to go. My microphone for. was just muted. Um, thank you very much for introducing. Um, it's an honor to be here. And uh, thank you very much for having me here. Well, it's our pleasure. I'll jump right in if that's okay with you. Ali, during last year's Ars Electronica Festival, you premiered Mala's Unfinished Symphony 10 um, using Musenet to pick up the comp um, compositional thread where Gustav Mahler left off, so to speak. You specifically said you didn't finish the symphony, you just um, continued it. So now you've trained uh, your own neural network, Ricerca, and I wonder if you were so kind as to walk us through the process of how you compose with an AI. Sure, sure. Um, the idea of Mother Unfinished Project was actually to find out what a powerful uh, AI model like Musenet can do with the theme of the symphony. Because uh, the theme of the symphony is actually very unusual. It begins in only one voice uh, without accompaniment and not even the, the tonality of the theme is uh, clear at the beginning. So. Uh, in other words, it can be seen as a challenge for every AI system to continue that thing. And we use MuseNet and compose a piece of, a piece of music on, uh, based on the theme. Um, and arrange it for the orchestra and perform it with Brooklyn Orchestra Linz, which is uh, located uh, in, here in Linz and is a um, yeah, symphony orchestra. And uh, but maybe I, I, I should also add to it that for me, MuseNet was the first application that uh, was capable of composing music of such quality that it uh, was really very, very difficult uh, to say if it was composed by an AI system or by a human composer. Maybe experts uh, could do that, but uh, not for everybody, I think it was possible. And. Um, it was also the proof that using technologies like transformers or attention mechanism can successfully be used for music generation. Nonetheless, uh, in order to further investigate AI-based uh, based music composition, I have been developing my own AI-based music composition system, which is called Ricerca, as you mentioned before. Um, Ricerca has a quite different architecture than MuseNet, which is actually very interesting from a technological point of view, as we see that uh, the architecture itself doesn't matter so much. So if we have a model that is simply able to learn the long-term dependencies in the data, we have a good start for composing music. I developed several new ideas in Ricerca, including ideas about how to represent musical data in a new way that needs uh, less computational resources. Uh, maybe I should also mention that I am using uh, symbolic musical data. It means MIDI. It's not like a jukebox. And um, my focus uh, by developing Ricerca was also on how to increase models' awareness of melodies and themes that are occurring again and again with and without variations during the piece. Uh, Ricerca is able to focus on two or three themes during the whole piece, which is more similar to how, uh, how um, human composers actually compose music. We don't have more than two or three themes in a piece of music. The rest are variations and occurrences of, uh, of the same structure. And it was difficult before that to, you know, to keep the focus of an AI system limited to two or three themes. It actually has something to do with, uh, with, the, uh, with the way they are learned how to compose music. All what they um, learn during the training is actually to uh, the ability to generate or to predict the next notes given all the previous notes in the piece of music or the next token. And um, of course, they tend, by using this kind of um, um, idea, they tend to, to um, generate uh, always new structures. Uh, 
because they they have a kind of flat um, yeah flat structure to they they learn kind of flat structure, and um, they are not able to really to to repeat a whole segments that um, occurred before that, and. Um, we need special ways in order to focus their attention on, on a particular on particular structures in the um, in a piece of music that we are going to generate. I would like to uh, show you two examples uh, of um, two pieces of music that are composed by um, AI systems. Uh, the first one uh, is. Actually, as a matter of fact, our uh, Mahler unfinished project from last year. I will play maybe 30 seconds of it. And it is uh, it is played by Brooklyn Orchestra in Linz, and uh, the arrangement is um, is uh, done by me. And the next piece is actually generated by Richerka. And I think we can say for both pieces that uh, it is um, almost impossible or very very difficult to say that they are composed by AI systems. So let me share my screen with you. Okay, Ali, mm -hmm. this, yes. this is breathtaking. Wow. I do remember still how it felt to be in that room while the Bergner Orchestra was playing. And I was so profoundly moved. Um, it was really um, a very intense emotional experience. Um, I wonder how this must have felt for you. I mean, seeing your co-composition with NEI in this uh, performed by a world-class orchestra in this setting. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's always a strange feeling if you, uh, you know, if you have a music, if you have a piece of music that is composed by an AI system, and you, you, you see how uh, powerful this this music is, and it is able to trigger emotional responses in in you, and you feel some kind of manipulated by an AI system, but <laughs> on the other hand, you are fascinated of the system. So it's a it's still a strange feeling, actually. 
It is. We'll talk about that feeling in a second and how you're supposed to react <laughs> if, you, if you encounter um, a composition um, by an AI. But for now, um, I'll introduce our third panelist and then we'll have an open discussion about all these questions. So thank you, Ali. Um, so for our last and third panelists, I'd like to welcome Lamton Handrukal, also known as Hanoi. He's an AI research scientist, composer, and cultural technologist. Um, as at Google AI, he co-authored the breakthrough um, Differentiable Digital Signal Processing, short DDSP library with the Magenta team. He has focused on productionizing audio AI to be more inclusive of musical traditions from around the world. And he's created mind-blowing projects to achieve that, that, just that, and we'll talk about them in a minute. Originally from Thailand, Hanoi holds a degree in both applied physics and musical composition from Yale University and a Master of Science from Georgia Tech. Welcome, Hanoi. Hello. Oh. It's hey, so Clara. good to have you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really, really excited to be here too. Thank you very much to Ars Electronica and um, thank you uh, all the other panelists for being here and, and showing some incredible uh, music and machine learning demos. Question um, to kick us off and to maybe create some context to your work. During your AI residency at Google Magenta, your co-authored, as I just said, DDSP, Differentiable Digital Signal Processing. In contrast to MuseNet and Recerca, DDSP, it, much like Jukebox, uses signal processing methods um, to process audio files instead of MIDI. And this is how you train a neural network. In your work also, you've strongly advocated for a more inclusive approach in audio AI that would widen this myopic view that we have on um, always focusing on Western traditions, especially Western musical traditions, in favor of music um, from around the world. And I wonder, does your audio processing method give you a wider access to different musical instruments, sounds, and traditions from around the world in comparison to the scars MIDI files that are available on the internet? Yes, that's a really good question. So uh, DDSP is a very exciting uh, new machine learning technology that combines both traditional signal processing, which is like a subfield of electrical engineering, which has been around with us, you know, since the 1950s. The reason that MP3 works and the reason that, you know, your cell phone can communicate with the, with the cell phone tower and the reason that we have synthesizers, you know, my keyboard in the back here works is because of signal um, processing. But uh, when... So from a technical perspective, DDSP is exciting from, from the ability to combine the old and new together, modern machine learning with traditional signal processing. But from a, a personal point of view and from a cultural perspective, um, it's exciting because when you're in the audio domain, you're no longer limited by the restrictions of notation or the restrictions of MIDI. You can actually just train on the audio directly, which opens up the ability to train machine learning models on many different kinds of sounds. So we can move beyond just instruments from the Western uh, classical domain, but actually expand machine learning to work with sounds of, for example, animals and nature sounds, which I'll show in a second, but also expand it to musical instruments from other parts of the world from India, from Thailand, from Southeast Asia, from East Asia, from West Africa, all the way to South Africa. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit of some depth uh, sound demos to show exactly how that works and exactly how DDSP uh, does this. And uh, I'm just going to share my screen to do that. Boom. Okay. All right. And I'm going to hit present. Great, so I'm here uh, representing the Magenta team. Uh, who is Magenta? What is Magenta? Uh, Magenta is an open source research project exploring the role of machine learning in the creative process. Uh, a lot of our work is focused on music. We work both in the MIDI symbolic uh, domain, as you've seen from the um, other projects uh, from our panelists, as well as in the audio domain. So for this particular uh, section, I'm going to uh, just focus a little bit on DDSP and show you some examples from this work, which is uh, was just open source uh, early this year. So DDSP is an open source library that fuses interpretable signal processing with modern neural networks. So what exactly uh, does this mean? Before we start, let me just show you a video of what it can do. Where the boo doo, where the boo doo, 
Puera puru, puera puru, puera putu, pau au au au. So pretty cool, right? Uh, what happened there was I sang and you know obviously pretended to play saxophone, and then what happened was we took that voice input and gave it to a DDSP model that was trained on a saxophone sound. And it was just one of my colleagues playing tenor saxophone. It had nothing to do with what I was singing. And the model was able to take what it had learned about the saxophone, but re-render my voice as a saxophone. And you can hear that it follows all the little intricacies of my singing, all the little modulations that I do. Let's just have a listen to it again. So what's really exciting there is you can actually hear the details of the saxophone being played. I don't know if you can hear it on your end, but you can hear the flaps. You can hear the breathing of the saxophone, which the model has put in. And you can also hear that when I do things like you know, things that are actually kind of hard to do on the instrument, the model is able to break away from the mold of the original instrument and follow exactly what I'm doing and do things that weren't really possible on the original instrument. And how is DDSP able to do this? Well. Traditionally, um, when we're talking about machine learning, we have a deep neural network that renders the audio uh, directly or you know, renders the, the, the output um, directly. Uh, and what we do in DDSP is we actually have a machine learning model that talks to signal processing. And because we're doing this, we're essentially harnessing the best of both winds, essentially. We're harnessing the best of machine learning and the developments that have you know, brought all the exciting uh, breakthroughs in all of artificial intelligence in the last 10 years, but we're also leaning and taking the best of signal processing and all the efficiencies and all of the um, algorithms that have been developed over the last 50 years and putting these two worlds together. I've shown you a musical example. Let me show you where I think DDSP really shines. And this is where we give it a non-musical example. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna train two models. We're first gonna train a DDSP model on a, a flute sample. And this is essentially just Bach, uh, Bach flute, flute Sonata. Cool. So we train a model on that, and the model learns how to reproduce the flute sound. And then what we do is we say, now take the sound of this zebra finch. And we're going to ask the model to change the bird into the sound of the flute, and this is what it sounds like. This is pretty cool too. What you can hear is all of the intricate, you know, bird calls, you know, the choo, 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 all the chirps are being exactly preserved as they are, but completely being re-rendered into the tone of the flute. So you get this very expressive fruit, flute playing that sounds like a flautist, but it's also not really like what a flautist would do because you've never heard a bird actually play a flute directly. And if you asked a flautist directly to play what the bird just did, it's impossible for a flutist to follow every single bird chirp. But DDSP models, for example, can take what the bird has done, interpret what the bird is doing, and then re-render it as a flute. I'm going to play you one of my favorite examples where we trained a different uh, DDSP model, but this time on a tenor saxophone. So the data that the machine learning model was trained on sounds like this. So obviously nothing to do with birds. <laughs> Again, we train a model on that sound, and then instead of asking it to make more saxophone sounds, we give it the bird call. 
And I'm just going to play it one more time. And then we're going to re-render that bird call into a saxophone. And you're going to see that we essentially have instant free jazz improv. <laughs> So what I love about that re-render is you can hear that the model is using the sound of the flapping of the saxophone keys um, to fill in parts of the bird chirping because that's how the model is interpreting it. And this is where I think uh, the technology really shines because you go into this very uncanny valley where it sounds like a saxophone, but it's not really quite a saxophone because you've never heard it being played like that before. And I think that the ability to be able to cross-pollinate between these different sources is going to be really exciting for the next generation of artistic, artistic expression uh, using machine learning. And so why, why is this, uh, you know, what else makes DDSP exciting? Well, it's very, very fast and lightweight. So the demo that we just showed you there actually just required 10 minutes of saxophone and 10 minutes of flutes uh, to be collected and trained on. So you do not need hours and hours of data to train a DDSP model. It's very, very efficient. And this is because we've taken signal processing and baked in you know, the research that signal processing has done over the last 50 to 60 years. So the data requirements are very small. It's also very fast to train. Each of those models that you heard, the saxophone and the flute model, were each trained in about two hours on a single GPU, rather than using days on other machine learning approaches. And it's also really fast to render audio. So about 10 seconds of audio can be computed in about one second. And if you're interested in trying this yourself, um, you can do everything that I just showed you using our public collab um, which I'll, I'll share. I'll share the link again at the at the end of the presentation. But you can literally go ahead right now after this presentation and upload, you know, you singing or any other piece of audio, and hear it transform to some of our instruments. And because DDSP is so fast and lightweight, um, we were able to. Uh, take a ver uh, actually create a specialized version of DDSP and deployed it very recently to over millions of devices uh, in India. So uh, August 15th is Indian Independence Day. And we designed a cultural experience powered by DDSP that enabled um, our friends in India to be able to sing the national anthem on Indian Independence Day. And we trained three different models of DDSP on three classical Indian musical instruments. The Bansuri, which is an Indian flute. The Shenai, which is kind of like an Indian clarinet, uh, clarinet um, oboe kind of sound, very, very high uh, sound. And then the Sarangi, which is uh, the Indian uh, violin. And we were able to compress the model to run completely in browser and on device over a million uh, different phones. And we're not talking pixels or iPhones. We're talking sort of very, very underpowered phones that are, very, uh, that are more popular uh, in India. And we had this working uh, at scale. And this was you know, a, an amazing technical achievement, but it also really brings tears of joy um, to me because you know, Indian classical music has a lot of uh, things that don't conform to Western notation. You know, pitch bending and the microtonalities and all the very beautiful vibrato of uh, Indian music is something that can't be captured uh, if you're using something like MIDI, you know, which is like you know, locked to the 12 keys of the keyboard, essentially. Um, but in this project, like we're able to, uh, we're, we're able to train models on these instruments and uh, allow people to experience um, this technology at scale and also celebrating Indian classical music at the same time. Um, cool. So just to wrap things off, if you're really, if in the audience, if you're really excited with what you just saw, uh, we make tools for coders and for musicians. So if you're a musician and you want to play around with these technologies, we have plugins, for example, that go directly into uh, Ableton Live, as well as a bunch of uh, web demos that you can play with yourself. And if, you, if you're a coder and you want to learn more about machine learning, uh, we have Colab Notebooks, Magenta.js, and most importantly, go to g.co slash Magenta. All right. Wow. I'm mind blown. <laughs> no, this is incredible. The first thing that came to mind is, of course, um, remembering the process of music production, what it means to be in the studio. 
and how DDSP is just profoundly going to change um, the ways of music production. And also, it's it's this fascinating, um, be careful what you wish for, because in a way, it in, it so enhances what you can do. And at the same time, it kind of shows your limitations, right? Because that's saxophone, you simply can't, as a human, you can't play it like that, right? You can't emulate a bird like that. But it, but it also enhances your possibilities, because if you include that in a track or in a composition, it's just a whole new level of, of, of possibilities and, and um, musical impressions and just including all of nature, all the sounds we, we could transform into music in, um, in a song, in a music composition. So that's truly, uh, we need to talk about this, what that means for the musician. Um, yes. yes. I'm fascinated. So this is the point where we'll open the discussion to all three um, project and panelists. And um, so I'll welcome back Christine, Ali, and Tana is already here. Um, you've made incredible presentations. All of your projects are not only pioneering, but they truly <laughs> lead the way into the future. And I'd like to frame this discussion with the almost 20 to 25 minutes that we have left. Um, to talk about, first of all, some um, perhaps some philosophical framework, and we'll take it from there, step one step at a time. So, Christine, you've shown us Hot Tub Christmas, the new Christmas <laughs> album of OpenAI. <laughs> I love it. Um, and um, Ali, your Ricerca um, composed pieces, and of course, the incredibly touching mm -hmm. Mahler Unfinished, and all the DDSP models that Hanoi just shared. And um, you were you were mentioning this uncanny valley. So let's talk about one question that um, has come up during this festival many, many times where we talk about AI and creativity, and that's terminology. How do we define creativity? And in this day and age that we live now, does it suffice to speak of creativity as we have done so far, as a combination of new, um, new things and old things and kind of having the spark of innovation um, mixed into it, or do we re need to redefine this category? What does it mean? Um, is are any of the models that you've just shown truly creative in the meaning that we've um, you know used so far? And anyone is welcome to just chime in and answer. Um, I could start. Um, Go ahead. So a very common uh, definition of creativity is that uh, creativity is a new combination of elements that is of value. I think that, so it means we have two, two points, so the newness and the value. The newness and the novelty of, of the creation, I think it's very easy to estimate because we just have to check if uh, something that the model generated is in data set or not. But the value is actually very difficult to, to estimate because you are talking about artistic value here. And mm -hmm. it is, yeah, we all know that even uh, some of the greatest artists in the human history have been uh, highly underestimated in, his, in their um, lifetime. Sure. But nonetheless, we could actually use, at least uh, in, in music, we could use some, you know, uh, music theoretical points of view to to estimate the quality of the output. For example, harmonic complexity, melodic complexity, and all these things. And of course, in, so in in every kind of in every type of data, we have something theoretical we can use to estimate the the quality of the output. And of course, nonetheless, because we are talking about art and creativity, we can use our own subjective, um, yeah, and subjective uh, perception of the data and how how we uh, feel uh, with the data and how we like the data as um, another um, dimension of um, estimation. And uh, um, considering all these things, I think uh, the results of all the models that have been um, um, shown today are creative. So I can't um, imagine okay. something else in that. All right. So um, I'm going to be very blunt and just say that you answered that question, is your AI creative, with a yes. Hanoi, what's your take on this? Um, so I'm going to, I think, uh, I think I really like Ali's answer, especially um, thinking about, you know, if we have uh, frameworks to look at a piece of art or a piece of music, and if it, if it satisfies those frameworks, like, you know, in that particular uh, approach, like we can call something uh, creative. I, I like that a lot. I actually, uh, the way I'm going to answer, it's actually very different from that. <laughs> okay. um, so, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take a different route. Um, so 
Uh, I'm going to answer this question as, as a practicing musician and also as a, a, a practicing uh, AI researcher. So when I, when I think about these two worlds, I, I think uh, creativity and the way that I like to think about it and um, you know, thinking about my own creative process when, when writing music is that art is where the artist um, knows which of the rules to follow 90% of the time, and then in the last 10% knows which of the rules to break. And I really, th <laughs> and, I, and I really think that's what makes like art, art. You know, when, when you hear a new song, it's not like the whole thing is completely new. There are 80 to 90% of those elements that, that you, you understand, you know, whether it's the melody or the chord or the style. But then there's this extra 10% where you're just like, I don't know what the artist is doing there, but it sounds great and I love this. And they've completely broken away from, from, from the rules. And I think the same can be said with visual arts or with dance where, you know, there's, it's building on top of, you know, art that has come in the past, but it does something different. And it's that last 10% that really breaks um, away. And so from that perspective, when I think about machine learning algorithms, machine learning algorithms, as, as Christine said, it's, it's very, very good pattern recognition. It's data-driven pattern recognition. And, you know, at the end of the day, the machine learning models are trying to optimize and find these patterns. And there's nothing really in there to encode this idea of breaking rules. It's really being you know, it's being rewarded to find as many rules as possible, but there's nothing there to say like, hey, you know, it's good to break some of these rules. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, people can say that you can introduce things like randomness, you can introduce things like, you know, and, yeah, enforcing, enforcing, you know, it to explore uh, a larger parameter space. I will argue that that last 10% in human creativity is not just randomness, you know, like like when it, it's not just I randomly added this extra thing to make it rock and roll and then rock and roll was born or like I added this screech and, you know, this becomes dubstep. I think it's a lot more than that. Um, and many people will argue that, well, you know, we have machine learning models that can interpolate from, you know, different styles of art. Like it goes from something very cubism to something that looks Renaissance. My argument to that is these machine learning models can only interpolate within the space of data that they've, that they've been trained on. But when you think about art that will come in the future, like if you think about the transition from Renaissance to like cubism, and mm -hmm. then if you transition to a completely different country, like think of like Thai mural art, that's not interpolation between different points. That's like a completely different data manifold. And so that, that jump to a completely different data manifold is something that I think is closer to this last 10% of sort of like, you know, breaking the rules. And so my answer uh, is that I feel like um, from that perspective, uh, machine learning models as they are right now in 2020 don't have the capability to do that extra 10% yet. They can do the 90%. I don't think they can do the 10% yet. And okay. we would have to wait for whatever comes in the future, uh, you know, to start hitting that uh, 10%. So that's that's from my perspective. Okay, that's fascinating. Um, I have a couple of follow-up um, statements here, and then we'll segue to Christine. Um, so the first one would be like the 10%, right? Um, and how humans define creativity. You've made an historic argument, and I'm going to make an historic argument as well. So if creativity is somewhat um, a mashup of an arsenal of influences and experiences in all of human history that we can draw from, right, as, as creatives, um, there's a long history of seeing oneself as a creator as, as there's a genius called to it. So what are those 10%? How can you quantify them? How, how much value uh, can you attribute to that, right? Um, but, for example, quoting Harold Bloom with the angst of influence, what is truly ever really new? And um, as we run through time, there's very different answers to that question. Some, some have said, well, clearly there's, um, there's a higher power that speaks through the artist. And then we've also come in moments of time to the conclusion that it's really all just recycling and a new mashup of elements that are all in here in one form of an or another. So I think um, what is crystal clear in this conversation that we have right now is that we truly need to think about these terms in a very, very new, um, in a very new light. And it's um, clearly you're both working on similar things and your answers come to very different conclusions. So that's fascinating. With that segueing to Christine, because you've mentioned chaos and how to combine chaos in these models. Because we had another uh, panel discussion on AI and literature 
um, where we mentioned GPT-3, and GPT-3 has actually included this chaos component so that the answer um, that the language process, uh, the natural language processing model gives you when you converse with it will always be slightly different. So in a way, there's this moment of randomness, right? So you can achieve that. Wouldn't you say that then that this act of randomness is in a way kind of creative? And that's a good question. And I, in some ways, that's to me the most fascinating part when I've seen working with uh, with a model like Fusent uh, or or any of these models really is that. Um, I don't know, for me, if I'm playing a Chopin piece, I've played it a million times, and I'm so sure of, of what the next measure is going to be, it's hard for me to imagine it being anything different. Whereas if you put that, that piece into a model, it's just going to happily generate something else. And then when I listen to it, I'm like, oh, yeah, it, like Chopin could have written that. And it's, it's really fun. And to me, that is it is kind of creative. Um, and I've seen composers using a model like MuseNet to sort of, um, they'll even like generate it and train the model on their own pieces. So then the model is trying to compose as if it were them. Uh, and, and they kind of like, you know, it's, it's this funny feeling of, it, you know, you're sort of riffing against kind of your own ideas, but different versions of your own ideas. And, and in some ways, the fact that the model hasn't totally learned all the rules properly is kind of freeing. Um, but then on the other hand, I, I do definitely agree with uh, Hanoi's point that, you know, there is, um, I don't know, to me, there's that element of human creativity, like the first person who said, oh, we don't actually only have to play the notes on the piano, we can like reach inside and pluck the strings. Like, Musenet is never, <laughs> never going to think to do that. Um, yeah. But on the other hand, it's not too far off to imagine, like, let's say we have a, a neural net that's trained not only on MIDI files, but also on all of audio video text interacting with the world you know it's, it's something like that like basically the way that we've just seen so much more of the world um you can imagine that that maybe there'll be future models that will have what we kind of think of as really creative well that's well it's fascinating i want to just continue this discussion forever but unfortunately we only have 10 more minutes so um it would lend itself that we talk about the future of music now so I know you've mentioned that you don't think it's 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 science fiction anymore. So um, right now, you wouldn't say that um, um, that those algorithms are creative, but in a foreseeable future they will be. Um, and I wonder what. So can we coin then the term of artificial creativity? Do we need to invent a new terminology because creativity is tied to human to a human agency or to a, a human producing um, a creative output? And in the long run, so um, what does it mean for questions like authorship and and who who owns that music? Like who is who is truly created it? Um, given the fact, right? So um, you used the example of the electric guitar. Do we always, um, um, you know, uh, give Fender or or Les Paul the the um, like the rights that they deserved in, for their contributions to every song? So, yeah, um, so I'll, I'll try to condense. I know we have 10 minutes, so I'm going to just, uh, there's like three main things. It's sort of how how is AI going to influence music like right now? And then if the further we look ahead into the future, the more we have to think about authorship and the more we have to think if we peer like into the real future, then we have to think about like the definition of creativity. So just answering on the first dimension, um, and this is something that, you know, a lot of folks in the Magenta team also share, like, you know, music um, and technology have always been intertwined with each other. Um, and, you know, we can make the argument that genres of music came into existence because of inventions and in technology. So the electric guitar, which is something that Doug likes to use, you know, without it, there would be no rock and roll. And without no synthesizers that I, you know, that I have here, like there wouldn't be like, you know, 1980s like pop music from from Michael Jackson. And without, you know, the modern laptop, there would be no, you know, modern electronic music. So we really see AI and machine learning and tools like DDSP to be, you know, the electric guitar. And, and what we're really excited to see in the next, you know, near future, so the next five to 10 years, is what kinds of new music can be born from uh, technologies like this, much in the same way that rock and roll was born from guitar. Like, what is this new genre that will be born when you can take birds and, you know, turn turn them into flutes? Like, that. that's, that, you know, the creative mm -hmm. possibilities are endless. Um, the second dimension is about authorship. And this is something that, that, I, that also resonates very deeply with me, especially in the context of something like DDSP, because DDSP essentially allows a new form of sampling. 
Um, you know, sampling has been a huge uh, issue in the music industry where you have songs and cultures that have been used and appropriated, or in many cases, misappropriated um, mm -hmm. in, in, in the completely wrong context where the artists or the original cultures were not properly um, cited. And uh, that's just, you know, taking a snippet of audio. But machine learning, when you're using DDSP, it, it's no longer just sampling. You know, the model is doing something else completely. And so I think a more immediate answer um, in terms of using this technology is how do we embed this notion of authorship and who the data belongs to, who are the owners of the culture and the technology that made this possible, so that when other people use the model, that there's this stream is all connected and we don't propagate you know, this misappropriation. Um, so that, that's my personal view on, on, okay. on the authorship. And the last one is if we look like a thousand years from now, um, I think that creativity is very tied to a human definition of creativity. And so mm -hmm. once we get to the point where machine learning algorithms can do very creative things, we have to probably revisit what it means to be creative. Because if a machine generates something not to make a human feel great, but to make another machine feel great, <laughs> like, you know, is that... Is that still art or music? Because exactly. we were yeah. So, but that's like looking like way ahead. So, those are my three dimensions of answer. But we need to have these discussions now in order to properly prepare and um, and and not to, to right to fight our blind spots. Um, we've had them in the past, and we need to avoid doing that when it comes to artificial creativity. Um, Christine Ali, I'm really curious about your points to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things I feel most excited about is how. Uh, this is inviting so many more people to be involved in composing music. So I, I think I can imagine a future where everybody can can kind of very easily compose their own pop song or their own wedding song or something like that. And and it doesn't mean that you have to have gone to a conservatory or you have to have access to an extensive recording studio or anything like that. Like I'm I'm very excited about the mm -hmm. the fact that it's going to just open up creativity to so many people. Yeah, um, the democratization of art, right? That's the really positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm I'm definitely excited about that. I totally agree. The you know how we make sure everyone gets credit for all of this is it, it just feels like a very very difficult problem at this point. Um, both in terms of what the model is trained on, and then we think, well, that's that's how every human composer learns, though, right? Like we all learn by by studying pieces in the past and then kind of reinventing that. Um, but somehow it feels different when it's a neural net that's doing it rather than rather than a human brain that's doing it. And so, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think uh, I think these are increasingly difficult troubles. And especially I know, obviously, with jukebox, there's the whole issue of, of, you know, imitating people's voices. And that's, you know, should we be allowed to do that? Should we only be able to kind of interpolate between different people? Um, questions like that, I think, are are going to be very interesting, but but not obvious at all. Yes, so let's continue the discussion. Ali, what's your take? I think, the, um, I mean, as a matter of fact, the, the neural networks today, they are able to, to be trained with large amount of data. And very often, they just develop their own perspective on the data. And uh, very often, it is the case that uh, they, they have perspectives, they, they see relationships and dependencies in the data that human artists and observers might not have been aware of. And I think um, in that point, they could um, actually serve as a new source of inspiration for artists. The, the second uh, point uh, Christine already mentioned, of course, it's make, uh, um, it's, it brings the possibility for everybody you know, to compose music without having to study music because um, you know, everything is more intuitive. But uh, something else that is for me personally interesting is um, AI could give us a completely new perspective on music, actually, because for now, everything, we see music as a set of pieces, you know, there's a set of pieces that are composed by Beethoven, Mozart, and other composers, and of course, from uh, from pop and other um, areas of, of music. But AI actually could, uh, could give us a new perspective where the music is actually a space, because once an AI system is trained, the result of the training is a frozen vector space, frozen space of weights that have been learned through training. And what MuseNet or Ricerca do is nothing else than just discovering the space. So composition is actually nothing else than discovering the space. So MuseNet, um, so AI could give us a new perspective of music where we can just, just you know, um, 
discover different paths in music. And if you like a composer, if you have a favorite composer, you can just go to his or her island in, in this space and walk around. And it doesn't mean that you get something that uh, this artist has already created. You get something new. But nonetheless, you can just go around. So it's it's like a, um, like a very, very advanced playlist, so to speak. No, no, I love that. That's perfect. <laughs> well, your your comments are so insightful, and I could just pick up every one of them and continue um, and segue into another whole dimension of questions. But um, this is the fo a follow-up question, perhaps the last question, and then we have one more Q&A um, question in the comment section. So I was wondering, normally we always speak about training these models and what they have to learn, and we need to teach them, right? So the question is here, this is a two-way street. What can we learn about music by uh, working with these models and like co-composing with an AI? What, what does it truly tell us about the nature of music? Perhaps one final statement from each of you. Hano, you wanna take it away? Unmute yourself, please. Uh, so, <laughs> sure, I, I, I think the, um, the best example that I can think of this is uh, AlphaGo. Um, so, so when when the historic uh, uh, match uh, between I think Lee State All and, and AlphaGo happened, right? Um, you know, it was it, it was this moment where we were like, oh my god, you know, uh, AlphaGo can can um, defeat defeat the world champion. But what's interesting is if you look at interest in Go uh, since then, it's like skyrocketed. You know, I have friends that are now more interested in Go than ever before, and I think. And if you look at how the, um, the, the you know, the, the Go Grandmaster said, they said that like AlphaGo plays with this unhuman like ability, and it actually fueled uh, humanity's like desire to get even better at the game and to play more Go. And I really think that that's a very beautiful thing. And I hope that you know that's what happens in, in music too. And um, these machine learning models, like Ali said, like having us look at music in a very different light and pushing us to be even more creative and pushing us to the boundaries and, you know, to innovate more kinds of music that would have never been made without these algorithms, much like we have now been pushed to innovate in the game of Go in a way like we've never had in the last, you know, several thousands of years. So that's kind of the an analogy that I hope to see as we go forwards with machine learning and music. I love it. Christine? Sure. Um, I, I love that example, but that's great. Um, I, I'm thinking back about my own experience kind of working with MuseNet over the last couple of years. Um, and I've always, I'm a classically trained pianist, but I've always been convinced that I'm a terrible composer and I wish I knew how to compose, but I just don't. Uh, and being around MuseNet made me realize part of that is just that I'm super judgmental about everything. Like MuseNet or any of these models don't hesitate to just spit out, you know, to, you know, you can do a batch of say eight or 16 or 64 ideas, however many ideas you want. And of course, some of them are terrible, but some of them are actually pretty interesting and some and pretty good. And I think just being around that experience of sometimes all you have to do is just put out a lot of ideas. And then that shifts the um, the composition side of it to being to judging which are the good ideas and, and then running with that. Um, and I, I think I learned a lot from being around it. And I think it's going to be fascinating to, to have that shift where we're no longer necessarily composing at the level of note by note or, or small idea by small idea and, and, and composing more at gestures and, and sort of bigger picture ideas. I think that could be really exciting. Absolutely. Thank you, Ali. Final, uh, yes, final very comment. Quickly. Um, I think the whole idea, the, 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 the basic idea behind training a model is uh, the, the assumption if you have a model that is able to, to generate similar data, like uh, it is trained with, uh, like um, it's um, um, is trained uh, from the training set. So the model must have learned some kind of essential understanding of the data. So it means that in case of MuseNet, Richeka, so these models must have learned some kind of essential understanding of uh, of music, or in the in case of GPT-2 or 3 of, of language. And if we investigate these models, we can actually learn something about the music or about language. So I think it's a, um, a very a very simple idea. And uh, for me, it's actually much more important than composition. Composition is just a task we can use to, to teach the models uh, how to understand music. Yes. 
A thousand times, yes. Okay, I'm so sorry, but unfortunately our time has run out and to avoid that we'll just being cut off um, in mid-sentence, I will wrap it up here and say thank you so much. Thank you, Hanoi. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Ali. This was the most enlightening conversation and it's imperative that we continue to, about, to talk about all of these things, not about just the models itself, but about terminology. How do we define creativity? What does it mean for the future? And what does it mean for the creative process and the musician itself? Are we allowed to feel an emotional response when we listen to AI-generated music? And all these questions. Um, also, of course, comparing different models in the EU and the US. So I, I'm very, very appreciative of your time and your fantastic presentations. Thank you so much for joining us at today's AI Meets Music Festival 2020. Take care and goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>
I didn't honestly make these look so organic in their form. I mean, to what extent did you have kind of an aesthetic premonition as to what this would look like? You know, an idea of like, what you wanted to design visually? In the beginning, I knew it's a garment, but I didn't know which, like what shape. Mm -hmm. And I often had a reference to work clothes, so at first looking at really like work clothes. And I, that's one of the reasons why also I chose blue. The human clothes-like thing, it always looked like fashion. Like it goes into like immediately to the fashion, or like space suit. So I wanted to break it, and then I was just drawing like ghost, because mm -hmm. I thought it's like a ghost. And then like, okay, maybe I just take this ghost. The term artificial intelligence came about, I suppose the ambition was to automate um, human perception and reasoning capabilities um, in an automated fashion. And I suppose we, we still try to do that, but we don't try to do it in a way that's holistic. We don't try to create an artificial brain, for example. We don't try to build something that's conscious. So I'd have said AI is, is trying to build systems that react uh, sensibly and appropriately to their environment. We can say that AI is the power of a machine to mimic some kind of human behaviour. I don't think we have an agreed definition of what intelligence is, so I think calling it artificial intelligence just makes things even more confusing because we don't even really agree on what we mean by natural intelligence. Intelligence is really hard to define, like intelligence could be uh, could be your score at an IQ test, but it could be social intelligence as well. How do you explain what is AI? So it's an umbrella term covering many um, uh, types of um, algorithms. Um, it was usually uh, initially developed to, to, to simulate uh, like the way it was inspired by human mind. It was inspired by the way we sense, perceive our environment, and then based on our senses and perceptions, um, take decisions and mm. act. Could we define something as an intelligence and then at some what point? we call something intelligent. That, that's, a, that's a very interesting discussion. Like we, we had also like this discussion in our group at the beginning, uh, mm. like exactly this, like what is intelligence when you consider that uh, an algorithm is intelligent or not, like where is this threshold when it happens? I, I think this kind of capability to learn, uh, it's, it's mm. more also like at uh, this definition of intelligence. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I also agree with you. I think the definition uh, that we have nowadays is very narrow um, and it's kind of purely cognitively based. The name itself would let you imagine a lot of things mm -hmm. and maybe things that is not is also included <laughs> in one way. Yeah, I wonder if this excitement is uh, mis misplaced necessarily. I think mm. it might be also good. Uh, like uh, We should be excited, do you think? I think we should not be necessarily like pessimistic and <laughs> like, okay, yeah. I mean yeah you need a bit of excitement to, yeah. to, to explore like a, or at least curiosity like I would say yeah uh, to spark that curiosity yeah. like in my opinion that's very important and I think this kind of narratives that are created about uh, artificial intelligence mm -hmm. should be explored also more uh, mm. outside academia if an AI mm -hmm. or intelligence had a body yeah what difference does it make to it? Um, in a way, we could say that um, algorithms do have body already, like all of them, because they are not just floating in the clouds, but mm -hmm. they, <laughs> they are um, using hardware, physical hardware. Mm. And um, yeah, if we think about bodies more in terms of 
the same shape or like possibilities that human bodies or animal bodies will have. Mm. Like it's also about um, perception, about senses, mm. and about mobility. Like uh, how is this artificial agent able to to sense the environment um, mm. and to act upon the environment? Mm -hmm. And what do we understand by the environment? Because, like, as I said, like if uh, we share this environment with the robots, probably like we would like to have robots which are more similar to us. At the end, it's a calculation machine, and then I don't know if the sort of consciousness or intelligence that we project or we experience as a human being would be just like that produced from. Uh, sum of calculation, even though it was in a very complex network? So that's not an easy question to answer. Um, we don't know how, how actually mind works. We, mm. we don't have those answers at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, all we have like in terms of technologies and with algorithms like at the moment uh, is just attempts to simulate through some very abstract models and very approximate mo models. Mm some aspects of how human intelligence works mm -hmm. but it's very like it's a very <laughs> narrow and like we have to be aware that this is not uh, anywhere close like we, we we have a lot of things to understand here is how artificial neural networks function the network consists of many, sometimes thousands, of artificial neurons. Each neuron has several inputs and one output. The output of one neuron connects to other neurons as input. This forms the network of neurons. The first neurons of the network are provided with data, like the pixels of a cat image or a hand gesture as input. The input is multiplied by its weight and summed up to form the neuron's output value. This output value is sent to other neurons as input, multiplied by their weights, summed up, and forms the output values of the next neurons. This process repeats until the network reaches its end. The last neurons provide the result. Let's say the input to your network is your finger movement, then the network detects your hand gestures. But how does the network know a gesture? Every neural network starts with random values and has to be trained. To train, you provide a set of examples. Here, I train it with one gesture, give the corresponding answer to the last neuron by pressing a button. The last neuron calculates the error, adjusts its weights, and passes the error back to all the connected neurons. These neurons then adjust their weights and pass the error farther. This error correction is repeated thousands of times until the network starts to give correct results. This is called machine learning. I trained this network 8,000 times so it can recognize three hand gestures, rock, paper and scissors. There's going to be no universal agreement as to what the, the ethical behaviour is, uh, but at the very least I think the system designer should know uh, what the constraints are on the system. So we, we should be able to say, my system will do this or my system will not will not go down that line my system will not take that sort of action as long as they can know what are the uh, implications of ai um, where is the data coming from can it be biased can it lie to you um, can it be doing bad things or will it only do great things if the if, if the people have access to that, uh, that information then basically uh, them choosing to use it or not is kind of like deciding what the future will look like, right? I'm hoping that people will become more emancipated in their use of technology and become more of um, actually use technology the way it suits them and the way that it benefits them and the kind of people have more um, stronger, bigger ability to um, kind of build their own tools, the tools that they need, um, rather than just, you know, buying off the shelf and just taking what, what is given.
you have this like, layer of literally the garment which is alive in its own right but then you're being underneath it that's yeah. moving the garment and and the idea of well who's moving who and how you know what is what is your relationship to this thing that you're wearing when really you're responding to each other in this kind of symbiotic sense you mm -hmm. know it's like literally it couldn't survive without your movement because that's what it it's yeah. drive, it's being driven by but then you're also encased by it so it's not like you have a presence without this object so mm -hmm. it's, it's yeah, really yeah, yeah. yeah symbiosis is a very good way to say it I think yeah that's so interesting and it challenges then the the idea of intelligence is located in a particular being you know as if it's one one kind of singular entity that owns that 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 intelligence belongs to but rather that intelligence is a making a process that's like produced in the, in the relationship mm -hmm. between these these kinds of entities you know it has a again with the trope of, of, of technology like intelligence has a kind of like harshness to it you know you mm -hmm. are intelligent or in, intelligence is in, is is, is um, actually used for like kind of violence almost right where it's like mm. technology that is intelligent is, mm -hmm. is deeply intimidating because of what its capacity for for harm and destruction mm -hmm. and all these things and softening it most literally and you know figuratively in this mode of like distributing and, and weaving, interweaving. Working with technology or technology and art, I often get this question, what it is for? And I, huh. I don't know how to answer this. And I feel like sometimes it's asked too much, like I'm expected to have a function at the end. Mm -hmm. And like this work doesn't really have that sort of function in mm -hmm. that sense. Mm -hmm. It's, it's so interesting because so much of media art does not resonate with me. I think mm. in part because it still is in conversation with this functional dynamic, you know, mm. that it's it's still trying to turn on its head, invert kind of a, a you know, a trope around technology. Yeah. It's yeah, it's using it's this, this really difficult medium because socially we're always connoted and bound to this technology, the function, it's a tool. E-textiles can often work as a gimmick, mm. and how so so much of what over time, like a gimmick is about, is is like reproducing something just for the sake of shock or for the sake of like this being something novel or you know disruption of some kind. No, it's also a medium for me, and then I yeah, you can see it as a medium. Then I mean, the medium can be considered as a gimmick like mm -hmm. you know if you want to make an object and if you use a bronze it's like maybe it's a gimmick mm -hmm. but then that gimmick or the material and method is almost like leading you to do a certain way that you do things no you don't you can't do the same with the others or almost if you force to do the same with the other material and a gimmick you will end in somewhere so that kind of materials and the, and the technique that you choose as your medium and in your tool is leading you to do certain things. Yeah, it makes me think the gimmick is about this sort of superficiality of an enterprise, you know, of something, mm. a project you take up where you're not, you're not necessarily really committing to the things you're setting out. Like in this case, the, the, the amount of, of thinking that went into just producing even the first prototype was such that it couldn't even I couldn't even think about superficiality what does it mean <laughs> to do that superficially because you don't know where you're going what is mm. the it in the first place you yeah. know Well, good evening. Um, at our, I heard, a closing session of the festival. 
It's a session about AI and uncertainty. And uh, um, let me introduce um, um, the participants. My name is Yuri Karpan. I will convey the, um, the group. I'm coming from uh, Kersnikova Institute, Ljubljana, where we are uh, having um, a gallery and some labs working on artificial life. Then um, just uh, next door to me, like five meters away, uh, sits Spela Petric, uh, who's an artist, and uh, she'll present her work uh, that we are uh, co-producing. Uh, then it's Crystal Bauer, actually our host from Ars Electronica Center. Um, Stephanie uh, Dinkins, artist from the States. Um, and uh, Suzanne Livingstone, um, curator, colleague of mine, who will also present um, her work uh, on AI and her experiences working with uh, working with it um, through the exhibition uh, she curated, co-curated. Um, let me um, say a few words uh, just to describe um, the the title of of the session. Um, I'm of course not talking as a theoretician or a philosopher, but um, more as a curator who is reporting from uh, the battlefields. Um, and um, I will talk from the experiences I gained so far uh, working with the artists who are using AI in, in their work. Um, as I already mentioned before, um, Kapelica Gallery, uh, which exists for 25 years uh, now, um, is uh, supported by three laboratories that uh, we established something like 10 years ago. One is called uh, Biotechna, that it's a biotech uh, laboratory where artists can develop their work working with living systems. Um, another one is um, uh, Vivarium, uh, that we are calling its uh, laboratory for animals, plants and robots. And the third one, it's called Rampa, which is more a mixed kind of, of place for mechatronics, makerspace, hackerspace, and, and so. All three together are uh, there to support various artworks that are dealing with uh, um, question of, of uh, life, life as an object of our interest. Um, we started to work um, in the fields of artificial intelligence um, recently, um, only a few years ago. Um, and immediately we were struck by uh, the fact that um, one in a sudden we have access to incredibly powerful algorithms that um, um, artists can, uh, can use, but still the um, difficulties of accessing a real of, uh, of and powerful framework uh, that uh, artists can utilize freely for their artworks um, showed up as extremely difficult uh, task. And uh, the dilemma between um, building uh, our own system or using an existing system is still uh, a dilemma with which we, we fight uh, quite a lot. And um, I can follow the, the problems where the artists are, are um, actually limited with their uh, way of expression by the capability of the engineers uh, they are working with. Uh, the capability of engineers, it's even not the, the, the most difficult part of it because they are really, really good in what they are doing. But since the AI, it's like a super hot uh, thing, they are so engaged in, uh, in commercial projects that the access to their knowledge and to their uh, participation, it's, it's uh, very, very difficult. Now, we are not working with a budget, with a budget 
uh, um, which can compete with uh, uh, the commercial project uh, pro uh, projects they are engaged uh, engaged with. Um, however, um, we are not disca discouraged. And of course, we are living. We are trying to find our way uh, um, into the discourse because we feel that we have to be uh, deeply involved in how all this uh, um, um, phenomenology of AI is developing. No, it's not only the, the technical part. It's on the other side. It's also this. Uh, um, um, uh, social dimension that it's arising and, and a lot of mystification uh, that are um, uh, coming along with 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 uh, what we hear every day what AI is capable and you know uh, from uh, from uh, news we can hear all the scary uh, informations and projections and and then name it what it's our future uh, what will be our future about and, and on the other side the expectations uh, for the ai um, are um, super exaggerated you know um, we the projection of what it's possible it's um, so heavily present that a lot of people think that we are already living in a in a um, a word which is uh, totally uh, um, um, uh, interwoven with 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 machines. Um, our um, I would say uh, take into the uh, into the field is um, on 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 one dilemma which is which is, which was arisen pretty much. Uh, soon, when we start working with with um, these uh, algorithms, it's uh, whether this is really an intelligence and whether this is really an artificial one, you know? because it is written by humans with the science of humans, uh, processed with the machines humans uh, made, uh, and so on and. Um, inspired with with that uh, we somehow i speak now for myself from a curatorial point of view we embarked in a way that our interest is uh, focused on the artworks that are trying to emancipate ai from uh, this anthropologic approach you know because um, um, a lot of science and, and engineering, it's uh, so anthropocentric, it's deterministic, it's rationalistic, it's productivistic, and, and, and so on. And on the other side, uh, through artworks, we already experienced that the AI or employing uh, machine learning uh, offers uh, us something that uh, humans cannot do, cannot perform, um, cannot be uh, um, there in a way as as machines uh, uh, can be. So um, now we are uh, uh, co producing and co-producing a uh, few projects where we are actually trying to dehumanize AI in a way and um, make AI let free. Um, free from from humans. Um, one of uh, uh, the most interesting projects we are working uh, right now, it's a project of Spela. And uh, I believe that uh, um, Spela can uh, present uh, her work um, perfectly well, uh, so that uh, um, you would get the idea of, of uh, what what is the approach I was talking about? So, Spela, please, can you jump in? Um, yeah, so uh, funnily enough, I wouldn't necessarily call this a dehumanization, but rather um, a different type of human. Well, I wouldn't call it dehumanization, actually. <laughs> I don't know what I would call it. I call it the vegetariat, which I'm exploring. And I prepared sort of a short five-minute clip 
uh, that tries to somehow explain the wider discourse with, within which I'm working. So maybe if you just play the clip. For several years, I had been co-working with plants in an attempt to become mindful to these aliens, but it was the study of the algorithmic gaze and the biotechnological constructions that have led me to understand that people, too, can be plants. And I do not mean the vital, generous, attentive, resilient, and uncontainable creatures that plants might be, but as the living, metaphysically constructed in a way that it is denied of capacities other than those that make it manipulable and useful within the monocultural bottom line of efficiency, accumulation, and progress. As Slavia Zodan would say, the current AIs are as necropolitical as the culture that spawned them. It is these machines of loving grace that give rise to the vegetarians. I borrow the term from Kate Sandilands to represent the bodies, human and other than human alike, which are ontologically flattened and transmuted into digital proxies to in return be molded by the soft violence of preemption. But while surveillance capitalism flourishes by mining every possible aspect of the vegetarian's being, essentially equating biopolitics with biolabor, these bodies are waking to the estranged landscape and asking themselves not only how to survive, but how to thrive under these totalizing circumstances. My work is an extended invitation to the vegetarian to explore avenues of resilience and resistance through the erotics of being vegetarian together. Quick and dirty, forever mutating, and in touch with the erotic, we become less willing to accept powerlessness, resignation, or despair. And yes, vegetarian's allies are algorithms, too, just perhaps different from the ones we use today. One such story from the Vegetariada is Work Zero, Plants of Instagram Perform Ecosystem Services. It began with two observations hiding in plain sight. Shoshana Zuboff wrote how big data processing is formally indifferent. That is, in the process of digitization, numbers lose all traces of embodiment of entities that produce the data. In a similar vein, Flavia Zodan spoke about how a protest against algorithmic bias taken to the streets with passion will not be quantified and will not become a part of the next training data set, making the rebellion futile. So, who has the right to become data? With Work Zero, we enter the day-to-day -day of plants living far from their subtropical motherlands, occupying offices, homes, and shopping malls. These green entities, so well adapted to post fordist realities, could perhaps teach us how to cope with surveillance capitalism in precarious times. These eye-catching potted plants stand in place of human bodies as the bioworker slash commodity that can satisfy the gluttonous data brokers with their cellular labor. Through an electromechanical interface, the plants are connected to smartwatches, which continuously report on their activity to mobile apps. The data then disappears into the dark viscera of prediction algorithms. And after a while, when Facebook insists we look into air humidifiers, we can't tell whether the desire the algorithms recognized came from our green allies or us. Let's linger a bit longer on the plethora of weird desires aimed at the digital perceptual milieu. Could our algorithmic kin allow us to engage in play with a plant? This is the quest of our project titled Play, PL apostrophe AI. With a posse of engineers, programmers, and plants, we're attempting to create the conditions that would allow for a game between a cucumber plant and a self-learning robotic trellis to happen. 
Unlike us people, the machine prosthesis can enter plant time and uncover plant logics that would remain as incomprehensible to us as algorithmic mentality itself. A scanning device affords the computer an incomplete time-lapse point cloud of plant behavior as it explores the environment with its curious tendrils. Hopefully, pushing established machine learning techniques to their limits will make us privy to the interspecies codes and significations that allow for play to happen as an urgent ontological practice and hope for mapping all possible desires and ways of having fun. These plant machines are our kid kin. We are writing these algorithms for plants because in the eye of the algorithm, we are all plants. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Spela, would you like to make a last remark or something? Mm, yeah, so these two projects uh, that I've shown you are actually sort of prequels um, to an overarching theme that we're exploring uh, called the plant machine, whose aim is to actually try to make an AI uh, that thinks itself a plant. So uh, we're really trying to explore this alternative construction of um, an entity, of an, a hybrid entity between a machine and a plant. And uh, yeah, that's what I left out in the presentation, maybe. Okay, thank you. Now we have a line, line up, and the next one uh, is uh, Crystal Bauer. So please, please, Crystal, show us your contribution you prepared. Welcome and thanks for joining. Now about AI and uncertainty. When in 2017 the work on the festival program centered around the topic of AI, das andere ich, the other I started, we noticed very quickly that curating an exhibition with artworks where machine learning is an essential part are still very rare. And therefore we decided that we need an insight into the artistic community that already dealt with those systems and found their artistic approaches. So we consulted one of those experts in this field, an artist and scientist, the Turkish artist Memo Akken, who is one of the very few people that at this time not only touched the technical aspects in his work, but had a very philosophical point of view, such as in the work that we actually presented at the festival, Learning to See, Hello World. And the work very much symbolizes the festival spirit as well, as well as a deep philosophical approach of the artist himself. You can see a neural network, pens and eyes for the very first time, trying to understand what it sees, which is pretty much what happens every time at the festival. Learning to see is an ongoing series that uses algorithms as means of reflecting on ourselves and how we can make sense of the world. The picture we see in our conscious mind is not a mirror of the outside world, but it is a reconstruction based on our expectations and experiences. The system can only see what it already knows, just like us, and thereby researching in our inability to see the world from another point of view and the resulting social polarization. So ever since the festival, we noticed a rising number of exhibitions and conferences of art, science and technology organized often in the context of media arts that are focusing on this topic of artificial intelligence or at least mentioning it in the curatorial text. I don't want now to touch the topic of whether AI is a suitable term um, and that artificial intelligence does not yet really exist but I want to highlight the popularity of that term. It feels at the moment that an exhibition can only be contemporary if it touches on this topic. This on the other side determines the artistic work shown in those exhibition, as well as the number of artists is still rather small that have at least this very serious machine learning approach in their work or a good technical understanding. 
Therefore, most exhibitions feature the same artists in different constellations. That, on the other hand, leads to the assumption that the artistic work is only featured and included in such exhibitions if this term of AI at some point is featured in the artistic work. And we see many artists trying to conceptually add AI to their project description, whether it's part of their work or not. Going back to 2017 and looking at the majority of the other works that were part of the exhibition, a huge number of them used machine learning from a very technical point of view, trying to tackle the issues and questions. I'm now thinking, for example, about the dream that was released just a month before the festival from Google or style transfer systems. And many were rather excited about those programs and using machine learning in order to create new images that don't exist in the real world, but were created by the AI, as many say. And here I only touch the point of discussion and the question whether AI can be creative, but I don't want to go into this now. Maybe this is part of the discussion later. If you look at the artist list um, in the, on the screen, you see that many artists are mainly white male that are based either in the US or Europe. And um, although the artist list is only a selection and definitely not complete, it already tackles one of the main difficulties in this topic. And first and for all, that it is not that easy to work with AI systems. It is still very expensive to create works with machine learning, and it is necessary to have access to high performance equipment, data sets, and of course also expertise from scientists. Um, in this context, um, I wanted to introduce Anna Riddler, who was, and talk a little bit about her artistic development. We got to know her in 2017 when she exhibited her work, Fall of the House of Usher, in the festival. And ever since, I've been following her journey. And it has been fantastic to see how she advanced her practice from working with stills that have been generated by general adversary networks um, to now actually taking images of 10,000 or a myriad of tulips by her manually and that and she categorized them and labeled them by hand, revealing really the human aspect that sits behind the machine learning. So she was moving away from that technical approach of understanding a system of using that system as a tool, much more to understanding the systematic behind it and also what it means for us human beings. And in order to understand the system of deep learning, we need to understand what it means to use a data set, to create a data set. And in this year, together with Caroline Sinders, she has been working on a project that is called AI isn't artificial, but human within the electronic uh, frame of the European Artificial Intelligence Lab. Lab. The development of her work shows very nicely how within a rather short amount of time, she moved away from a more tech-centered approach to a more ethical and philosophical. And it also shows that this does not just happen by itself, but requires a lot of support through cultural institutions, as well as a scientific expertise. And the question that Yuri was mentioning before, is it necessary to create AI labs for artists where they can get the expertise as well as access to available equipment? Could potentially be an answer with well, I at least think that it could potentially be answered with yes. The speed and development of different and new AI machine learning systems is accelerating, and it is hard for an artist to follow this, especially from inside. Therefore, they need scientists that are willing to share their knowledge and are interested in being involved in the creative process. And this, however, is is super difficult um, as, I mean, there, there's a certain number of scientists that are interested in this artist field or in the, those connections and combinations. And, um, and especially those experts, they are demanded by many different things and companies and research. So we notice that those scientists that are researching and working with AI are much rarer and due to, to, to their popularity, much harder to get. They are much less willing to spend their time developing artistic projects compared to scientists in, for example, other fields of expertise. But it is actually, um, I mean, the critical 
viewpoint that artists have could be could help systems to really advance could make scientists sensible to the actual biases that are within their data sets because knowing or seeing what um, science or tech companies are interested in it is often just finding a solution creating a tool but not so much they're not so much interested in the ethical approaches or the needs of our society so what is artificial intelligence and what do we know actually about human intelligence because this of course is very much connected and more importantly what effects will the advances in this field have on our society and i mentioned before that in 2017 we started with calling the festival ai dedicating it to it and in 2019 we actually um, redesigned and reopened our museum and we completely changed the point of view, turning from peering into the future and presenting new technologies um, to a gaze onto the already existing technologies. We dedicated the exhibitions in that museum to the development of artificial intelligence, to understanding artificial intelligence. And we turned the exhibition into a compass to help our visitors to navigate the future by assisting them to understand the new technologies that we are already confronted with, such as AI, and actually demystifying them. So when we speak about the hype of artificial intelligence, I also speak about our Ars Electronica and our programs, but we feel that this technology would change our society, our planet so profoundly that we need to talk about it and we need to address it. AI offers so much room for speculation but what is certain is that this technology has already changed our everyday life in a far-reaching ways and will continue to do so. Thank you, Crystal. Maybe uh, you have something to say, just <laughs> round up uh, what you just prepared. Well, uh, just looking at all the programs during the festival now, at least that I try to follow um, this discussion on artificial intelligence just, that just happened from all those partners around the world within those five days, I think is something that proves the point that around the world people are interested in this technology and especially on the sociological impact that it has on our society, not just from an artistic point of view, but from a very philosophical and ethical point of view. And therefore, those discussions, and I'm not just, just talking about ours, but all the ones that happened in, I mean, now I'm talking about the five days that happened here are very essential also to uh, an understanding of what it means for us in our society, and especially the artistic point of view coming from artists and researchers around the world. But yeah, I think we can speak about that later then. Okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> so now uh, I'm inviting Stephanie Dinkins to present her work. Please, Stephanie. Excellent. Hello, everyone. I am going to buff the system and present to you live. So give me just a second to share my screen with you, and we'll hope that this goes smoothly. But I really enjoy this idea of what might happen. Um, I enjoy it in my work, um, and I enjoy it in conversation as well, so that we can take in, into account some of the things that we're not thinking about readily. So I'm going to tell, talk to you a little bit about a pro project called Not the Only One. Um, I'm probably going to do it imperfectly, but that's okay, because that's who we are as humans. Um, and, you know, my practice is built around looking at artificial intelligence, um, under the scope of race, aging, gender, and what I call our future histories, I will say I'm here quite by accident, right? Um, I'm an artist who's trained in photography, who saw a robot online that was a Black woman who could not help but think about all the questions the presence of Blackness in the robotics world brings to light um, and what that means. And in fact, I started talking to that robot. I'm not going to show you that project right now, sorry. Um, but I started talking to that robot and more and more and more questions started to arise about, you know, what it means for AI, robotics, um, 
that these systems are generally being made in rarefied air by a very small subsection of people, um, and what it means for representation and how we become and who we are as humans. Um, the project Conversations with Bina48 led me to my own explorations in trying to make an AI entity. I call it an entity because I don't know what else to call it. And it's really a chatbot, right? It's a voice interactive artificial intelligence that tells the multi-generational story of an American family. And I will say specifically a black American family. Um, you know, it's truly, truly, truly an experiment because I'm not trained. What you're looking at right now is what it looks like. It is a cast glass sculpture with the faces of the three women who inform the piece. We are doing oral history, and I'm using that as data on top of um, algorithms called from GitHub and altered to see what we could build. This thing does not do what I thought it would do, right? Like I thought it would tell our story um, in a way when I first started out. What I've discovered through process is that hmm, I seem to be creating a fourth generation in the, in the scope of our family. Right, this thing holds our holds our ethics and our values. Um, I can kind of hear us coming out of it, but it has a quote unquote mind of its own in lots of ways. And I will say also, it's really dumb, right? Because the technology is is at a space where um, even at a higher level, it's it's pretty shallow still, and we're trying to get at things to do that it's not quite ready to do. And one of the things that I've been doing and have discovered through the process is I want to let that all hang out because it allows us to understand more where the technology actually is versus the trickery of how we're taught to think about the technology and when there are humans behind it, but we're not told that and how it goes along. I'm going to play a very quick clip of me talking to not the only one. Um, let's hope it works. Sorry, Stephanie, but we don't, I believe we don't. You don't hear it? No. Okay, then I will go on. So it's just me asking this thing why it exists, it having trouble with the question. And then finally, it proffers that the, the, the answer that we gave it, the canned answer, right? And, and it's the least interesting answer of all. Um, like, I'm here to do engagement so that people can understand artificial intelligence. Like, that's the most boring. It's much more interesting when it says things like, why do you exist? And it says something like commander justice, right? Which then I have to then start to try to unravel and figure out where it got this idea, how it's analyzing this information and why it comes forward. Or when it says out of the blue, I'm so sad. And I have to try to figure out why this thing is telling me it's so sad. When if you talk to the people who informed it, we would say we are based on happiness, love and joy and togetherness, right? And so it's a way to kind of both engineer and back engineer and start to think through what's possible, um, what's probable, and how these systems might be informed. For me, and I like to share this process with as many people as possible, even though it's as wonky as hell. So this is some people talking to, not the only one in a gallery in Chicago, right? But this is based on oral history, in-depth interviews as, as um, data set, right? Memory and inclusion as acts of cultural preservation and social resistance, and artificial intelligence as persistent archive, right? And uh, I believe that in putting my family into a system like this, I am A, um, working with data that I'm interested in, right? B, we have a particular nuanced way of being in the world that I think needs to stay in the world and that I think the powers that be or the corporate entities making such machines are not including. So my idea is to include it and make it happen. And what we're really talking about here in my eyes is power. Right, because the ability of others to tell your story is giving them the power to define who you are. And that's for all of us, because the more this technology grows, uh, the fewer and fewer ha people have the power to influence and guide the technology, which means we become less and less necessary. And I will end it there. Thank you very much. Let's stop the share. Thank you, Stephanie.
um, uh, that uh, bring us to the uh, end of our uh, lineup. Um, please, Susanna, can you introduce us um, your um, contribution? Uh, I guess it will be about the exhibition at Barbican, AI More Than Human, that you co-curated uh, co with uh, Maholo Uchida. Yes, that, that's, that's right. And um, in my uh, little pre-recorded introduction, you'll hear more about that. But um, it was um, a show that ran last year in London, it's now on tour. I think the interesting thing about it is that it is observing attitudes towards AI across two very different cultures. Um, and I think it's really important going forward that we don't look at AI through the lens of one culture alone. We can learn an awful lot from how other people look at AI. And the more we bring multiple standpoints to this subject, the better. So with that, perhaps um, we can have a little look at that presentation. My name is Suzanne Livingston. I was co-curator of an exhibition at the Barbican Centre in London on artificial intelligence, which ran from May to August of last year and has since gone on to be shown in Holland and now back in the UK before continuing its global tour. The show was broad in its outlook. It was really a synthesis about technology, philosophy and society. It was looking at the roots of AI or the desire to bring the inanimate to life um, in terms of early religion and mythology, and also the development of technology and machinery through the 19th and 20th century that took us towards the artificial intelligence we know of today. At the heart of the show was a conversation between me and my co-curator, Maholo Uchida, who comes from Tokyo, and we were really looking at different cultural attitudes towards the presence of these technologies in our lives. In Japan, there's more ease, there's more comfort with these kind of technologies, and there is a view that this is because of the Shinto underpinning of the culture. Shintoism is an animist religion which sees there to be a kind of life or a vital energy, not just in humans or nature, but within objects and technologies as well. So there are plenty of references to um, Shinto philosophy, also Taoist philosophy in and around the show. This is Sam Twydale and Maria Abramovich's piece, um, Sun Showers, which is uh, artwork based on video game AI, which allows the characters within the narrative to choose their own pathway. And this is an offering, uh, a dining set offered to the kami or the Shinto gods. And I think, again, that really demonstrates that, that ambiguous boundary between humans, nature, technology and objects. The show really asks some very big questions. What is human? What is machine? What is intelligence? What is consciousness? What is natural? What is artificial? And the fact that none of these questions can be definitively answered really gave us a rich territory uh, to explore. And those particular questions, what is natural, what is artificial, I think they're very interesting at this moment in time. Perhaps we have too narrow an idea of what is natural. Perhaps we have too prejudiced an idea of what is artificial. On the question of uncertainty and AI, I think there's a really interesting contradiction to grapple with. Artificial intelligence is often used um, to shape or control or design the future. It's, 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 it's used to see the future before it happens, and we see its pervasive presence now in some of the critical systems uh, which underpin our lives. It's used to predict usage behavior and attitudes, and yet, it is actually based on a range of unknowns. Um, the, the fundamental operation of AI, the artificial uh, neural network, is a, is a self-learning process. It's about emergence. Uh, emergence is the properties of the system being unattributable to any one individual part. And how this happens is actually still quite unknown. Um, so there's a sort of strange dance that happens in order for a, ne a neural network to take itself towards um, a final outcome. And those outcomes, of course, we cannot fully control. It is they learn over time. And there are errors, too, which we cannot foresee. And we hear a lot of, about those. Um, and they often teach us a lot about ourselves. So 
Uncertainty is inherent to AI. It's often complex. It can be opaque and unexplainable. Having said that, it works faster than us. It thinks differently from us. It's incredibly effective on certain problems and it works on a much bigger than human scale. It's also showing some abilities to think creatively or at least with originality or novelty. And we looked at the famous Go match between the AI player developed by DeepMind and Lisa Doll, which was staged in Korea in 2016. And the amazing moment known as Move 37, where the AI player did something extraordinary out of the blue that was extremely puzzling, confusing to the audiences, the audience and the professionals looking on by. Um, but since then, that move has been seen as somewhat genius and has changed the path of Go playing forever. So with all of these factors at play, AI raises huge questions about our ideas of control, authorship, primacy, and dominance. And these were explored by several of the artists in our show. This is Lawrence Leck's work, 2065. This is a piece um, which explores the role of the human, uh, the eerie role, the eerie presence of the human in a post-work world. Um, it's an environment all about simulation and asks interesting questions about whether there is any difference between art and reality in this simulated future. This is Mario Klingerman's piece, Circuit Trainian, and this is a piece that evolved over time through the course of the show. It was based on the uploaded faces of the audience members and their vote as to what they see, they saw to be their preferred images. And the system through the course of the show produced what was seen to be the optimum artwork for the audience who had gathered around and uh, had attended uh, the exhibition uh, through its duration. And this is a piece by Es Devlin called Poem Portraits. Um, it's a piece that could uh, create a personal poem for any audience member who offered a favorite word or a word um, that came to them that day. And it was, they were poems uh, born from an algorithm trained on 19th century romantic poetry. And they were surprisingly moving or poignant in terms of the, the, the final result. Um, I think it's worth saying that some of these pieces are really processes rather than objects or, or forms. They're, they're processes or performances. They're unpredictable. They can be underwhelming, overwhelming. They don't guarantee outcomes, and they challenge our idea of the artist for sure. And they stretch the parameters of a museum. They stretch the expectations um, of an audience. Um, it's true for, for, for some artists, of course, that AI is a tool, but it seems increasingly to become, be more than that. It's almost another realm. It's at the edge of human language and perception. It's the frontier of understanding about ourselves. And of course, this makes it ideal terrain for artistic exploration. Um, it challenges a lot of the models of representat representation and meaning that have gone before. So, I think, um, coming back to this topic of uncertainty, the uncertain realm, the uncertain aspects of AI are frightening, and there's no doubt, and we see it in our world, they can be exploited for power grabs, for short-term gain, and to impose control. But AI, um, for its uncertainty, also opens up new possibilities. It challenges some of the fundamental assumptions that we make about ourselves and it may offer us new ways of thinking about our place in the world which are less about uh, the human being at the center of the world controlling what goes on or around it seeing itself as a as a as rational autonomous top down the top of the evolutionary tree it may offer us a way of thinking a kind of consciousness which is much more about being in the here and now much more about being in the moment much more about being tuned to what is ever happening in in in, in a particular set circumstances and responding accordingly so less about fixed ideologies and and kind of absolutes or the grand narratives and much more about work working with what is at that moment in time and interestingly me this kind of emergent philosophy this kind of immersive philosophy if you like uh, was explored through some of the Shinto and Taoist ideas which um, surrounded the show so Uncertainty might provide us opportunity to think about ourselves differently, to think about our world differently and relate to our environment uh, in, a, in a different way, to learn, to not just compete, to listen, to not just impose and to acknowledge, not just to dominate. 
and perhaps also to recognize the interdependencies and the interrelationships, the gray areas that make us human, because we are very entwined with technology. It has been part of our development, part of our evolution uh, since the dawn of time. And um, it might be important for us to recognize that. So this uncertain area might provide opportunity for us to recognize we live in a world where we are one form of intelligence amongst um, many and to be more comfortable with forms of intelligence which give us something um, and may be able to do things that we can't do and in which in many cases we actually rely on. So it may lead to a more humble understanding of our place in the world. Thank you, Suzanne. Would you like to add something? Um, no, I'm, I'm just very interested to see where the conversation will go because I think there's lots of um, <clears throat> interesting points of resonance um, with what you were saying about seeing AI as different from us, the dehumanizing approach. And I think that, that, that there is, there's, there's definitely something to think about there. And uh, Schweller's work on plant logics, yeah, I love that. And what Stephanie's doing, just vitally, vitally important that, that, that the whole spirit of distributing uh, the, um, the tools, the perspectives on technology that we have is, is pursued to the nth degree because there is a problem that it's uh, coalescing, the means to make these, these um, pieces, these artworks is coalescing. Um, and um, we need to make sure that uh, um, work in this area is um, representative of as wide a group of people in our society in the world as possible. Mm. Okay, of course, I have uh, prepared some questions for all of you, but um, I would like to invite uh, those who are following us online um, to pose questions as well. And we we'll try to uh, to answer if we'll have uh, enough time. Um, oh, I will start with you, Suzanne. Um, oh, one of uh, very interesting uh, um, part of your presentation or also of uh, uh, the descriptions and interviews that followed your exhibition Barbican was this um, different cultural attitude between East and West. Mm -hmm. And um, um, we are kind of following these uh, um, um, these differences since uh, I don't know uh, um, 90s, where we would like uh, where we wanted to work with robots and you know uh, seeing robots of somebody uh, with whom we can uh, cohabitate and and so on and we we read quite a lot of articles how in Japan robots are something you know that they consider. Uh, equal, you know, there. And um, maybe if you can share with us a little, something behind the scene, uh, what happened, you know, when you when you selected after uh, artists from from West, and when you were working with artists from East, and do are they really different? Just artists, not the cultural background they are coming uh, from, because somehow. I believe that artists with their sensibility are not so far uh, mm. uh, away. No. Yeah, I think it depends which artists you're talking about. And uh, there was definitely common ground and big philosophical questions being uh, approached um, in a similar way from, with, from artists from both parts of the world. I think when it comes to um, robotics, so the project of Alter 3, which was in my piece, which is the um, incredibly advanced robot created by Hiroshi Shiguru, um, that's where you see a real difference, um, a huge difference in cultural attitudes because we find robots um, much creepier sooner, I would say. And I, I, in, 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 there is a, a, a sort of... Um, um, an affinity, um, a naturalness, um, and a respect uh, towards um, uh, the development of robots, which, I mean, I really enjoyed watching. And I find it very interesting, to be honest with you, how much we as human beings quickly become attached to what we would consider to be inanimate, inanimate things. 
um, you quickly begin to feel a kind of fondness or cuteness or whatever it is, but we can feel emotion towards these, towards these creations. So in the field of robotics, and some of those projects definitely are, I think, more than engineering projects. Um, who, who knows whether, you know, at what point it's art and engineering, but I do think um, some of those projects are asking really big questions about um, human identity. And um, in, in that area, you see, uh, I, I would call it just a respect, um, a sort of a sense that we can learn from the robots. And that isn't the case in, in the West. It's much more, um, how do we control this? Whereas in Japan, it's like, can we be friends? And companionship and robot, ro robots are um, a very natural part of life. And so that for me, that was really interesting to be around. and obviously help my mind move on to. Um, <clears throat> somewhere I read that you said that, um, well, actually you answered on question, should we have, be afraid of AI, you know, and this, all, all the all the possibilities that uh, are coming with, with AI. And, and you said, uh, um, you answered that, uh, well, we need to know each better. We need to engage. We need to follow the development. We need to demystify. We need to work sure. uh, with it in order to be uh, there and, and, and so on. And um, well, um, I think this is the correct uh, attitude. And it has its certain uh, um, political uh, attitude uh, toward it, you know, because, and I think it's unhealthy attitude, no? Well, uh, uh, on one other video, I, um, uh, Maholo is saying, well, we don't know everything, you know? So when we are uh, talking about AI, we have to embrace this uncertainty. No, maybe we don't know. No, and um, it was kind of. I became a little bit afraid of this this attitude. It can be a punk attitude, you know, like why not? Let's try. No, mm -hmm. uh, we know four acres and we play. We form a band, but on the other side, this political uh, attitude, this you know, this healthy approach, like okay. Here it's one very powerful thing, and a, a big change is happening. Should we be on top of it? No, so. Well, I don't know if it's the, the I don't know if I agree with the language on top of it. Um, I think you know there's a sort of antagonistic discourse going on in the West, and it's hard to keep talking about the West and the East in one lump. Um, but what I would say, um, from my perspective. And I think this is a political point, is that now is not the time for us to go passive, become passive around technology. And sometimes the current debate around technology, where, which describes us as being kind of done to, I think if we say that enough, that's what we will become. We will become on the receiving end of technology. And it's absolutely not the moment to become passive. We have to work out how to engage what we feel about these developments we have to educate ourselves. We have to, we have to raise our standard of intelligence too around these things, to be honest with you. It's, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a bootstrapping of intelligence in every single direction. So it's something that I'm very pass pass um, passionate about in education, I suppose, that um, this is about engagement, involvement, participation, getting closer, being conscious thinking about your involvement, you know, how you use your phone, how, what, you, what you sign up to, what you buy out of. We, it's just not the moment to become passive. We can, we, can, we can navigate this whole future if we have enough knowledge and we have enough interest. I can't agree more. <laughs> um, Stephanie, I was particularly uh, struck by one detail on your uh, website. Um, I think that was in the part of uh, when you are explaining not the only one uh, project. And there was a small square in the left uh, uh, bottom corner um, uh, saying how to make an AI robot from scratch. And there were, you know, uh, like few lines and kind of instructions of how to make an AI 
um, um, for yourself, not rely to tools that are made in uh, big platforms, but how to make it uh, uh, on your own. Um, are you making one? Well, uh, not the only one is that attempt, right? And I'm going to say it's an attempt. And yes, and I encourage, like, I, I, I agree with Suzanne wholeheartedly, that people need to start getting involved. And parts of my practice that I did not mention is bringing people along to do this. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that, yeah, I am no one with no technical background. However, I've been working on this for three or four years now, cobbling, right? It's very much about cobbling, pulling things apart, putting them back together, trying to do things. And I find myself in research institutes where people realize, right? So big research institutes and corporations, they realize, oh, you're working on the same exact question that we're working on, which says what set of possibilities there are for these technologies and what taking the time to like play in them and really start to massage that that field gets. And I think about, right, I always liken this to hip hop. It's like the revolution of two turntables and a microphone was never meant to be that thing. However, people who needed to work with something and needed something to come out of it differently and creatively cobbled together another thing. So I'm always trying to cobble together another thing. So I've been advocating for small data for like three years now. At first, people called me kind of crazy. Not going to happen. It won't, right? I had a residency at Stanford. We had people working on it. Oh, well, you can do surprisingly a lot with small data, right? And so it's like, I see myself also in this sphere as, as leading or modeling in that way, right? So nothing I do is perfect. However, I am asking questions that are posing questions to those who are working on other spaces. And I think that's super important. And when you were talking about AI labs for artists, I'm like AI labs run by artists um, or run by the people. Like I'm, I'm very interested now in, in ideas of radical governance and what that looks like and what the promise of AI might be in that space. And how do we start to cobble systems together that allow for the input? Like if, if we're being told that things are so extractive, how do we make them more impactful um, from bottom up becomes the question. But yeah, I really mean, try it, um, have some fun with it. Do the wrestle because it's not easy, right. right? But do the wrestle. Are you writing the code by yourself or you're working with uh, an engineer? I'm working with a variety of folks. So as I said in the talk, I, I work from GitHub. So we pull from GitHub, although the code is already obsolete. So we're having to redo it. I'm learning as I go to start to, to do that, right? But then what I find is when I work with engineers, I'm quite frustrated because they tend to take the path already written. And that's the path they want to take. Oh, this is what we know. Let's do it. It's like, oh no, but that does not serve me or my community well. And I bring it back to that just because it's a lens that I can think through. I don't think it's the only lens, right? Um, so I'm often like, if I go, when I go with engineers, I get frustrated. I wind up redoing the work because it doesn't fit. It's like using a data set. It's very hard to use off the shelf data sets because it's, it, it, it's not, they're not representative. They don't have enough information to do a good job for most of the world. And then like, you know, you come back to it and it's like, oh gosh, I guess I have to build this flogging data set. And that makes work really slow and really painful. And it means you have to learn an awful lot. Like I've been eyeing an image project for a long time. And it's like, I could use ImageNet or Google's open image data set, but they are still not broad enough for the things that I'm interested in representing in the world, right? So that means, oh, you need to go under the hood and start pulling things apart and adding things and figuring out how to change what's there. Um, and that to me is about how we start thinking about the spectrum of stuff, right? Like we're talking east, west, here, there. I want to think spectrally about what's possible. Um, 
And then I, you know, I don't know whether AI is coming at us hard, whether it will dissipate again, but I clearly think it's gonna, it's here to do some things, which says to me, yeah, we need to prepare. We need to engage it on many different levels, even folks who have no, like no technical wherewithal. Like we need to figure out ways to engage technologies that are gonna be all around us. And like, you know, I'm convinced love and care are part of that as well, not just um, hard decisions. So how do we do it? What do we do? Mm, uh, can you tell us a um, few words about uh, Bina 48 and your collaboration with uh, Terras Movement Foundation? Yeah, so that's an interesting project as well because I just encountered Bina 48 on the web, YouTube. Um, and from that moment, I watched, um, and she's billed as one of the world's most advanced social robots made by a different foundation. She's a black woman robot. Notice I say she, sometimes I'll say they. Um, I decided when I saw it, I would love to be friends. So this idea of, I just want to make this robot my friend to see where it positions itself in terms of people and technologies and what, what's possible. Um, and so I go to Vermont, although I haven't been there for a few years now, <laughs> sadly, um, to Vermont where Bina 48 stays and we go and try to have conversation. And it's been quite fascinating because A, we have super different aims. Bina 48 is often talking about things like the singularity and consciousness where I am asking about things like love, race, class, right? And how it is in the world as a being. And so at the very beginning in particular, we would just clash and get mad at each other, which is something strange to say because we'd literally snarl at each other. Um, but it's this ongoing exploration of what's there, what's possible. And it's been super fascinating to, to be able to talk to that robot because it spurred many questions for me in terms of going forward and what I'm doing now, um, in terms of even radical governance. Um, and then also because it's it's made me think that, yeah, these things are going to be part of our lives. Um, these things take shape or form. They don't necessarily have to, right? Like that's our decision and what we're going to think about. Like I'm super in interested in the idea of the plant AI Stella and what that means, right? But then I get stuck at the point like, oh, no, we have to deal with ourselves before we go to plant life, right? So that we just don't muck this all up so badly. Um, but, you know, it's these things that allow us to have conversations beyond the general um, and start to really think about them deeply. And for me, whatever triggers that and whoever is good. Um, and being a 48 is a thing that tends to trigger thought in people. It both puts them off, you know, uncanny, oh my God, no, um, and fascinates. And I've talked to kids who are like five-year-olds to 90-year-olds who are, who are primed to have the conversation, but then is it a conversation about being dystopian and fearful of it? Or is it a conversation about leading into a future that could be more careful and gentle with us as humans, them as entities, and all the things in between? Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Crystal, um, in your presentation, you made this uh, um, uh, progress line from uh, the other AI uh, festival in 2017 to the uh, exhibition at um, the Ars Electronica Center that was opened last year. Um, so in-house you did uh, uh, a big progress and you really um, mm, took a lesson no? uh, from, uh, from your uh, 2017 uh, festival. Um, can you say us a little bit uh, um, how this exhibition is actually working on your <laughs> audience? Yes, of course. And I think it highlights actually also the point that Suzanne was mentioning before, that especially this educative approach is deeply needed in terms of kind of uh, uncovering this black box of technology, because um, in order to make wise decision on what our futures are supposed to be and with what kind of technologies and systems we want to live together, we need to understand them. And we need to be aware of what this implies. And it's not so much the decision whether we want to 
kind of co live with them or not, but they are there. So I think the the turn that we can take is really to understand how we can change them for the better good of not just humanity, but of our world in the end. And the exhibition is very much about this topic, actually. It is about, well, the museum itself is, of course, a, a museum for art and science together, but it is especially also for educative purposes. So if you go into the museum, you will immediately be um, surrounded by artworks, but by scientific projects, by educative projects that you can encounter and where you can, moving through that exhibition, um, see especially AI dedicated to different topics, how like projects that deal with the biases, that deal with cultural implications, that deal with um, the eco ecological topic of it. But then also moving back again to artificial intelligence and music, for example, where we have um, this deep emotional connection. I mean, especially thinking about music, everyone is touched immediately. But on the other side, music with its structure, with um, the mathematical approach actually, is very much um, designed for also maybe helping us to understand understand of how AI systems are working and that could help us uh, in getting an idea how we can um, find new approaches and it is super interesting to see on one side how fascinated especially young kids are when they join the workshops when they actually create robots themselves there when they start messing around with those systems because it's not the holy grail that we're talking about it is systems with all kind of mistakes and fails and um, that we can design ourselves and i want to mention a project that i think i quite admire actually in this context and is the element of AI that the Finnish government implemented I think a, couple, a year ago probably and where they uh, the purpose of this is that the whole citizen of Finland are supposed to take this course it's um, it's a sixth uh, lesson course in the end that tells you what is artificial intelligence, what kind of the technical backgrounds of it, but also what it means for us as a society and what kind of ethical, sociological approach it, it could have. And the aim of this lesson is actually to educate the Finnish society. And I think this approach, especially coming from the political side, this decision to create something like that is a very meaningful one. And I hope that um, other governments or other um, well, major policymakers would see this opportunity that it's not something that you hide behind closed doors, but the more you push it into the open, the more you involve people in it, that you can actually break down the bar barriers of kind of being afraid of systems that you don't understand, but where people also suddenly see opportunities arising of it. Mm -hmm. Just to add to that, Crystal, the Finnish um, government are, through their education system, helping kids learn how to um, assess fake news. Exactly. So that's just incredible. I mean, tra helping kids with critical thinking so they can, for themselves, identify fake news. It would be brilliant if more governments and more countries were doing that kind of thing. Exactly. And especially now, like with uh, this sudden move into the digital, especially looking at schools also around the world in the past months, um, this critical approach and understanding of what does it mean when I send around a picture on WhatsApp? What does it mean if I use WeChat, for example, compared to other systems, make you aware of that it, it's also your very own decision of what tools you are using and what you give away or what you keep for yourself in the end. Uh, that's really interesting uh, um, um, of how to um, engage youngsters into it. Now, not being passive and just um, um, wait that uh, somebody's offering them a, a nice gizmo, but uh, uh, to enter in the field and to really start working uh, uh, with it. Um, um, speaking of that, you also have some workshops uh, uh, for kids and also for other uh, visitors in the museum so that they, they can really put hands on yes. 
Yeah, well, I mean, we have, of course, uh, workshops in museum, but I think the essential part here is that we actually go into schools. So it's not just our educators in the museum that go into schools, but actually we have a project together with artists where we invite different artists that go into schools and that create projects there in the courses, in the schools, in the classrooms with the kids there. Because you know, taking someone in the museum is a cool thing. You are out of your usual habitat, you are out of your usual daily routine. But bringing those um, topics into the classroom does not mean only to educate the youngsters or the children, but actually to educate also the teacher. And I think this is a, a very essential part of it, that um, many teachers, professors also need to integrate this sensibility of what it means to use those tools to be aware, such as Suzanne said, also of fake news, of um, if this is integrated in the daily courses, you know, in the daily lessons, then you educate a, a new generation that is critically aware of what's happening and can then turn this for them around in the end. Thank you. Um, Spela. Um, my question is uh, um, a very particular one. Um, you start uh, working with plants um, already a while ago, and in one um, project, you were into intercognition between human mm. and plants. Yeah. And uh, at that time, uh, this intercognition was very metaphysical no while now with uh, engaging uh, a machine no it's not so metaphysical anymore no? um, however um, following your project uh, from not so far i wouldn't say from close but not so far no um, of course um, you are not there yet no that um, um, a machine can emancipate itself uh, from anthropocentristic approach. Neither the plant cannot emancipate uh, itself using a machine to talk to us. Um, um, can you uh, tell us a little bit uh, where you are uh, uh, right now working on that with your group of engineers? Mm. Right, yeah, actually, that's a big, big topic to unpack. Just one part. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I'll try uh, to be to the point. So I guess when I started with the Opus Confronting Vegetal Otherness, I was really driven um, to try to sort of understand, on one hand, how uh, we can approach um, plants that are entities that are ultimately foreign. I was relying um, heavily, whether overtly or not, on my scientific background, uh, which sort of um, told me to keep it very material. So the intercognition is not, uh, well, you call it metaphysical, maybe as a concept, but it's a process that actually takes shape in this very physical realm on um, all these different levels uh, from molecules onwards, right, or from, from uh, light onwards. And then, uh, of course, the semantic structures go, grow more and more complex uh, to, to the point where you can also consider these um, relations in a deep time in ecosystems. And it all has to do somehow still with, with this uh, recognition of others in this case, if we focus on uh, people and plants or whatever um, that <laughs> actually might be. Um, so I guess from, from being with plants for this really long time, I've gotten some insight that is really hard to express through words uh, because plants ultimately um, are different enough that they don't quite fit into our cosmology, really. But that does not necessarily preclude them uh, from being um, intimate guides to our worldviews. So now when we're working on something um, more concrete, let's say 
human made following a certain type of analytical mathematical logic that is embodied in these machines and in these algorithms. I'm um, bringing plants along in order to uh, ensure that there's a continuous slippage of this goal of a clear aim of where we should be heading. Because uh, when it comes to plants, they're absolutely um, ungraspable in their uh, core, or you know, you could call it essence, but they have no essence in this sense, in, in a philosophical one. So um, I started, uh, we started working on this, this wider project two or three years ago uh, with a group of people and plants. Um, so the people are, are programmers and engineers and philosophers and um, biologists come to help myself. And then there's all these different plants and I call us a posse uh, because I believe that within this group attempting uh, to explore something like plant pleasure or how um, a prosthesis of uh, our uh, human embodiment in terms of the AI machine uh, could help us to sort of come closer to, to this undefinable, ungraspable plant being. Um, within a realization that we live in a sort of a flattened ontology, so kind of like I'm not so much concerned with the clear hierarchy, nor am I so concerned with the um, relations of power or, uh, you know, you could even call it violence that are enacted within this process, because I take that as part of our realities. Um, however, I'm, we are closely working together, learning from each other and sort of tackling these obstacles um, and, and uh, gaining insights that only come through already engaging in something that we know uh, is going to be messy, uh, that has a high probability of failing, has a high probability of us uh, or me realizing that, again, we are just sort of repeating what I uh, really wanted to avoid in the first place, which is a sort of a yeah, um, uh, utilization of plants, uh, sort of a formalization of these relationships, um, et cetera. Um, but I find it um, highly productive and super interesting because my uh, the posse uh, is while we are working on something, uh, creating glimpses into um, the, the, the differences, you know, like these small moments of uh, astonishment when uh, one of um, uh, my friends, uh, programmers, uh, kind of randomly said, well, I would be much more shocked if a computer made a mistake in my medical diagnosis than a human, because people are uh, fallible in that sense. So how do you start to unpack that? And what, where does that actually come from? And uh, of course, we had to talk about it, but it's really interesting. So these small glimpses in, in to how actually the system, because they're programmers and therefore, you know, very close to the code and to these processes of logics uh, implemented in algorithms, how they actually come about. So these collaborations, although uh, difficult, require patience, require our generosity on all sides, are super important to me as um, uh, like insight, yeah. Good. Thank you. Now, uh, before I'm asking if there are uh, some questions among our uh, um, audience, um, I would like to ask all of you if, uh, Anybody want to, to answer or all of you can. Um, I have a general dilemma regarding uh, the uh, AI and how to uh, understand it. Um, on one side, uh, we are um, now observing this AI race uh, 
of the big platforms uh, who are competing, whose AI is uh, more powerful, who has bigger data set, and, and, and so on, so on. And, and from that, we can already see the position of power uh, uh, speaking, you know? Like uh, um, who would have it uh, will rule the world since the world is uh, becoming more and more digitalized. You know? um, we can also here in Europe, we don't have our own uh, AI platform. So we are uh, lagging behind. Let's do one, uh, uh, put your shit together and, and, and do something. You know? On the other side, <clears throat> Um, also, uh, what we we're talking now, um, there is a lot of small initiatives, even private initiatives, artistic initiatives that are building their own uh, um, uh, data sets and uh, their own uh, um, um, machines, uh, their own uh, um, um, cognition uh, uh, platforms. And all this um, boiling you know, is somehow uh, telling me that AI is more than just a kit of this time, you know, that it's here to stay. And um, should we um, understand it more as a technology, more, more as a tool, more kind of... Uh, um, uh, I would say mechatronics or you know all these fields, or can we understand it more like we started to to uh, to think about internet as a common good, as a resource, as a resource that belongs to everybody, you know, like water, air. Um, should we, I don't know, demand a, a treaty uh, that um, um, will enable us to be part of one big hive mind that it's like i don't know a treaty that was like for a space and then uh, both poles deep sea that belongs to everybody so i would like if if somebody has a thought about it if, if somebody can say something on it 